<clears throat> are you getting yeah the streams at least on youtube Yeah, cool. I've got it on YouTube. Okay. <clears throat> oh no, that's the wrong one. Damn, that's the. F mm. Yeah, that's the one that won't work. Cool, that's all ready. I'm just gonna hit go live. Cool. Right, Ben, are you able to play the last video? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you 
you see me. Yes. Then uh, I am ready to play the last video. Cool. Um, so uh, to give a brief introduction, this is uh, Katerina Prista from the Pavilion of Knowledge. Um, from uh, Portugal, from uh, Ciencia Viva, um, Instituto Superior de Agronomia. So, without further ado, here is the video. I think it's in Portuguese, but it's uh, it's subtitled in English. So, where we go? Boa tarde. Estamos aqui na cozinha, um laboratório do pavilhão, do pavilhão, no pavilhão do conhecimento e um, a ideia é mostrar-vos que há micróbios que são benéficos, não são só nocivos como nós muitas vezes ouvimos falar dos micróbios que provocam doenças. Os micro-organismos, como eu costumo dizer. Uh, e os micro-organismos, há uns benéficos, são uns nocivos. Os nocivos provocam doenças e fazem apodrecer a comida. Os benéficos produzem coisas para nós. E uma das coisas que eles produzem são alimentos, alimentos fermentados. E eu trago-vos aqui vários alimentos. Uns que são mais conhecidos, outros que são menos conhecidos. Alguns dos conhecidos nem sequer estão aqui. A cerveja, o pão, tudo isso são fermentados e não são conhecidos. Mas há outros conhecidos que estão aqui. Por exemplo, o queijo. Temos aqui queijo com a roquefort, que tem aquele bolor verde que às vezes faz impressão às pessoas. Uh, temos aqui o queijo camembert e esta coisinha branca que está aqui também é um bolor. E é ele que transforma um, o leite, juntamente com outros micro-organismos, o leite nesta, neste queijo que sabe, tem um gosto muito particular. Temos aqui os chouriços e os salpicões, e este tem um pó que são fermentados por bactérias láticas, e este tem um pózinho branco que tem leveduras a ajudar as bactérias láticas. Temos os iogurtes, que não estão aqui, mas está aqui uma coisa parecida, só que não é só por bactérias láticas como nos iogurtes, é o kefir, que são bactérias láticas como os iogurtes, mas também tem leveduras a ajudar. E todas elas estão aqui enfiadas nesta coisa que parece uma couve-flor, que não é uma couve-flor, é... Uma, uma substância, uma, uma flor que é produzida pelas bactérias láticas para se protegerem lá dentro. Ficam todas protegidinhas e trabalham em conjunto. As bactérias láticas e as leveduras. Depois, nós conhecemos o vinagre, é feito por bactérias acéticas, mas há outras coisas em que as bactérias acéticas também participam, como por exemplo as kombuchas, que são produzidas por esta película, onde temos bactérias acéticas e leveduras, que produzem uma bebida de chá fermentado, que é mais saudável, tem mais vitaminas, um, conserva-se mais e tem outras substâncias que são benéficas para, para a saúde. Também temos aqui azeitonas, que também são fermentadas por bactérias elétricas. Vêm N coisas, muitas coisas que são produzidas por vários micro-organismos do mesmo tipo, bactérias láticas ou leveduras ou bolores, e que produzem coisas diferentes e nos bolores dos orientais são peritos em utilizá-los e vamos passar para as coisas menos comuns ah, os orientais usam muito as leguminosas como substituto da carne para as leguminosas serem mesmo mesmo saudáveis e benéficas e, e eles conseguirem extrair todos os benefícios ah, das leguminosas, o que eles fazem é pôr os micro-organismos a trabalhar para eles Juntam micro-organismos às leguminosas que são cozidas e produzem coisas diferentes. Produzem, por exemplo, o TMP, e temos aqui vários tipos de TMP. Os orientais normalmente produzem TMP de soja, como está aqui, mas nós, que estamos em Portugal, usamos leguminosas portuguesas para produzir TMP. Com o quê? Com este bolor que está aqui, que depois é convertido a pó, produz este pozinho, e juntamos o pozinho com as leguminosas, a leguminosa cresce e agrega os grãos, fica à volta, à volta parece este, como está aqui, como se fosse um queijinho branco, é mais branco ainda que este, e uh, agrega os grãos e nós conseguimos cortá-los à fatia, por exemplo. Leguminosas cozidas não se cortam à fatia, não é? Quando muito comem-se à colher ou ao garfo, mas soltas uma a uma e aqui conseguimos cortar à fatia e cozinhar. Para além disto, também usamos 
Por exemplo, outros, os orientais, usam para produzir um miso, que é uma pasta, e comem essa pasta em sopa, juntam essa pasta com água, comem em sopa, muitas vezes de manhã. E é muito saudável. Os micro não são só nocivos, mas também são, e muitas vezes, benéficos. Tempê de xíxero, tempê de feijão vermelho, feijão branco, com uh, algumas sementes de abóbora. Temos tempê de feijão vermelho, temos tempê de grão com pedidos de abóbora, temos tempê de termoço, uh, temos tempê com feijão preto e xíxaro, e também tem sementes. E depois temos aqui tempê só de termoço e temos o tempê que é mais comum uh, nos países de origem, que é o tempê de soja, que está aqui. Okay. Good morning, Ben. Good morning. Well done. How's it for, going? Yeah, it's going well. <clears throat> Saying well done for manning the live stream over the night shift, at least here. Yeah. Yeah, 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 it was good. I got confused a few times, uh, assuming it was the middle of the night for everyone, but of course, people who were watching at that time, it, it generally was. Yeah. So yeah, and people coming in as well might be starting their mornings as well. So, I mean, we had some speaker, live speakers from Mexico, the US, and Singapore. So, I guess that's switching between the evening and the uh, morning for each of these guests. Yeah, exactly. We, yeah, jumped around a few different situations. I had one of those uh, comments from the, uh, the US, uh, the guys in the US, it wasn't actually International Microorganism Day for them yet. It was like uh, Ooh, three yeah, hours I away. think I see some music playing. Ooh, oh, that's me. Hang on. Ah, we have our next guest. Can you still hear me? So, <clears throat> let's see how this goes. We have Paula Moraes and Pedro Ferres uh, from the Universidade de Combra in Portugal. Hopefully, out to join us. Uben, you appear. <clears throat> Let's ask them to unmute and turn on their webcam. Should be incoming in a second. Great. So this is another live talk. You can only tell when they're live. <laughs> I 
So I can see them in the participants window. Hello, ah. good morning. Can you hear me? Good morning. We can loud and clear. How are you? Okay. Hi. Hi. Hello. So is that Pedro? Uh, sorry, didn't hear you. Is that Pedro? Yes, I'm Pedro. Hi, yeah. nice to meet you all. Nice to meet you as well. Do you have a webcam? Oh, sorry for the late connection. <laughs> no problem. Oh. Yeah, do you have a webcam or are we just going to be hearing your voice through the... Uh, yeah, I do have a webcam. Uh, yeah. Let me just see commands video. Yes, yes, ah. I'm here. <laughs> okay, oh, okay. I'm in the lab. Oh, amazing. Wow, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm actually in the lab. Let me just set me up in here so you can see me properly. Oh, and we have Paula. Let's admit her to the call. Oh, you do have Paula. Okay, okay. Yeah. okay. Thought you might. Yeah. So is she also in the lab or is she joining? Oh, hello, Paula. No. no she's, she's joining us from another site. Okay. Morning, Paula. So don't forget to unmute your microphone. So we've set it so that it's muted on default just to make things a bit smoother. Hello, good morning. I'm sorry, I have my microphone off. That's okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So are you both in Portugal at the moment? We are in Portugal. We are in Coimbra. Yeah. In, it's uh, in the middle of Portugal. Okay. It means it's north of Lisbon and south of Porto. <laughs> yeah, okay. So yeah, just if you're joining us right now, we have Paula Moraes and Pedro Fares from the Universidad de Coimbra. Um, and you're also at the Central Ciencia Viva de Coimbra and part of the Exploratorio team I have written down here. Um, and you're going to be giving us a talk on pet microbes. Pet microbes, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, are you, do you need to share your screen for any presentation or are you able just to give it um, in person? Uh, I will share the screen and I think that Pedro can uh, read from my screen, yes? Yes, yes, yes I you would be able to see it. We'll take turns. Yeah, okay. Take a second, uh, and I'll join you in a... Okay, I will start, okay? Fun, yeah. So you have until 8.20, so I'm going to turn off my video to uh, avoid distracting anyone. And um, once we have Pedro return, you may begin. But yeah, you're the first, um, first. The first live talk in this kind of daytime session now. We've gone oh. through the night, and now we're at least in Europe, in the daytime. So it's uh, all quite exciting. Okay, are you both ready? Yes. Both ready. Yeah, yes. okay, Thank great. You. Well, begin with pet microbes. We uh, look forward to your talk. Okay, Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Sorry, but I cannot uh, share. My... Uh, okay, let me just check. How about now? Because if you try the share screen button, it okay, it's it's now it, it's uh, I can share it now. Thank you. Cool. Ah, perfect. We can see. Great. Okay. Uh, let me. Sorry, because uh, I cannot. Uh, have we are uh, some some problems with uh okay no problem these are all part and part <laughs> of a uh, of a live talk <laughs> yes <laughs> sorry because I, I think i opened the wrong presentation it is will it will be easier like that uh okay one minute more and a few seconds and that's it <laughs> fantastic right okay thank here you here we are all looks good okay so good morning everybody we are talking about pet microbes and uh, at the end of the presentation we will see why we are talking about pet microbes um, i want to start by talking a little bit about our university it's not really a technical um presentation at this time of the, the, the day, it will be difficult. So it's about uh, uh, our uh, university and uh, our famous microbiologists and our famous microbes in the, at the University of Coimbra. 
the University of Cambridge. Uh, um, it was created in 2090. Um, sorry, in 1290 by uh, one of the oldest king in in Portugal, and it is one of the oldest uh, universities in Europe. It was uh, created uh, in, was stabilized in Coimbra in the 16th century. And nowadays our university has about 25,000 students. It's old, but it's not, uh, it's not stopped in the, in, in, the, in the time. So today we have, as I told, uh, around 25,000 students, and uh, it's dedicated uh, to the to research. It's, it has a, a lot of research projects, international, uh, national and international projects, and uh, it's also an international university since it has a lot of foreign students. Many of them, I don't want to say most, many of them coming from Brazil and other Portuguese speaking countries. Although we have also, we belong to the Erasmus um, group and we have also many um, st students from many nationalities. In the University of Coimbra, we have the first culture collection dedicated to bacteria in Portugal. It is registered at the World Federation Culture Collections. And for us as microbiologists is uh, an important uh, asset to, to work on microbiology. Our group is the group who runs the, uni the culture collection. And uh, because it's a research group, it's uh, really uh, makes the collection more active and uh, uh, enables the collection to be an integrated system ranging from the isolation to the classification of new organisms. It is also a training system. Uh, so we have many students related to the culture collection and uh, enable the culture collection to be um, to be also a way of, uh, de of uh, training uh, students. Our cult culture collection has uh, more than 2,000 strands that uh, have been isolated by different groups of microbiology in the university and uh, um, is uh, that the, the, those those strains are being characterized and and described as new species or not we have uh, we have a, a tradition of uh, describing species as you will see and these strains give us work on uh, microbiology and uh, uh, enable us to uh, contact with companies and industry to um, make these organisms a potential biotechnology um, tools. We have also at the University of Coimbra, famous microbiologists. And I want to, to talk a little bit about Milton Costa. Uh, Milton uh, is, uh, was president of the Federation, uh, the European Federation of Microbiologists Society from FEMS and uh, he was a real um, traditional in the way that uh, he work, worked on taxonomy and on microbiology and on description of species uh, before the genomic area. So he was really dedicated to their, his books. Going now to the famous microbio microorganisms in our lab, during the, the last years, uh, we have, uh, as group of environmental microbiology, described new species as a tradition of our university that starts with Milton. And uh, we want to talk to you, to you about one famous microorganism in, in our lab, which is the 
the species we described, the species Glacimonas singularis. This uh, strain was isolated from a uranium mine wastewater treatment plant. We work as an environmental group in many metal contaminated environments. And we isolated this uh, strain from the uh, wastewater mine treatment. Um, and uh, the strain was uh, characterized by uh, resistance to uranium and uh, by the ability to, to, um, to, to, be, to be in, in, in uh, relative high numbers in the system. And I now ask Pedro to describe, to talk about uh, our famous Nosocomicoccus ampoule. Thank you. Uh, so uh, late in 2013, uh, this new strain, Nosocomicoccus ampoule, uh, was identified, was isolated from, uh, in a work with the, with the collaboration, and it was isolated from a sample of a surface of a bottle of saline solution uh, from an hospital. So the, there were two strains, and these two strains character, uh, isolated were later characterized and identified as a new branch um, on the Bacilliaceae family. Um, but uh, the work on characterizing new, new species and genus didn't stop, and then we moved on, and in a, recent, a more recent study, uh, uh, move to the next. In a more recent study, a colleague of ours uh, from the lab, and in collaboration with Professor Paula and uh, some other researchers, isolate, uh, isolated microbials uh, from a project that was characterizing the microbial endophytic community of pinus penasters that were uh, at the time um, affected by the pine wilt disease and. A uh, strain was identified and characterized, and this strain was later on uh, observed to be belonging to a new family. And this was a great discovery for the group. And uh, um, contrarily to the previous uh, identified uh, strains that we present here, this one already had a contribution of the new techniques that the laboratory employs, like genome sequencing, and uh, some other new and uh, modern um, techniques for characterization. And so we can move on now to the exhibit that we are preparing. And I don't know if Professor Paolo wants to take it at the, the beginning. Uh, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> uh, it's a the exhibition we are uh, preparing at, it will be, uh, uh, Present, uh, it will be uh, available today. Um, please, Pedro, uh, help me. Um, oh, uh, I think it starts today at ten or eleven. The opening, uh, so uh, it will run through some days or a couple of weeks. Uh, I'm not really sure. <laughs> I think and we don't. Know, we are not really sure because it is a live. It is a live. Uh, it yeah. is a live uh, exhibition. Uh, yeah. in, the, in, the, in the in the real way, in the proper way, which means that the organisms are alive. So yeah, they us, are presented uh, in petri dishes, live grown cultures, <laughs> and these are just a few examples that we have in exhibit in exhibition uh, down at the exploratorium that you see in here, in the image. So together with the other with the, our, uh, the microbiologists of the other faculties of the University of Coimbra, we belong to the Faculty of Science, uh, and also with the Veterinary School of Coimbra and the Center of uh, Life Science uh, of uh, Coimbra, which is called Exploratorio, we organized an exhibition of uh, microorganisms. So you can go to this uh, exhibition and look at uh, live cultures. You can go more than once. So culture will be different during the, the exhibition. It will be uh, there at least one week. So people can go uh, during uh, this, this next week to the exhibition. And 
we select the organisms that are present at the exhibition, uh, the, uh, with the, the criteria which of the organisms it's more related to me. Uh, so I select two organisms, Pedro select uh, uh, other organisms, and uh, all our um, colleagues select at least one organism. We also ask to the students to select one organism so we can uh, go to the exhibition, look, exhibition looking to our organism. So uh, for me and Pedro, we decide to talk a little bit about Pedro, Bacillus altitudis, altitudinis. Yeah. Uh, so real short because we are running out of time, uh, but my, one of my pet organisms is Bacillus altitudinis and is my pet organism uh, because it's one of the, the organisms, one of the bacteria that has been following me in my PhD. And this is a very interesting organism, is Bacillus. It was isolated from a mining sediment in uh, in a... Uh, in a deactivated mine in Portugal, and it has a very high level of resistance to heavy metals. One of them in particular is tellurium, which is the focus of my uh, PhD dissertation. And this bacteria has a high capability of reducing tellurium and in the process fabricating uh, very structured tellurium containing nanoparticles. So in the exhibition, you will be seeing me detailing this bacteria, looking through this, <laughs> and plate where we have the bacteria with a regular phenotype moving to a phenotype where it has uh, tellurium in it and uh, you'll have a good look in on site of uh, this uh, bacteria, my pet bacteria. So Professor Paula. Okay, my pet bacteria, the one I, I select is uh, the strain called B2A2W2 which is already a robot before being it. <laughs> and it's uh, from the genus Diaphorobacter and from the species, and this is the difficult name, Polyhydroxybutyratyvorange, which is a, a very, very long name. And it actually it describes a little bit the strain. It is able to degrade polybeta hydroxybutyrate. So this is uh, quite new, known. It's known only since uh, 2015. And, and our, our, uh, th this strain was isolated from sediments, from tailings uh, of one uh, um, mine in, in Portugal called uh, Panasqueira Mine, which is uh, uh, in North Portugal. And the strain, it um, it's, was isolated during our project biocritical metals. And the aim of the project is to um, study the, the, um, the, the ability of microorganisms to extract metals from mine waste and uh, to evaluate their, their ability to um, bioleaching, which is the word for micro uh, metal solubilization. And this way, evaluate the possibility to use mine wastes as secondary sources of metals, contributing to a circular strategy for raw materials. Now our strain, the Aphorobacter, is able to solubilize iron, zinc, and copper, and we uh, in high quantities, and is really, really a nice strain. You can see in this picture below here, Pedro yeah. catching samples from the mine. And uh, we hope that uh, after a long study uh, about the genetics of this organism, we will be able to transform this microorganism in uh, bio, bio microtechnology. So to, start, to, to end the talk, I want to Thank you, the, all my students and all the researchers that belong to the group Environmental Microbiology. And I want to thank Pedro for this really, really <laughs> morning. Um, and the Exploratorio that allowed us to, um, to uh, exhibit our microorganisms. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Um, I actually have some pet microbes with me today. So I have <laughs> yeah, you already a have. selection of <laughs> algo and I think some cyanobacteria and lots of rotifers. So we'll see these later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but just, yeah, just so everyone knows, so the Exploratorio is open today. So you could go and see um, the pet microbes if you're in the area across all of today while it's yeah. open. Fantastic. So I can see my next, my next guest is in the waiting room. So I need to move on to the next section. But thank you so much for this wonderful talk and getting us off to a fantastic start. Thank you very much. Uh, of the daytime part of this live stream. We've already been going for about seven hours, but we've got plenty more to come. So thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of International Microorganism Day. And um, yeah, hopefully some people can see some pet microbes today. Yes. Thank you very much. Bye bye. No problem. Bye. bye. Right, so my next guest who's joining us um, is Michael Sawyer. I think we have you loud and clear. Yes. So can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. So yeah, my guest here for the next 40 minutes is Michael Sawyer from Boku, the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences uh, in Austria, in Vienna. So uh, yeah, have you enjoying a nice crisp Vienna morning at where you are today? I do. Actually, we had a very nice week, but today is the first day of rain. But oh, okay. That's okay. We all yeah. need it anyhow. I just had this image of you waking up and going to a fantastic Austrian coffee house and having a nice warm coffee in the morning as you look at the mountains. Is it not quite like this? It's not quite like this. From Vienna, you wouldn't see the mountains. And okay. if I have an appointment at 8.20, I would not go to the coffee house before. <laughs> <laughs> well, then my fantasy has been ruined, but never mind. But um, thank you for joining me on International Microorganism Day. And we're going to have a bit of a chat about lactic acid bacteria and yeast. Yes. Because um, I guess, you know, this year more than any, people have familiarized themselves, whether knowingly or unknowingly, with cultures of microbes to make sourdough or to make homebrew or beer or so on. Um, and so it's quite interesting to, for us to explore these kinds of bacteria and yeasts. And just before we delve into some questions, I just wanted to point out um, to anyone on the call that, that we have some educational resources on sourdough and how to make your own sourdough. So I'm just gonna briefly point people in the direction Ooh, my mouse seems to have stuck. This is always classic. Um, of the International Microorganism Day website, because we have some wonderful um, education resources. So if my computer will allow me, I can uh, prompt us with some lovely illustrations. Absolutely. Uh, and share this screen. Cool, okay. Can you see that? Is that visible for you, Michael? So yeah, yeah if you go to the International Microorganism Day website, come to the educational resources section, you can find a fully complete infographic on how to make sourdough bread. And as you'll see from these instructions, a lot of it involves setting up a starter culture which you have to feed and maintain throughout the process. So this is where I come to you, Michael. Um, with lactic acid bacteria, firstly, could you give me a bit of an indication as to what are these bacteria? Why do they have this kind of odd name? And where do they normally live? Okay. Lactic acid bacteria um, live everywhere, essentially but particularly in environments that are very rich. So you would find them, for example, on plants. So mm -hmm. if you take some plants from the environment, you would find lactic acid bacteria, but they also live in and on animals. So in your body, for example, in your mouth, in your intestine, wherever you would look, you would find lactic acid bacteria. And they are named like this because their main product or the, the product that is very easily visible is lactic acid, which is 
a very pleasant tasting um, weak acid that we use a lot. In so this is the same acid that develops in your body when you exercise? Exactly. That's yeah, the okay. Reason. And it develops actually for the same reason. Um, the point is that it develops in our bodies when you want, when you need a lot of energy. So mm -hmm. when you go running, for example. And to get this energy, usually what we do is we burn sugar. You really can imagine it like a fire. So you use oxygen to burn sugar and that energy you can use for running. But if you don't have enough oxygen because you can't breathe so, uh, so much, let's say, yeah, okay. you have to find other ways. And then you would produce lactic acid. And that's exactly what lactic acid bacteria do when they are happy. They are happy if there's no oxygen. And that's when mm. they produce lactic acid. Okay. So then if we just, um, if I just point us back in the direction of the instructions for the sourdough bread. One of the things I noticed was there's no particular stage in which um, you're particularly putting a sample of, acid, of lactic acid bacteria into this culture. So is the idea that they're just so ubiquitous from exactly. my touching of stuff that they will get into this culture from my exactly. skin and then start yeah, becoming a live culture that we can then use to make bread. From the grain. So yeah. when you take the grain from the field and you, you um, would grind it, but then still lactic acid bacteria are on it and they will be happy to grow. Actually, okay. I brought one starter culture to, to, to show you. It gets a little bit out of control right now. So oh, wow. Let me just stop sharing so we can see you in more detail. Okay, yes. So this is how far it was filled yesterday night. Mm. So with flour and water, essentially. So and the culture that I have in my fridge, actually, and I'm feeding. And this is what happened overnight. And there's not a lot of space left. And oh, wow. Control. But you can see the, the air bubbles inside. Yeah. So what gases those, are those bubbles made from? This is carbon dioxide. It's okay. exactly what we do. So when we breathe, we produce carbon dioxide. And this is what also lactic acid bacteria, or in this case, also yeasts do. And this is what we want, because that makes the bread so nice with all these holes inside. So, I mean, I think you've answered my next question, which is going to be, how do they give um, bread its distinctive taste or sourdough the distinctive taste? And it, so it's the presence of this extra acid that is the slight tingle on the tongue, or is it another thing? Um, actually, it's a combination of things. So one okay. thing is definitely the acid. So if, if you have a good rye bread, then you will feel that it's slightly sour tasting and, and this distinguishes it from other breads. And that is definitely the action of lactic acid bacteria. But the point is these are living organisms. So they take up stuff from, let's say, the dough. So mm -hmm. like some amino acids, some other things, and that will change the taste and they produce not only lactic acid they also produce other things aromatic yeah. compounds and also that will add to the taste and so this is why depending on which bacteria you have in your culture the bread will be different even if you take the same let's say uh, flour okay so if we have people that in different parts of the world following the same instructions due to their local bacteria populations and, and you know the microbes that they end up growing in their starter culture their breads could be slightly different in flavor Absolutely. and taste they yeah. will be slightly different and you okay. can even test it at home if you want to because like it's 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 kind of a natural selection so you take your flour exactly as it says in these instructions and you do it and then of course let's say the ones that are most happy with the environment that you create will prevail. They will dominate your culture. Mm. And so like us, we feel good at different temperatures. I like hot weather, for example, other people might like cold weather. And so there are bacteria that are healthier at warmer temperatures or at lower temperatures. So if you prepare your sourdough and you incubate it let's say at the coldest place in your apartment or at the warmest place, you will have a different culture in the end and it will taste different. Hmm. Okay. So then it's, yeah, the, whatever microbes we have and what they produce 
that help to change well the flavors but also the textures of the bread because i always find sourdough is quite tough is that due to sort of the protein or something behind the bacteria growth or is yeah what's that extra element yes um the point is but you traditionally you would do sourdough particularly with rye mm. and flour and this actually is a very difficult flour for baking bread and if you just <clears> try it with yeast alone it will not work properly um again there's a lot of chemistry behind but to make this flour for example stick together you need some sticky proteins that keep it together and in order to develop that in rye, you need an acidic environment, and then it works perfectly well. Okay, yeah, okay. So it's also the flour that would be used. So it's the combination of these it microbes and the like specific if, flour. Exactly. If you take completely white wheat flour, you don't need sourdough. You, you can just do it with yeast because that will stick perfectly well and you can bake it easily. Mm. But if you try the same thing with rye, it would not work because it's just not sticky enough. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so in these cultures then, when the bacteria are producing acid, do you have any idea of how strong the pH, well, how strong the acidity gets within the culture? Is it something particularly acidic or is it still within, you know, almost a neutral range? Do they have to do anything special to withstand the acid they're producing? No, it, it is quite acidic. So I would say it, it like neutral would be seven. Yeah. And it would go down to five or even below five, ten, mm -hmm. ten depending on the fermentation that you're doing. Um, and, and that does make a difference for the bacteria. And actually also that is one of the things why it works so well, because in this case, lactic acid bacteria are a little bit mean because by acidifying their environment, they kill or inhibit their competitors that could also grow. So okay. this to make a sidestep, for example, working when you make sauerkraut or pickles or something like this, that is the same principle. Um, so they have to have special measures to survive it themselves, of course. So, I mean, when we're making bread, we don't just have lactic acid bacteria, we also have yeasts, right? that are right. helping to ferment the dough. So do the lactic acid bacteria in sourdough cause any trouble for the yeasts? Is there anything we have to worry about? Perhaps our yeast getting killed off by the competing microbes in the mixture? Yes and no. The point is there are a lot of yeasts that do not like such an environment. So for example, the typical baker's yeast, even if it's acid tolerant, it doesn't like so much the environment in sourdough. So in sourdough, you would have different yeast species. Um, that are more adapted to low pH. Okay, so I have a picture of yeast, which I can share, just to kind of put this in a nice perspective for everyone. Um, so it's the classic yeast. We have the classic Saccharomyces yeah. cerevisiae, which is, you know, the standard baker's yeast. And here we have some cells just sitting there on the microscope slide, but we also have then some lumps of fresh yeast and then some pellets of dry yeast. But in the case of our sourdough, we think we'd have more, a more complicated community of yeasts than just this standard yeah. bake. Okay. Yes. And that would hopefully allow you to ferment bread, even though it's acidic. Now, yeasts don't just make bread for us, do they? They also make wonderful things like beer and wine. Exactly. And one of the things I think uh, is good to um, ponder about is, you know, we enjoy the fact that, that make, they make alcohol. It happens to have an effect on the human brain. But why do yeasts bother to make alcohol? What's, what's in it for them? Um, if we think about baker's yeast, that's a very special organism because mm -hmm. it's extremely efficient. So it can produce alcohol very, very, very quickly and to high concentrations. So why does it bother? These questions are always very difficult to answer. And what I have to start off with is that, of course, it's usually, let's say, our idea that we interpret into the yeast. It mm. evolved in nature to be as it is, but why it really did it, who knows? But our current idea of it is the following. The point is, it's again, you have to imagine in nature, it's always competition. So you have a lot of organisms there. 
And what actually each of these organisms wants to eat first is exactly like us, it's the sugar. So we like the sweet things and so microorganisms do like the sweet things. And so the winner is the one who can eat the sugar first. Mm. And so baker's yeast now has a metabolism. So that means it can pick up the sugar and get some energy out of it. That is extremely quickly. And in order to do so, what it does, it converts the sugar into ethanol. This ethanol has two effects. One is that it is quite toxic for many other organisms. So like the lactic acid bacteria are mean, also the baker's yeast is a little bit mean to their fellow yeast mm. organisms because it kills them by making so much ethanol. The other thing is that it deprives the others from sugar because it's just quicker in eating it. And so what it does, it just eats the sugar so the others have no sugar left. It makes ethanol, which kills the others. And when, let's say, it's essentially alone, then it can start off and eat the ethanol very slowly and grow also on ethanol. And in the end, all the sugar, let's say, will go to yeast. Okay. So I have, again, some more pictures, which I've assembled for this moment. And here we have now a nice bottle of, I guess, some kind of wine sitting there fermenting away with some yeast. And we can see the yeast building up here as a sediment, right? So this will be turning the sugars in our juice, I guess it could be a grape juice or some kind of sugary juice into the alcohol. Yeah. And so it's, it's kind of in, as you indicated there, almost like a, yeah, a sort of cheat in a sense. It's trying to ferment the sugar quickest. Producing alcohol happens to be the byproduct that allows it to do this. But you just mentioned it can also consume the alcohol. Yes. Okay. So is there any risk then that if we leave our brewing for too long, we'll start to actually reduce the amount of alcohol that's in our, in our, in our brew? Um, not how we do it, because in order to use alcohol, the yeast needs oxygen. If there's no oxygen, alcohol cannot be used. Mm, okay. And so usually our bottles, barrels, casks, whatever we have, are closed, so there's no oxygen, and that means that yeast cannot use the alcohol. So I think so I have an image. Better. Yeah, here we go. So this is kind of how we brew beer, at least at home, maybe. So exactly. these valves here, yeah, will let out carbon dioxide or any other gases, but stop oxygen getting in. Yes, which is very important, by the way, because the amount of carbon dioxide which is produced is very high, Mm. And actually, yeasts are very tiny, but they are very, very strong. So if you would close such a bottle tightly, the yeast would make it explode. It's actually okay. dangerous. So if you do it at home, be careful to really let it open at one point or add a valve or something. Otherwise, it explodes. I guess you couldn't really tell because you, the pressure would just keep building up inside. No, you can't almost, tell. Almost That's invisibly exactly. until... Exactly. Okay. So can you tell me then what's going on here? So I guess this is an industrial brewer. Um, and I guess we have yeast and, and gas coming out the top of the, the brewing, but they must have just taken the lid off or something because you say ideally um, it would be closed so that the oxygen uh, can't get into the brewing sample. Yes, I'm not entirely sure which step it is. It could also be the, the cooking, because at one point, mm. for example, if you do beer, then you would cook your mold, and it, it might be just the cooking stuff. But okay. there are also beers which are done in open casks, because they want like also wild, let's say, microorganisms ferment their beer that gives another very peculiar taste. Usually also lactic acid bacteria add in, and so it gets a little bit sour. Um, what definitely is interesting is that we have very different yeast behaving in a different way. So mm. some of them, when they ferment, they go down. And so this is the bottom brewing uh, yeast brewing types exactly. yeah exactly and others like for ales they would float on top that would mm. look like on your picture yeah because i because i mean so i grew up in the united kingdom people make lots of ales there so they're using the top yes i guess the top yes. brewing 
uh, yeasts. And I guess is it most traditional sort of pilsner or lagers will be having bottom brewing yeasts? Is it this way around? Okay. And what makes the difference is, I mean, why does one float and one sink? Is it just the density of the cells or something? What's making them favor different positions? Um, it's particularly um, how the cells stick together. Okay. So there ah. are different possibilities how cells can stick together. And if they stick in, in large, let's say chunks, they would sink down. Yeah. They more build fluffy, let's say, structures, which then fill even with gas, then they would float. Okay. So it's also about not just the, the you know, the, the density or weight, but it's the surface of these cells and how they stick together. And will that be down to different proteins or different? Exactly. It's yeah. Okay. Proteins. And some of them we know. So we know exactly if a yeast has that protein, then it would stick tighter. If it has that, it would stick less, whatever. Just to tell you about explosion. So here's something gets completely out of control now. Oh, let's have a look. Oh, yeah. I see. Yeah. Okay. So you've got some overproductive exactly. microbes there. And so, of course, it's not closed, so it can come out. It will get worse until the end of our <laughs> So, um, okay, so we need to make sure uh, that we don't overly seal any brewing so we don't explode our kitchen, garage or shed. And um, we need to make sure we have the right yeast or at least we've got a yeast strain that we really want to be using. Yeah. Actually, I think if I just quickly share my screen again, we can um, perhaps see the difference between these yeasts. So I'm guessing that this one here is a kind of bottom brewing yeast because it's sitting at the bottom of the of the wine. And if we move across to this one, you can see the sediment here is yeah. at the bottom. So this would be another bottom brewing yeast. Um, although this beer does look quite ailey, but yeah, I see it's got some nice color to it here. Because that's the other thing is, I mean, so I mean, when I was growing up in the UK, lots of pubs, lots of ale, all of those beers are still live when they get them into the pub so that the casks still have a live culture of yeast living in the beer. So they don't kill it off or anything. And so over time, the flavor can change and the yeah. alcohol content even can change. And eventually it gets to the point where it's kind of vinegary. So is that the next step in the fermentation? You've taken sugar, it's gone to ethanol, but if you then let too much oxygen in, it takes the ethanol into, well, I guess, ethanoic acid or vinegar-like acid, which is where we don't want to be. Yes, we don't want yeah. that. And that's, but that's actually another guy inside there because okay. these acidic acid bacteria, they would consume ethanol and produce vinegar from it. So if you produce vinegar, that's the way you do it. If you want to drink your beer, that's not what you want. Yeah. But that's other bacteria that are also everywhere. So if you put oxygen into an ethanol solution, you would very easily get that. Yeah. Mm, okay. All these clever microbes doing fun things for us. So, yeah, this is another thing. So, I mean, this alcohol, you know, I think we could all testify that if you have too much alcohol, it starts to feel like a poison and starts yeah. to make you feel quite ill. Is the same true for the yeasts? And if so, how have they evolved to, do, to, to stop themselves from being overwhelmed by the alcohol in the, in the solution that they're growing in? Um, it is the same. It is <clears throat> the same for all organisms, also for hmm. yeast. So definitely there are concentrations which would be even deadly for yeasts, but obviously they're not producing them. Um, definitely there is a point when they stop to live or when, when they stop to do fermentation, when the ethanol concentration gets too high for them. They have certain measures to shield themselves. So for example, by changing their membrane to make it more, let's say rigid is not the entirely correct term, but you can think of it. Okay, that yeah. That the ethanol cannot enter the cell or they have very efficient pumping systems. So they have systems that when ethanol enters the cell, they pump it out mm. and get rid of it. And in this, respect they are better than they are competitors so every cell has certain <clears throat> methods to cope with ethanol but some are better some are worse and yeast is quite good so it can produce like 20 percent of ethanol 
Okay. Yeah. So I guess this is, is it the, it's my sort of next question is, you know, if we're brewing beer, it might stop at say 5%. If we're brewing wine, it might go all the way up to 13 or 14%. So what's the reason that these, these um, different brewing yeasts stop at different percentages? Is it just when we stop the reaction or is it down to their innate biology? Um, no, actually that depends on how much sugar you give them. Mm. Because they will convert every sugar you give them up to a certain amount into ethanol. And so for beer, we usually add the sugar that it will end up at between four and 5%, but which is not entirely true because if you look at Belgian beers or Bock beers or whatever, so there are also beers that go to 13, 14%. Mm, yeah. This is then called the double or triple or quadruple. Yeah, they're very common here in the and Netherlands. Exactly. That simply means that you add the double or triple or quadruple amount of sugar. Oh, yeah. That means that you get the double, triple or quadruple amount of alcohol in the end. And grape juice is very high in sugar. And this is why wine has much more alcohol. Okay. Because actually, I remember reading the labels on those double triple quadruple exactly. beers and if you look at the ingredients sometimes they have glucose syrup added specifically to the to the brewing mixture and i guess that would be then to up the sugar content exactly that's yeah. that's in my personal opinion quite cheating you shouldn't do that i agree i always look at it as a sign of someone exactly. kind of supercharging their beer against the laws of nature exactly. but you know if you want to get a high alcohol content exactly. in a cheap way it's easy okay but yeah it goes against there's the there's the german I guess, yeah, purity laws for beer, aren't there? And you can only have hops, water, and barley. Exactly. And since Those, they didn't yeah. know when they formulated the law about the yeast. Mm, yeah, they didn't know. It's not inside of the law, let's say. Yeah. Because I was reading the other day about wild beers. So, I mean, in most commercial beer production or commercial alcohol production, you'll be using specific strains that the brewery has decided are the one they want right yeah. but in wild beers you you know you take your barley your hops and you mash it up and you produce a multi liquid yeah. but then you just let the natural microbes ferment yeah. beer into yeah into well the, the juice into beer i mean is there any risk behind this kind of method because if you don't know what microbes are in your solution could it potentially poise any risk to human life or are they kind of self-correcting in the sense that anything pathogenic will be killed off by these super adapted microbes for the alcoholic environment. Yeah, I know. I, I don't think that there is a true health risk that you would really produce something very poisonous with something with a procedure like this is mm. quite impossible, I would say. So I think you can drink it. The risk is that it tastes awful. Yeah. And I think the worst <laughs> thing that happens is that your bowel movements will be unpleasant after drinking it but I don't think you will die. Okay. So, I mean, is there any knowledge on how um, consuming fermented food, whether it's like bread, whether it's alcoholic beverages or other things like kombucha, actually I have a picture of kombucha and the um, microbes inside it. Yeah. Is there any discussion of how these foodstuffs change our gut microbes? Because it's a very big topic these days is what composition of microbes live in my gut. Do these food and drink products change what we expect to find in people's guts. There is a lot of discussion about it. And I think there's not so much knowledge about it. So there are very different theories of what you have to do um, and, and how it really influences your gut. So one mm. of the things is that how, what do you give to feed your gut bacteria, let's say. And so there are these certain sugars or something like this or polymers that we humans would not be able to digest but so they can let's say go quite deep in your intestine and feed your bacteria the other thing is if these organisms can survive so like if you think about uh, like all these yogurts or whatever where you have these favorable lactic acid bacteria at least the theory behind is that you, when you ingest it, that they will survive in your gut so you can mm. positively change this environment. But the indications are that it doesn't work like this. So even if it sounds very plausible to us and if it's 
a very good advertising thing, in reality, it looks quite different. Okay. Because actually, one of the talks that we had um, playing earlier in the live stream by Omolulu Fuganawa, who's a PhD student in the University of Huddersfield, he was looking at how f uh, gut fiber changes. Exactly. Yeah. So he found that I think that was more of a effect on your gut microbes. It's not like what yogurts you're eating, but whether you had lots of fiber in your bowels to create a nice environment for certain bacteria. And that had a much bigger effect, you know, the vegetarian diet versus the classic Western diet. Absolutely. Absolutely. That, yeah. is, that is what I meant, because there are constituents inside that we cannot use as humans. And so we don't digest them, but then bacteria can digest them later and be happy. Yeah. So let's say one experience that most of us can do is if you eat a lot of beans, everyone knows about the effect of beans. So why? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, beans. beans. Effect. Beans have a very rare sugar inside that we cannot use. So this sugar is, you, you cannot find it a lot of time in nature, but beans are quite rich in it. And we cannot use this sugar. So when we eat beans, we eat, we take the proteins out, we take the other sugars out, but this sugar simply remains but in our bowls, there are bacteria that really love this sugar and they produce a lot of gas growing on this sugar. And this is why it has this effect. Mm, okay. You can really see by feeding them with the special sugar, you can really change their behavior. Yeah. And I guess if you're lactose intolerant, the same is true with any dairy product. You Absolutely. have this, for you, that's the sugar you can't consume like yeah. the beans and it would make you very gassy. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. So something that's been chatted, you know, either consumed or shared a lot, I, at least in my experience recently, is being kombucha and kombucha recipes. And this is another example of yeasts and bacteria fermenting product for us. Yeah. And um, I guess the thing that people need to get their hands on is the Scooby, which is kind of sometimes quite coveted. And it's this very strange gelatinous disc that floats at the top of the mixture. And the thing I learned, you know, the other day was that I thought Scooby was some ancient term, some kind of you know, primordial um, description of what this thing was, but no, it's just an acronym for symbi a symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast. Yeah. But here we can see some, yeah, bacteria and yeast, which I guess would be making up the Scooby. So, you know, when we, we saw the, um, you mentioned earlier that the yeasts have these proteins that stick them together that make the different yes. positions within the brewing. And I'm, I'm guessing then in this case, this symbi symbiotic culture between these different microorganisms, we'll be producing some kind of extracellular materials that stick them into this lump that floats in your kombucha recipe. I mean, do they do this just to kind of protect themselves or to make a nice environment for themselves? I mean, what's the reason that they bother throwing all this useful material outside of their cells? Um, yes, I would guess so. Again, this is like our human view. Yeah. Why? organisms do something. I mean, it's, uh, we're taking our macroscopic perspective and forcing exactly. it on their exactly. tiny world, but yeah. Yes, but I think that's the point. So they are creating an environment which they are kind of safe and, and they can live and they are not floating away. And they are also like a lot of time working together is very important also for microorganisms. And so it can very well be that these yeast want something that the bacteria produce and so the yeasts create an environment to make let's say the bacteria around them happy and so the bacteria can grow there and give the yeast what they want it could be a vitamin it could what, whatever it is i don't know if this is the case in this particularly instance but there are a lot of like communities like this where let's say one does something for the other and benefits him or herself. Okay, and all the microbes in this community get the benefit of working exactly. together in some way. Exactly. Yeah, that's the fun thing that I uh, think I've learned at FEMS over the past time, two years I've been living here, is, well, living and working here, is that um, it's the cooperation between the microbes in different situations, which I found so, so interesting. Absolutely. And the little communities they form, you know, from, you know, they're not even in the same domain, well, same domain maybe sometimes, but even that can be a bit combined. And then you have these radically different life forms finding ways to live together. I mean, they have little strange wars now and again, but they do cooperate on a huge scale. Yes. 
Right, okay. Right, I'm just going to stop my screen share because we've only got a few minutes left. But it has been fantastic chatting. Um, I just want to make sure that everyone is fully aware of how to make their own sourdough, having learned so much about it. So like I said earlier, education resources on the International Microorganism Day website. You'll receive instructions as to how to make sourdough. And you can think about all the things we might have learned today. But there's also a bonus pack, and it's these burping bags. So these make use of yeast and its ability to ferment sugar into carbon dioxide. And um, you can actually test that exactly yourself. So you have a sugar solution and a non-sugar solution. You add yeast to each, and you can see slowly over this experiment, when you heat up the yeast, which ones produce a burping bag full of gas. And, um, you know, you don't have to take it, uh, don't, don't have to take our word for it. As good scientists, you should do your own experiments, but you might expect the ones with the sugar, as we learned today, to be fermenting uh, that sugar into, well, in this case, ethanol and carbon dioxide. Yes. Yeah. And I can show you once more the out of control sourdough starter because now it's really getting. Oh, it is. So is this just because, I mean, did opening it increase its rate of fermentation or was it already producing this? And just, uh, that uh, I should have taken obviously a larger glass or <laughs> have used it by now to yeah, make okay. bread. So are you going to use this to make any bread or? Yes, now yeah. we can use it to make bread. Okay. So, I mean, have you now managed to replace any kind of external bakery with your own supply of sourdough? Oh, honestly, yes. For yeah. us personally, so I'm one of those people that use the staying home time in the pandemic to start the own sourdough. So this is the... Oh, wow. There's sourdough. the actual bread. Looks very delicious. Because I must say, you know, when I lived in London, sourdough was everywhere. And now I live in, you know, South Holland. My access to sourdough has been much reduced um, just because of the different bread culture. But I should probably make my own sourdough Absolutely. culture you and then I can have it all thing. the time. Exactly. OK, well, I promise you then I will make my own sourdough or at least have a go because I have been missing it. And this has inspired me to make my own. Fantastic. Um, so what are your plans today then? Are you teaching today? Is your next engagement an academic one or...? Uh, my next engagement actually is how to improve my online presence. Oh, okay. So you're doing a little bit of homework already, perhaps. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so in that case, I mean, do you have a Twitter account, don't you? We can point people towards if they have any extra questions. Uh, a what? You have a Twitter account. Oh, I do. People, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, if people have any questions about sourdough or lactic acid bacteria, they absolutely. can find you on Twitter. And um, I think it's Michel Wien. It's M yes, that's yeah. the one. At M I C H L underscore W I E N. Yes. Fantastic. Very happy about any questions. Cool. And any, I, I might contact you for tips if my sourdough goes wrong. But um, yeah, I see my next guest is in the waiting room. Um, so we must sadly move on from sourdough and move into magnetotactic microorganisms, another fascinating <laughs> subject. But thank you so much for joining us. Um, good luck uh, with your next, next engagement on you know, improving your online presence. Um, I just should also mention that Michael is part of the FEMS Education Working Group, so has also been involved in the past and hopefully in the future in helping to put together our ideas for you know, microbiology education. So thanks very much for coming here and representing our education group as well as your own university thank but yeah so much. no problem at all thanks a lot for joining me so thank early you. and um yeah i hope you speak at another time yes goodbye bye right let me let our next guest pedro leo who will join us shortly right now We've said it so all guests start unmuted. No, muted when they join, just to keep things simple. So make sure you unmute yourself, just so we can check we can hear you. Okay. Pedro, how's it going? Good morning. Good morning. Everything's fine here. How are you doing? Yeah, fine. Just beginning, uh, 
you know, our nice morning session of talks. We've completed the nighttime session. Well, at least if you're in Europe. I mean, if you're in other parts of the world, this is now moving towards the end of the day. But it's all been going okay so far. Um, you're actually in the same country as me, which is the first time a speaker has been in the same country. You're in Groningen, aren't you? Up in the north of the Netherlands. Yes, we are in the Netherlands, but we are pretty far, as far as we can get, I think, in the Netherlands. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, I did visit uh, in the summer, actually, and it's a wonderful town. And it's quite strange in the sense that by being so, it's very much inland, but has giant canals to the sea. So you have lots of boats all over the city, which is quite cool. Yeah, it's a pretty nice city. It's my first year here, and I'm yeah. enjoying it a lot. Awesome. So you are studying for, let's have a look. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, are you studying for PhD or are you there as a postdoc? What's your role at the moment? I am a postdoc here. Yeah. Okay, great. So it's your first year um, in your yeah postdoc at Kroniger University, right? Yes. So magnetotactic organisms. I'm going to hand over to you because I love the subject so much. I'd rather just hear you talk about it. Um, but I can't believe that there are microbes with tiny magnets inside them. That just sounds amazing. <laughs> But um, do you have a presentation? Should we just check if yes. we can share the screen? And um, okay. I think I've given permissions, yes. So it should be okay. <clears throat> right, fantastic. I'm going to turn my camera off, but I'll still be here. Um, let me know when things are over and I will have probably thousands of questions for you, but yes. Okay, I hope so. <laughs> okay, so th thanks for having me here. Uh, Oh, it's really nice for the invite to talk about a topic that I'm really passionate about. And I have developed uh, some research during my time as an undergrad, as my, in my master, and also during my PhD. And this topic is magnetotactic organisms. And I really like to start this topic talking a little bit about the, how this was find out at first, because I think it's a really tricky story. So the first paper that came out was in 75 and it was published by Richard Blakemore. He was a scientist in Woods Hole Oceanography Institute in Massachusetts in United States. And his description was really simple. Uh, he observed some uh, tiny microorganisms that once he observed in the microscope, if he puts a magnet on the side of the drop, he could see that the cells were migrating towards the magnet. And once he flipped the magnet, the cells were going to another direction. So that was the first report, was a big thing, as you can imagine. But later on, um, uh, Richard Frankel, one of the first person who actually developed more studies in magnetotactic bacteria, found out that in 1963, there was a um, uh, not a paper, but a scientific report that was uh, describing some behavior really similar to what Richard Blakemore had found out uh, later. So this uh, finds are here. It was uh, made by Salvatore Bellini, a medical doctor in a university in Pavia in Italy. And what he described was bacteria, bacteria that were sensitive to uh, magnetic fields, and he described this as a magneto sensitivity or sensibility. So this, he observed exactly the same thing. And what really triggers me is that if we see the way he described this behavior in this picture on the left, it's really similar with the models that we develop and we observe uh, nowadays, or when we start to have more tools to investigate a little bit more, as we can see here in this model on the right that I will talk a little bit more about in a couple of minutes. So now starting with the topic itself, uh, what are magnetotactic bacteria or MTB for short, as we call them? At first, this is not a, a taxonomic uh, classification. So magnetotactic bacteria are really diverse. They are spread to the tree of life as I'm gonna show you guys. But the common characteristics that we have is that all of them are gram negative. Uh, so they have cell, structure, cell wall structure as gram negative bacteria. They are found in aquatic environments. So we can find them on the sea or on fresh water, uh, basically virtually in any uh, aquatic habitat. And all of the bacteria that we found so far, they have a metabolism that is sensitive to oxygen. 
So they are anaerobic or they are microaerophilic. They need really tiny concentrations of oxygen to live. All of them are, have a motility by flagella, so all of them can swim. And of course, the, the signature of the group are, are these organelles that can, they can produce. Uh, there are the magnetosomes. There are the tiny crystals that in these pictures in the TEM, we can see the cell here, the cell shape, and this black structures inside the cell are the magnetosomes. Each individual crystal uh, of this is called one magnetosome. And here we can see some of the diversity. Then we're gonna talk a little more later as well. Uh, as I was saying, uh, this uh, magnetotactic bacteria is not a phylogenetic classification. Here we have a beautiful tree of life uh, where we can see um, that is highlighted now where we already found magnetotactic bacteria. Most of them are in, in this region of the tree. They are belonging to the proteobacteria um, phylum. And more precisely, most of them are in the alpha proteobacteria and the delta proteobacteria, but also we can have some here in the PVC superphylum. And later we have some clues of a magnetotidic eukaryote that we'll be talking at the end of this presentation. Um, they, so they have a phylogenetic diversity and also a metabolic diversity because we can find these organisms in different types of environments. So in, high in environments with a high concentration of salt, we can find them. Also in ponds and lakes with a high pH, we can find this, this group of bacteria. Also in lakes and also, in, uh, and also in the sea with really low temperatures, we can find them. And also in the places with high temperature, like the Death Valley in the United States. Talking a little bit more about the magnetosomes itself, um, they also present some diversity. So these crystals that they can produce, they, can, they, are, compo they are composed of two uh, different parts. The mineral part, there's the crystal, the magnetic crystal itself that can be of gray guide, uh, iron sulfate or magnetite, uh, iron oxide. And one crystal only can have one type of mineral. And usually the same bacteria produce only one type of crystal, but we have some species that can produce both crystals depending on the conditions they are growing in. And all these crystals have an individual membrane that surround the crystal. So here in the image, you can see different shapes of crystals, right? Uh, on the left, we can see the cubohoctahedral crystals. In the middle, we have the prismatic crystals. They are more elongated, as you can see. And on the right, you can see the anisotropic crystals. Uh, these ones have a bullet shape. And surround each one of these crystals individually, you have a, a phospholipid membrane with a lot of proteins insert on it. The crystals can also be organized in different ways in each one of the cells. Here on the left, we can see a cocci with two chains of magnetosomes, as we can see, and they're pretty set apart. The cell in the middle have one single chain close to the middle of the cell. Uh, I would say that this is the most common organization that we see, uh, at least in the papers that were published. And on the right, we can see multiple chains of magnetosomes inside one cell but these chains are clustered in the center of the cell. I'm talking a lot about these chains of magnetosomes. As you can see, they're pretty much organized like this, but we also have some cells that organize the crystals, apparently not in chains, but in clusters like here, and this one on the left, as we can see. This is a multicellular form that I will talk a little bit more later, but they also, at a first sight, they have some disorganized magnetosomes inside the cell, but they are not disorganized. I promise you, I will show you later. And on the right, uh, we can see this cocci. They have kind of some structures and chains along the whole surface of the cell. Uh, one common question that people ask is, oh, how the cells can produce the so uh, perfect structure? So uh, these crystals there, 
they're not even they are not only crystals, but they're also magnetic. So the magnetosome itself has this the phospholipid membrane around it. And in this membrane, we have specific proteins that can that allow this uh, biologically controlled mineralization of the magnetic crystal. This is also pretty diverse uh, when we talk about magnetotelic bacteria, because what I want to show in this picture is that different classes of uh, magnetotelic bacteria have a different arrangement of genes. But of course, we all have we we always have some conserved genes that are responsible for the main structure of this uh, membrane and also the crystal. So in purple here, we have the conserved MEM genes, the, the, genes, the genes associated with the magnetosome production. We have some other MEM genes that are not conserved in all bacteria, but they are present in almost all of them. We have some MAD genes. Uh, these genes were first described in the delta proteobacteria, as we can see here, but now we also find them in the Nitrospera phylum. And we have some MEM genes, the genes that until a couple of years ago were only finding nitrospira, but now we already find some MEM genes outside this film, I mean, magnetotelic bacteria outside this film. So we can see here that the production of these magnetosomes are pretty uh, complex. And so far, we don't understand exactly how this process works, but we have some clues. And the model that we develop, it's kind of like this. So at first, the, the cytoplasmatic membrane suffers an invagination uh, with already some proteins uh, on its uh, surface that allows this type of invagination. The second part is once the vesicles form, there is the recruitment of some specific proteins that will start the process of biomineralization. This process starts with the nucleation of a crystal. So we can start to see a really tiny uh, iron accumulation in one of the sides of the vesicle. And then uh, with the help of other proteins, uh, this uh, we start the maturation of the crystal. So the crystals start growing. Uh, I wanna highlight here something really nice that uh, was find out that at this part of the process, we're not sure if in the, the maturation this already exists, but definitely when the, when the nucleation this already exists, but definitely in the maturation, we saw some proteins that are interacting directly with the crystal to help their shape uh, being controlled and also the size of the crystal in the end. So as you can see here, we have other proteins in this part of the process, helping the crystal to stay in shape and in the right size. Uh, also, I'm gonna highlight uh, this uh, blue filaments here. Uh, they are um, acetoskeleton filament, uh, majorly, Composed of a protein in magnetotelic bacteria called MAMK, is an uh, homologue of uh, actin. And this is one of the cytoskeleton filaments that allows those magnetosomes to be aligned in chains inside the cells. And some of the, some of the magnetotelic bacteria uh, have, some, have proteins that work as a hook, so they can put the vesicle in contact with this cytoskeleton filament. And in the end, what we're going to have is this, is the magnetosome chain in most of the magnetotelic bacteria with mature crystals and all other crystals in other uh, parts of this process of formation. Here is a nice uh, TM image of uh, a vesicle being formed. So the outer membrane of a gram-negative uh, bacteria is the inner membrane. We can see the vesicle form here. Then uh, we start the nucleation of the crystal. A really tiny crystal is formed. This crystal start the maturation process until they are full developed here. And we have the full magnetosome with the crystal and the membrane around it. Now, maybe the question that I heard the most is, so it's really nice, these crystals, but why the bacteria produce this? Why, why they want these magnetic crystals in the first place? So this can be a little tricky, uh, but I'm gonna try to explain as simple as possible. Uh, in this cartoon, we have the earth and it's just like we slice the earth on half. And what we can see here is that this uh, red arrow is the magnetic, this geomagnetic field, the magnetic field that we are all immersed in, in this planet. And this little guy here is a magnetotelic bacteria with uh, his magnetosomes on the inside. And this one is a regular known magnetotelic bacteria. 
as I as I was saying in the beginning, uh, we are all find them in uh, aquatic environment, and in this type of environment, the gradient of nutrients or especially the redox in, in gradient is distributed along the water column, right? So for this guy, if he want to migrate to a more oxidative um, environment, to a more reduced environment, it, this is an advantage for him because the crystals make him be in align with the geomagnetic field, which is almost perpendicular to this uh, gradient on the water column. So this guy with all the magnetosomes have a three-dimension problem when he want to use his chemotaxis to find a place where it's more oxidative, uh, like here, or more reduced, close to the bottom. And this guy is already on a track, right? He knows, he kind of sends, not knows, but he sends where is up and where is down. So he can only go in these two directions. So he always go up when he need more, uh, a more oxidative environment, and he goes down when he needs a more reduced environment. So there's more time efficient to look for these two types of environment that he might need in different uh, times of his life cycle. Uh, here is the oxy and oxy transition zone. This is the area we, where we find most of the magnetotactic bacteria. And this makes sense because in this area of transition would be the area to be that will be, that will, that will have less effort for the cell to change for a more oxidative or a more reduced environment. To just to give one step further of this, um, here we have a magnetotactic bacteria. This arrow is the magnetosome chain. It's aligned with the geomagnetic field here. And this bacteria is on the surface and close to the surface, as you can see here. So if you need in the blue uh, cytoplasm, it's uh, showing that it is in an oxidative, uh, oxidative um, uh, metabolism. So maybe he needs to migrate to a region that is more reduced for them. So he will migrate downwards. Well, to reach this ox and oxy transition zone. Here is the opposite. In red, he's had a reduced metabolism. So maybe he needs to migrate to a more oxidative um, environment. So he swim in, a, in the other direction, away from the bottom towards the surface. This is all really good, but it's always nicer if we can see how they do this. So here we have a drop of a sample from the environment. Uh, we put a magnet on the edge of the drop and the bacteria swim to this edge. When we flip the magnet, we can see the bacteria going to the other direction. If we flip the magnet back, we can see the bacteria swimming again towards the edge of the drop. This is way more simple and nicer to explain magnetotactic uh, organism than the cartoon that I showed before. But this is the behavior that we that we study and we are looking for for these organisms. And also, this video is pretty nice because we can see this diversity. We have tiny cells. We have lot large uh, cocci, some small rods as well. So everything that I explained so far was why uh, magnetosomes are useful for the cells, but they are also really useful for us if uh, because we have lots of biotechnological applications where we can use them. Uh, magnetic nanoparticles are used in medicine and in the biotech industry for a while, but magnetosomes actually have a really good advantage if you compare it with the synthetic particles. First of all, if you need a membrane around your crystal, the bacteria already produce this membrane for you. So you don't have to put another step on your production uh, for these particles. Also, the, the control of the, the structure that the bacteria have is way better than any control that we have. What I'm saying about control, I, I'm, I wanna say the shape and also the purity of the magnetite that you, that you are producing. But some of the uses are, for example, you, we can actually use the membrane when we make the immobilization of enzymes or the recovery of some cells, or even if we wanna deliver a specific type of drug, we can guide these drugs we can put the drug in the membrane or associate it with a protein in this membrane and guide them using a magnetic field. 
But also there is some applications that only use the physical properties of those crystals, like hyperthermia, where you put a uh, external magnetic field and you switch the orientation of the field to produce heat, or even using this type of crystal for produce contrast in images for medical exams or even some lab tests. Um, I told you so far, uh, I was telling you a lot about uh, that this, how diverse this group of bacteria, bacteria is. But in, as we can see here in the tree again, they are spread all over the tree of life. But most of the information that we have so far from this, from this group of bacteria come from two species that actually belong to the same, they are really close related. The species are the Magnetsprilum griffis valdensin and the Magnetsprilum magneticum. As you can see here, uh, they are pretty similar. And this is a, why we only have a lot of information of these two types, the, these two uh, MTPs. Uh, these bacteria are really hard to cultivate in the environment. So most of the studies that we have so far use uh, uh, environmental samples. So it based on culture, culture independent um, techniques. So what would be the next step of doing this? So our idea was to explore the true diversity of this group of bacteria and find more magnetotactic organisms as possible so we can gather in the most information as we could. Uh, the, dream, the, the dream goal would be to find an eukaryotic with uh, magnetosomes or an archaea. And also during this process, uh, produce innovation on cultural independent techniques so we can apply to other fields of research as well that need information from some organisms that are hard to cultivate. All this uh, exposure of the true diversity of MTB would be really helpful for us to answer this question of how magnetosomes spread through the tree of life. Uh, we have some theories of a uh, monophyletic uh, origin. Also, we have some theories about multiple events of horizontal gene transfer. Uh, it could be events of conjugation, some vesicles that can transport or phages that can transport genes or some transformation events or all or prob most probably all of this together that made all this mess. Uh, during my PhD, I was really lucky. Uh, my, my main goal was these three topics here. So to explore the true diversity. So I have the chance to collect samples of a lot of different places and make some phylogenetic characterization associated with the ultra structure of the cells. Here's a cell that have a kind of weird uh, magnetotactic response, but this is what we usually do. We see how the magnetosomes are organized. We characterize the main, uh, if we can see the membrane around the crystal, the composition of the crystal as well. Here is another type of, uh, type of characterization of the ultra structure. Uh, where we can see the composition of the crystal that are inside the cell that came from the environmental sample. This one was a bacteria found in an uh, acidic environment. There's one, a pretty nice one as well, where we do some um, alter structure characterization of the composition and also the shape of the crystal itself. This one was the magnetotactic bacteria found in Antarctica. And this uh, is something that I really like to show people because it's one of the things that we are were aiming for. Uh, I think it's a little to stretch a little bit too much call this an innovation because a lot of people were already doing this, but it's the association of some uh, phylogenetic or even genomic information with the ultra structure of an organism that is not cultivated. So what we did here is to uh, use fish. Uh, we designed some probes uh, based on the sequence that we have from the bacteria that we collect. And then we can identify exactly which bacteria belong to that group in our sample. So this is pretty straightforward and people use all the time to see the shape of the bacteria they are studying from the environmental sample. And what we did a little bit further was to associate this uh, phylogenetic characterization in the same sample with some alter structure. So I think this could be really useful 
in the future, especially with all this genomic data that we are developing, this metagenomics that we have, that we have a lot of information about the, the gene content of uh, some organisms that cannot be cultivated, but we don't have any clue of the shape or how the cell is or what type of features the cell have in their cytoplasm. So this association with genomics and the water structure characterization is always something that uh, I think is exciting. Uh, as you guys saw, there is a lot of different types of magnetotatic bacteria. So I choose uh, two types of magnetotatic organisms that I want to show you. So I'm going to use this two as an example of uh, this whole group. Uh, they are pretty different from average organisms, I would say. The first one is a multicellular uh, magnetotatic prokaryote, uh, MMP for short. And this is exactly what the name is saying. This is a multicellular prokaryote. So it's kind of a multicellular bacteria. We have two types of those MMPs. Uh, a spherical one that we can see here on the left. The, each individual have a, approximately between 60 and 100 cells. And we also have an ellipsoidal one, MMP, that we can see on the right here. And this one, the cells they have are larger, so they have less cells per organism. From the spherical MMPs, I would say that this Candidatus magnetoglobus multicellularis are the most uh, characterized that we have more information about. And what we have here is the magnetosomes of this organism. And we can see they're almost always on the edge of each one of the cells. And if we do some analysis, we will see that exactly this, the magnetosomes are always in the edge. And these crystals are gray guy crystals, or not the magnetite crystals, so it's an iron sulfate. This image is pretty cool because uh, with the contrast, we can actually see the membrane around the crystal here that form the magnetosome. Uh, the first main question is why do you classify this organism as a multicellular uh, organism and not a aggregate of uh, unicellular uh, organisms? So some experiments uh, were done and what we saw and what, what I wanna show in this picture is that this is the whole MMP. And once we put them in a, let's say in a condition of stress, the cells die and they release all the cells that are part of the organism. So we could think that maybe the cells can live by themselves, but when we do some other types of experiments, when we dye the cells to see the viability of them, we see that once the cells de detach from the whole organism, they die, they're not viable anymore. So they are only found in the environment in this condition, in the condition where they are a multicellular organism. Another thing that make us classify them as uh, multicellular is that the full, um, the full cell cycle of the cell is complete as a unit. Uh, so to divide this organism, all the cells in it have to uh, divide themselves and they stay as a unit. And once they achieve a specific uh, volume or a number of cells in this case, they twist uh, as we can see in this image here. And then we have the formation of two new organisms. So it's a full uh, cell cycle as a, as a unit, as a single organism. Uh, later uh, in 2014, uh, the genome of one of these MMPs were, was available. And what was really interesting is that most of the features that we find in the genome are really similar to the other bacteria that do not live in this condition as a, as a multicellular organism. So we don't have much clue of um, a lot of the features that they need to do to be a, to be a multicellular organism. The, another behavior that they have that's a little tricky is that they, they keep spinning uh, when we put them on direct light, uh, we don't know what this behavior is achieved by the cell, but it's also something that we that we believe can be correlated with some of the uh, multicellular features they have. 
The other one is the ellipsoid OMMP. And as you can see uh, already here, oh, sorry, already here, uh, the first thing that is a little different from the other one is the structure they have. Uh, they have this little aperture in one of the poles of the cell here. And also in the center of the MMP, we can see a region that don't have any cells, but always have some vesicles that we supposedly they, they, they could use it to communicate between the different cells in the same organism. Also in this uh, ellipsoidal MMP, the magnetonanus Hongshenins, uh, we found two different types of cells. So we, we supposedly we could have a type of cell differentiation in the same or in the same prokaryotic organism, with, which will be something really different, uh, especially if they work as a unit. And here we were able to we were able to reconstruct the, the structure of the this MMP, and what we saw was something that we already expected. The red ones are the magnetosomes. And we can see that from one cell to another, the magnetosomes keep in a straight chain. So this is pretty good to, for them to work as magnetotetic because as a chain, they can respond more, efficient, more efficiently to the, magnetic, to the geomagnetic field. The other topic that I'm gonna talk uh, really quick uh, for you guys are the magnet magnetotetic eukarya. This is the main reason why the, the title of the the talk is not a magnetotetic bacteria because early last year, a group from France observed a huge uh, cell, a prokaryotic, a eukaryotic cell that could behave similarly to the magnetotetic bacteria. So they were investigating how, uh, how this cell looked like and why they can respond to geomagnetic field. And what they find out is this ectosymbiont bacteria that this one, this uh, magnetotetic bacteria, they're cover covering all the surface of this protist and allowing this, uh, this uh, protist to use the geomagnetic field just like a magnetotetic bacteria would use. So this ectosymbiont was uh, studied and they belong to the delta carotid bacteria class. And because they produce these magnetosomes that are attached to the surface, they allow this protist to respond to geomagnetic field and have a magnetotetic response. And at the same time, I was finishing my PhD and I observed also this behavior on, my, on some of my samples. So again, a large cell uh, responding to the magnetic field. When I flipped the magnet, they respond exactly like the bacteria would respond. So I did the same thing. Uh, I would like to look a little bit further the, what we have in these cells. And the first thing that I found out was some st structures in the cytoplasms that was not really usually saw in the um, in protists. And under the TEM, I could spot some chains of uh, crystals that I never saw before. So doing some more analysis, I found out that those crystals were magnetized by the crystal structure and also by the presence of iron and oxygen and the absence of sulfur. And when I compare these crystals with the crystals that I could find in the bacteria, in the magnetotetic bacteria in the sample, they never cluster together. There are always different groups and also the shape of the crystals. So we can see here in B, this is the crystals of the eukaryote and here in C are the crystals of bacteria from the same sample. So this tricks me to, to think that maybe they're not eating any type of bacteria. The only, the only way they could um, have these crystals is if they are producing these crystals by themselves. So going to literature, again, I could not find any crystal that looked like the crystal we found in the eukaryote. When we plot a graph of the, well, the mean wide and the mean length of the crystals, they, they cluster outside again. So this crystal were, were, were unique. So the, most probably this uh, protease was producing these crystals, but definitely it was a uh, magnetotetic uh, protease. Yeah, it was published uh, the, by the, as the last paper of my thesis uh, as a characterization of a protease that could, that could respond to the magnetotactic response. 
But unfortunately, we have too little of these cells on our sample. So we were not able to sequence the genome to actually look for some genes that could be associated with the genes found in magnetotactic bacteria. Uh, I want to thank the team who was part of this work. Uh, mostly of this work was done in Brazil uh, on my former group, the Cell Biology Magnetotaxis Lab. Uh, Ulysses Lins was my advisor since I was an undergrad, and but now the group leader is Fernanda Abreu. Uh, I worked with her for a short time in the end, but during my whole career, she always, always helped me to develop this research as well. The other group members, uh, Adam Hitchcock was the PI in Canada that works with the characterization of the uh, magnetotactic uh, protest. Dennis Basilinski was always uh, really a great mentor to our group and help us with a lot of techniques. And with, the, with some people from the Russian Academy of Science, uh, I had the pleasure to develop some of those techniques for the, correct, for the characterization of uh, the fish with TEM. Now I'm here at the University of Groningen as part of the MOMIC, the Molecular Microbiology Group, uh, under the supervision of the Dr. Dirk Jan Schaffers. And here's my contact. If you guys need to or want to ask any questions now or later, feel free to contact me at any time. Pedro, thank you. That was fantastic. You have blown my mind several times and it's only 9.37 in the morning. Multicellular bacteria with tiny magnets inside them. That is incredible. Um, I mean, so I have so many questions and we only have three minutes, so I'll just try and pick a couple. Um, so you mentioned that, you know, they use the, the magnetic fields on the Earth's, the Earth's magnetic pole to kind of organize their movement so they can get to places or at least have some degree of now directionality. Does that mean they behave differently depending which hemisphere you're on? Yes, they behave yeah. differently. And yeah, we, the bacteria that we can find in the North Hemisphere, we call them North Seeking. And the ones mm -hmm. that we find in the South Hemisphere, we call South Seeking. And the most intriguing thing is that if you go to the equator of Earth and sample in a lake, you will find 50% of the bacteria from the South, south Seeking type and 50% of the North Seeking type. Yeah, so we are well, not sure. It's always 50-50. In the equator, yes. The equator. Oh, okay, yeah, because they're kind of making that choice. Okay. Um, the other thing I was thinking was, you know, making these crystals, is it quite energetically costly for these microbes? They must have to spend some of their resources making them. So, yeah, does it cost them a lot of resources? I mean, it must be worth it if they're doing it, but it seems like quite a big deal for a tiny microbe to make these crystals. Yeah, this is an interesting question because it, we have some mutants in the lab that do not produce the crystals, but we don't see they grow faster or in a larger volume in the same time when we compare with the wild type. And also there is a, another information is that I show you some cells with a lot of crystals, more than 10, and some groups already find out that they don't need that amount of crystals to respond to the magnetic field. They could use at least half of those crystals. So apparently they're not that cost, uh, that they, do, they do not cost that much of energy because they're producing more than they need. Okay. Um, and one final question, if we can just squeeze it in, is you mentioned that there's a few different branches on the phylogenetic tree with magnetic microorganism. So does this mean it's evolved convergently several times or is there one common ancestor at any point in time? Yeah, that's the golden question that we want to find out. Uh, there are some groups that believe we have a monophyletic origin, where we have an ancestor that was the first magnetotactic bacteria. And other groups uh, think there is a lot of uh, horizontal gene transfer events that spread mm. these genes all over. And that's the main reason why it would be really cool to have the genes of the, that uh, magnetotactic eukaryote. Okay, yeah, because if that is a true magnetotactic organism, that would indicate radically different evolutionary pathways to this sort of similar behavior we've reached the end of our time slot pedro i would i could ask you questions about these organisms for hours um but hopefully people can ask you questions on twitter and if you have any more yeah reach out to pedro i'm sure he'll be willing to chat about that 
in endless detail uh, in Twitter and online. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we, our next guest has arrived in the waiting room, so I must ask you to move on, but thank you so much. That was so interesting. And uh, enjoy the rest me. of International Microorganism Day from Groninger. And yeah, thank you again. It's been great. Thank you so much. See you guys around. See you soon. Right, so my next guest is someone I've met a few times um, because this is Priyanka uh, Dasgupta, who is the International Microorganism Day intern. And she is coming to tell you and show you a few behind the scenes pieces of information. So let's get her set up with her webcam and presentation and microphone. I think this is all going to plan. Priyanka, can you hear us? Yes, I can. I can. Uh, hi, Joe. Um, am How's I? It going? It's going good. It's going good. I just. Oh, sorry. I realized I hadn't started my started my video, but it should be on now. Yes. Hi. Awesome. Great. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Good to see How you. On International Microorganism well. Day of all days. Yes. As well, the day we've been working. <laughs> um, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So but, I guess in your. Go for it. Sorry. No, no, no. I was just saying. Uh, as is the case with a lot of important webinars, I've been looking forward to this one. And uh, surprisingly, my laptop chose this day to kind of die down, but I've been getting that back up. Um, yeah, um, so it's been really, so I'm here to talk about my internship experience uh, with uh, FEMS for the last three months, three, yeah, three and a half months. Yeah, it was from now. around June that you joined us, yeah. Yes, yes. So it's been fun and um, if, would you happen to have my slides there? Or if not, I can join from my laptop as well. Which no, is I can laptop. get those slides up because, yes, yeah, we, we prepared for any kind of tech <laughs> failure. Calamity um, that befalls us. Yeah. Let me just get this together. But, yeah, so um, if you have – I'm just going to share my screen with um, yeah. the IMD website because if you've, anyone has enjoyed the blog series that yes. we have been putting together, Priyanka was um, – instrumental in putting together not just the ideas for many of these blogs um, but also have written quite a few so as I find her presentation I will just <laughs> get up on I the can, can you see this I can, yeah 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 so that's uh, those are the blogs so the journey to the center of the gut is one of the ones that I'd written and it's actually, uh, it, so the ideas for it, as Joe said, um, we were working on on some plausible ideas that we could pitch um, and form um, some of the blogs and listicles around. So there came the idea of listicles, which is also something that you can see these five pandemics that shaped the world. That's not mine, but um, it's uh, from the many great writers working on the team of uh, International Microbi uh, Microorganism Day. The five times microbes came to the rescue of human uh, problems, that one's mine. And that talks about all kinds of problems of um, oil spills, of bacteria being used for bio, um, bioremediation in oil spills to some problems around. Uh, so the one really interesting one that I found was poop pills, <laughs> which, mm. is, uh, which is not as bad as it sounds, but it's basically using... So the, the idea is around fecal microbiological transplants, which means that uh, to, to implant the healthy microbiome uh, and cultivate that in, a, my, in the microbiome of a patient who might be suffering from some, uh, let's say, diarrhea or some other forms of diseases because of their inability to form healthy microbiome and infection by other microbiome. So that, so that one talks about stuff like that, but in a fun way. So I now worry about my gut microbes in a way I never used to. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I mean, is it, so your microbes are gonna take care of you <laughs> as long as exactly. you're feeding them healthy food, they're gonna take care of you, don't worry. Right, I have a presentation here. So let me um, just start sharing this instead perfect. of the book. But yeah, if you want to read these blogs, obviously on the website, there's even more in the pipeline. So you can go and find even more blogs of microbes from the website. Um, yeah, Priyanka, just give me a cue when yes. 
Um, yeah, I can Steph, just say next. Can you yeah. see this now? Does this is this visible? Not you? yet, but it's going to be. Yes, this is this is uh, oh. our uh, this is our uh, very happy uh, mascot Jalus uh, being saying hi to all of you. And on the left side, you can see my name, which is Priyanka Dasikar. Uh, Priyanka. Oh. <laughs> and so, yeah. this this is a story about my internship um, at. FEMS uh, and working on International Microorganism Day. As we move on to the next slide, um, we uh, next uh, yeah page. This will just give you an overview of the work that I did across uh, these three months. So the main three things that I did was content, social media, and webinars. So in content, uh, Joe has already talked about some of the blogs that I've written. So that was part of the content curation. Uh, because I was interning with the science communications department, it does involve a lot of social media work as well. Uh, because a lot of promotion for the International Microorganism Day and promotion of other influencers and people working in micro, uh, microbiology to promote them, we use uh, social media platforms, which is as most of you watching it on social media will know that it's quite a good platform to uh, get information out there and interact as well. And finally, this is the webinar uh, that we've all been uh, building towards. And yeah, I'm lucky to be speaking on it. Yeah. And in the next slide, um, the, oops, so, yeah. So yeah. That, that was just a nice little trailer of all the things possible <laughs> that you're going to see in this uh, presentation. But this is the major milestones. Um, uh, building blog that I've kind of created to give an overview of the work being put together that lead, leads up to the webinar. So around June, um, I, so I am a student at Imperial College London studying uh, my master's in science communication. And around June, I had, uh, I had applied uh, for internships and uh, the team here, which is uh, Joe himself, I think, <laughs> uh, Joe, Ben, uh, Claudia, Nuno. Um, uh, so Joe offered me an internship there, Joe and Matthew. And at that point, uh, I was due to start my internship around July. From July, then uh, the basic plan remained around contacting influencers uh, for the said social media plan um, of promoting micro uh, microbiology through our social media channels, which was the FEMS microbiology, but I would be working mainly on the International Microorganism Day channel. Uh, so our intention, um, just to give you a background of how we were working, was our intention was to increase the number of people for the accounts, get the information out there, get more people interested, and uh, just create a buzz so that more and more people could know about the webinar happening today and engage with the incredible material Ooh, Priyanka, that is. Can we hear you? Oh, can. Oh, yes. um, yeah. good. Sorry, that was just me at my end. My bad. Continue. Uh, no, no problem. No problem. And this, as um, as I so saw, Joe has been uh, helping me with the technical de details, and um, as he did just now as well. But he's he's been the one who's been guiding me sort of uh, through it. And uh, so yeah, so around July we got the basic plan together. I proposed some of the topics that we could work on for the blogs and the content development, which would then the which Joe then took over to kind of. Um, outsource or uh, distribute amongst people who, who would be the best to write on such topics. I personally wrote three blogs, uh, which I'll talk about later. By August, mm, the social media plan that we had etched up was now being put to, uh, put to use. And we were creating uh, content, we were scheduling software, we, uh, so, I was working on scheduling software, uh, which allowed me to schedule a lot of the influencers content that we'd already got. So one of the things that we did was uh, in IMG quotes, which was quotes from people working in the field and about how they'd been interested in it. 
and yeah same around august my so i the drafts that i'd written off on my blogs and the listicles i'd sent it up for review to joe which was and then he gave me feedback and the review process and the editing process was also a fun a uh, nice little experience that i had and finally we're here up to the webinar where i'm speaking yeah and in the next slide is again just an overview of the blogs that joe uh, that uh, we've had time to cover already in the previous section. So this cover, so journey to the center of the gut speaks about the healthy microbiome that, um, how to keep a healthy microbiome in your gut. And then there's one that's due to come, which is evolving theory of hygiene hypothesis, which talks about, uh, again, hygiene hypothesis, old, uh, old friends theory, and uh, the extended hygiene hypothesis, again, to do with uh, the microbiome inside our body. So microbiome would mean all the microorganisms or the, uh, let's say the biome of microorganisms living within our body. And in a way that we, our organs and our systems are also dependent on them. So that talks about um, these hygiene hypotheses and one listicle that's already up on the website, which is the five times micro microbes came to the rescue of human problems, which you can check out these three blogs and other amazing content as well on the International Microorganism Day website that Joe showed earlier. In the next slide, I have uh, a little bit of the creative work. So I also, a lot of the social media in doing the social media curation, I had to develop some creatives, which was not uh, my main, um, like I was not the person who they were depending on creatives for, but I think it was a nice experience that um, I got to work on designing some templates, as you can see here. This one is for a general um, announcement poster or a template. So this was a really good way for me to actually try out my designing skills. Now, one of the designs that I did design and got used was the IMD quotes um, announcement thing. The main IMD quotes was a uh, template was designed by Nuno, but um, a very similar design I could use for the temp announcement template. So yeah, that was, um, it gave me experience designing mockups, mood boards and style guides. Based style guides of the International Microorganism Day theme on the basis of, on which I based my design on. Yes, and that's been me designing creatives. And the next slide, um, there's I think just um, example of another social media. So this is the example of the IMD quotes thing that we've been doing, which you can check out on our Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. So yeah, uh, so I worked on this with Ben, where I had been contacting influencers all over, uh, talking about uh, uh, contacting influencers to give said quotes and then putting those quotes onto the social media so that it might reach everyone. So these were our quote cards. And yes, and in the next slide, I have a few examples of the creative designs that uh, of the kind of content. So the lower bottom left side one is another IMD quote that we did for the Twitter uh, feed. On the top, you can see a lovely tardy grade swimming around, um, which was some, which is the kind of content that we've been rolling out on our social media as well. Uh, the beautiful under under the lens world, uh, and the right side is one of the templates that I had designed for the IMD quotes announcement. Yeah, and that's about it. I think in the next uh, slide. Oh yeah. Right on time. Uh, the next slide is me again trying my hand at trying to design some abstract version of myself as a science communicator or on the path to hopefully becoming a science communicator. And that's been me. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Priyanka. And well done for dealing with any technical difficulties in a cool and calm <laughs> style. Always very good for a science communicator. Oh, but yeah, wow. it's been fantastic having you for these last few months. Um, you know, you've been very responsive and uh, enthusiastic and, um, you know, we can just throw anything at you and you'll be able to deal with it very well. And it's nice to see it all come together 
on this oh. beautiful day. It's like Christmas for microbiologists. <laughs> While we're talking about International Microorganism Day, one of the things um, that has just been announced is the first winner of the microbe art contest. So this was another initiative that was happening along the same time. And let's just see who it is. So um, it is Naomi Mathy. Yeah, can you see the screen? So we have this Vitruvian man in agar art. So I just wanted to make sure that anyone watching was aware of the first winner and they're going to be announced every 30 minutes um, for the first half of today. Um, so Priyanka, what do you think was your favorite moment um, uh, during I, your internship? Oh, during the internship, <laughs> uh, I think <laughs> most of it revolved around uh, the social media thing, I would definitely say, because uh, the sheer amount of work that went into contacting the influencers and then uh, arranging those code cards or let's say content, it was quite fun. And it was something I'd not done so much before. So the drafts, uh, writing up the content was also interesting, but that was that was something I'd experienced. And obviously you did point out a lot of the stuff that I could improve upon and I'm really grateful on, uh, for that. But I think the social media thing, the scheduling on one of the software so that it could mm -hmm. roll out timely, that was also interesting as well. Yeah. And um, what do you think is your favorite talk that we're going to be having today have any taken I, I, I caught up with the talk uh, earlier just uh, before this uh, which was also nice I mean yeah. um, one of the talks that I am also looking forward to is uh, by another influencer uh, that I contacted is by M and Fatima in uh, or that happens around 5 40 uh, London time uh, yeah. which you all can catch it's on biofilms and I'm looking forward to it as well. Yeah, and we'll have you back in the call for that session yep, as well. Yep. So and for one. that session, my laptop will work because now yeah. it's just staring at me <laughs> and kind of um, mocking me that I'm working. Why did you even go on uh, your okay. uh, mobile so yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, sure. Okay, Fantastic. And just before, wait, we've got a few more minutes, but what are you moving on to after International Microorganism Day? Huh, for after International Microorganism Day uh, with the... With, with the skills that I've been armed uh, doing this in internship, I've, I am now moving on to do a training fellowship at CERN, uh, again in science communications, um, and that starts October. So I'm pretty excited for that. Uh, yeah. Fantastic. So, you know, I mean, at CERN, they still deal with very small things. But they also yeah, use. I mean, yeah, yeah. It's just, <laughs> just like it's a company no one's heard yeah. about. Yeah. <laughs> so no, I, I. But but so at CERN, uh, I think this has been really uh, helpful in trying to prime in priming me to do exactly that. You know that writing for so they also would be right. Um, so my job would also include writing about different uh, different research material for mm -hmm. different stakeholders. Yeah. which is uh, something which is something that I kind of understood while writing for the blog platform on uh, international microbi or uh, micro organism day so not just think about the content but also the audience that I'm speaking to yeah so, yeah okay. hope that goes well well done so I see our next guest has arrived in the waiting room so we must be section, but thank you for showing yeah all the work you've been really helpful and uh, the best intern we could have asked for so thank you very much for me um and uh yeah i've been a, you know crucial and essential in putting together our kind of blog strategy which has been really successful and i think hopefully will add so much more to the kind of feel behind the website now that there's so many perspectives and we can kind of help to grow this over the next few years i hope um so yeah thanks for joining us it's good yeah, to see you. Uh, we'll see you bye. Later. Uh, see you again later. Bye bye. Yeah. Enjoy. Right. So now we're moving into uh, the next section of the day where we're going to be looking at education with microbes. So let me just see if our next guest is indeed Joe Varan, who is meant to be joining us. Yes. Hi, Joe. Hey, uh, yeah, I mean, just unmute you. Cool, can you hear me? Yes, I can. 
Great. So joining me for the next hour or so um, is Joe Varan, who is affiliated with Manchester Metropolitan University and uh, the FEMS Education Group, but also IBBS, which is the International Biodeterioration and Biodegradation Society. We've already had two of your members speaking. Yes, that's right. Yes. Uh, our society has been very active in the international yeah. like uh, and yeah. actually fascinating because um, it's not a topic I know anything about particularly, but when you delve into, you know, because it's so much about our built world and our human world and how it's being changed by microbes, it's fascinating. It is, it is. It's yeah. a really nice area of applied microbiology, yes. Um, so yeah, you're here to join me today because we have, well, let's frame this a little bit. Um, we want to kind of argue the case that we want to be using FEMS as a hub in some way for educational resources. Um, and we have several different resources that I've, we, we've curated and collected, which we're going to go through. Um, but you also have other initiatives that do a similar role, like the Bad Books Club. So I wanted to know if you wanted to say a word about the Bad Books Club and your activities today before we set off on our educational adventure. Yes, I will. Um, I also would like to say before we start that I think there are many, many uh, microbiology academics who have loads and loads of fantastic ideas and have done lots of different educational activities. And... Uh, I really encourage them as much as possible to tell other people about them because the, the, the breadth and the scope of activities that I know about is really significant. So uh, talking about them today, some of them, and also encouraging people to think about disseminating them more widely is uh, I think a great, a great point for today as well. Absolutely. First. Um, <laughs> uh, so I've done quite a lot of educational activities in my career. And when I was teaching also, I tried to encourage my students to think about how they could communicate their science as well as kind of learn about it. So I encouraged them to use art as a way of exploring science or um, explaining science to others, microbiology particularly. And from there, I kind of went on to look at literature and I wanted to look at fiction rather than nonfiction literature, because I felt that fiction was something that anyone who enjoyed reading could engage with. So they didn't necessarily have to be scientists. So um, it's called the Bad Bugs Book Club. And I set it up in 2009. So it's been going for 11 years now. So it's uh, can't have been doing everything wrong. Um, there are human beings that can have conversations who are younger than your Bad Books Club. So. <laughs> That's quite a good, a good thing, I think. Yeah, that's great. And we do actually, we have had some books um, for younger people as well as part of the Bad Bugs Book Club activities. So my aim originally was to get scientists and non-scientists together talking about fiction novels um, where microbiology or infectious disease formed part of the plot. And um, I have a website, the Bad Bugs Book Club website. And on that website, for every book that we have discussed, I post a reading guide so there's questions that people can use to, in their own discussions and also meeting reports. So the website is there um, as a resource really for anyone who wants to set up their own Bad Bugs Book Club. And the Microbiology Society actually this year is also looking at the Microbio Book Club too. So um, just trying to encourage people to explore fiction as a way of um, talking about infectious disease, I suppose, in fact, mm. really. So uh, we've read more than 60 different books over these years. And, uh, <laughs> and this, e this evening we're talking about The Constant Gardener by John Le Carre. So we've mm. got um, a small book club meeting, but then um, at half past six um, UK time, but then at eight o'clock, I'm just gonna post a few questions on Twitter so people can, um, join in if they want to or just see what the the questions are in the discussions visit the well, website I hope they can watch the film and get watch involved in the yes, that's right. yes yeah. I have seen the film a long time ago but maybe I'll watch it again tonight when I'm finished with this live stream <laughs> and join the Twitter um, yeah so speaking of educational resources mm -hmm. I mean so one of the things that we want to highlight and kind of you know help provide is that we have an education section of the FEMS website which is slowly um Building. growing with resources mm -hmm. so we need to improve its visibility but for the meantime you can get there by going to the opportunity section going to our resource board and clicking on education and on here there's several amazing initiatives which I want to sort of show and then hopefully we can inspire more people to add their resources to the board and I'm sure like you say there are so many academics who put time into these projects and we really want to share them with as many people as possible um, so 
the one I'm going to start with is one that for me is personally uh, the most exciting, or not the most exciting, but at least an, an exciting one, because it's one that we worked on here in FEMS. So last year, over the past 12 months, we made um, videos around microorganisms, the 52 microorganisms project. We posted them once a week on social media, and uh, you know they were shared far and wide. Um, this is quite topical in the sense that the most well-watched video was Magnetospirillum, a magnetic microorganism, which we just heard about with Pedro. Um, but now what we've done is we've taken all these videos and we've put them as a resource on the website. And you can now come here to the open source project and you can click on this link and you can download any of the videos that you want to share with people. So we have all the different microorganisms, 52 in total. Um, and these are really great to share on smartphones and they're quite useful for children who you know, might want a more digital way to interact with microbes. And we've created two games. So you can do these with a class or with a, you know, a student body. Um, and the first activity is competitive trading. So if you give these video files to your children, one to each student, and they have to then trade the files uh, to try and get the full collection. And then they must come to you if they have all 52, explain their favorite one, and you can give them a prize. And you can set a time limit or, um, perhaps even ask them to present on the microorganism they found the best. And that's the second activity um, is collaborative presentations. So you can provide all the videos to a group and then ask them to look through them for their favorite one. And then they have to present about them, but they also have to present information that isn't in the video is the crucial thing. So they have to do some research. So this is all available on our website. You can download any of the videos um, and yeah, try and share them far and wide. Um, this yes. is a FEMS initiative. Oh, sorry, go on. I was going to say it's a really nice initiative. And um, uh, I, li I like particularly the ones that for some of the larger microorganisms, there's some really nice moving, uh, moving images. But I also, uh, I also like the music. And I, I did notice mm. that there are, <laughs> there, are, there, are, there are different tunes. And I want, did you think the tunes or is that just, is that just the, something? The tunes we got from, actually, I've just got one in the background here. The tunes we got from just a stock image website. Um, but I tried to pick one so a little bit more fun. But this one here is one. Of, this is the most well-watched video. This is on the magnetic microbes. So I'm now yeah. surrounded by them. And we heard so much more about these from Pedro earlier. But this gives you a brief introduction to the topic. Um, and they're all less than a minute long. And so they're very easy for people to share on social media and smartphones. And the idea is that you know by responding to the new technology, we don't have to mean doesn't mean that it's more difficult to educate people in any way. It actually can be faster and more fun. Um, I also really like the, the the diversity of organisms that you chose. I think you know you 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 don't just pick the the, the pathogens and everything. No, we actually a whole them. diversity of different groups and different applications and really unusual ones like like this one. I think it's it's a really nice idea. Oh, it was great fun to make them, and we um I'll just stop this playing on loop because it will get distracting. But we uh, <laughs> crowdsourced um, a list of microorganisms from staff members and their families. Okay, and okay. so yeah. I think that helped explain the diversity of microorganisms. Yeah. Um, but there'll be many people's favorites in here somewhere. So if you're a teacher or you're just interested in learning about microorganisms, this is here on our resource section. Yeah, and I also, um, another activity you could get students to do is to think about, you know, if, if, have they got a favorite microorganism that's not mm. there and, uh, you know, create their own. Um, yeah. So this is one of the things we've done. So actually, and it will require a little bit more development before it's exactly what it intends to be. But within the same open source folder, we have the editing and asset files. So if you go into this folder, you can download uh, the artboards and the Premiere Pro project file uh, and a few other assets to perhaps start editing your own videos together. And then this is going to be developed further. But the idea is that we can get million microbes. So we can go beyond 52 and try and get millions of different videos. <laughs> in long term future. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you can There's download the asset files. Anyway, I suppose, isn't there? <laughs> exactly. You know, you've got to aim high. Um, yeah. And then have a go at editing your own videos if you have Adobe software at hand, which you can get usually from a university or a school. Um, yeah. And, and, and so students could do, uh, do stories about the, the the germs or the bugs that they're doing their uh, their projects on their final year exactly. projects or their you know or, or school projects or phd projects so yeah, yeah. well anything you're working on in the lab yeah um so this is just a brief overview of a, of a fems education initiative but i have several others by other people on this website 
um, which I also want to look at. And the next one is one of my favorites in a huge way because, let me just stop this sharing since I open up a new thing. It kind of gives, a, you know, this is, we're, we're talking about microorganisms all day, but one of the really important things is to try and understand, well, how tiny are these organisms? And this is what the next uh, resource tries to do, is to show everybody the true scale of the universe. So it's called the scale of the universe two. I guess there are a couple of versions. Um, it's created by Carrie Huang and implemented by Matthew Matori. And yeah, it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, resource. And let's see if it loads up here because it's quite fun to share. So we start at our normal human scale. So, you know, human sized things, but this allows us to zoom in to an unprecedented microscopic world um, and kind of put these things in perspective. So we're starting here at a position where, you know, one meter is a perfectly normal length, giant earthworm. I didn't really realize how big they are. <laughs> also being here, shame to scale, dodo, beach ball, uh, the Raphacelia, which is the biggest flower in the world. Um, but we can zoom in and start to see things at different scales. So is this coming through for you okay, Joe? When yes, I'm it is, yeah, yeah. So, you know, small, but still very normal things here. Eggs, um, earthworms, matchsticks, pennies, square inch, coffee beans, um, grain of sand, ants, duckweed. This is probably where we start to think about things getting towards the scale of too small to see. But beyond this point, we really do get to microscopic things. And now at the scale of a millimeter. So we have, you know, some familiar things, grains of salt, grains of sand, perhaps you can stare at your screen and find an LCD pixel. But then we also have the largest bacteria and amoebas. And what I find amazing is an amoeba and a bacteria are single celled organisms, as we like to know, but they're the same size as dust mites, which are multicellular, which kind of blows my mind because they must have huge cells in comparison to these dust mites. And these single cell organisms are on the same scale. And that's just a bit weird for my mind. <laughs> But as we keep going, we can see smaller and smaller things. The human eggs, width of the human hair, silk fibers, skin cells, and mist droplets. And now we're starting to get to really microscopic things like white blood cells, chloroplasts, even organelles within the cells like mitochondria and cell nuclei. Uh, but we can keep going further. So e. this is E. coli, <laughs> our favorite, well, some people's favorite model microorganism. But what's interesting is it's about the same size as X and Y chromosomes. So the D one molecule of DNA in your cell, when it's all compacted up, um, ready for my mitosis, is about the same size as E. coli. So E. coli really are tiny. They're so much smaller than our normal mammalian cells. Not that we're normal. Maybe they're normal and we're the weird ones. But they are very, <laughs> very smaller than us, so don't yeah. argue. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we can keep going and we can see the largest known viruses. Uh, a little bit smaller than E. coli. Um, obviously, virus is very present in the news these days, but uh, the these are other kinds of viruses which are much larger. And um, we can also then see that there are bacteriophages, which are viruses that work on bacteria. And we're smaller than single-celled organisms here and at the kind of border of life. So at this point, we're starting to get a bit confused as to whether these things really are alive. Um, because they get so small, they just have so few atoms that it's hard for them to do all the things that we would classify as life. Beyond this point, we start to get out of the realm of microbiology and into physics, but it's still no, no less interesting. This is a transistor, which you might find in your smartphone. Um, and then we have, yeah, a few macromolecules, which are obviously very important to life. DNA, phospholipid bilayer. Um, and we can keep zooming in, and then we find the individual macromolecules. So you might have glucose, important sugar for keeping life going, lovely, delicious glucose, mm -hmm. provides lots of energy, um, and a single phospholipid molecule that sits in the membrane of any cell. Um, and then we can keep going even further and we get into the scale of atoms and subatomic particles. But I think this is a really useful tool for showing the scale of all these things. I do, um, and uh, it's, it's always very difficult, for example, some of the um, public engagement activities we do to kind of conceive of the size of a virus particle. And we, and we do, yeah all sorts of different activities to try to say, well, you know, this is a human cell looked down a microscope and now we've made a giant poster of a human cell and this is a virus in that cell and you can make a virus out of plasticine and that sort of size. And then, uh, and, so, and so 
It, it is difficult to conceive of, particularly the size of um, sub microscopic particles, I think. So uh, this this sort of um, vi visual is really uh, interesting, really nice. Yeah. And I do encourage anyone to play with it or share it with your class or friends, because it's just, you know, one of these. Once you have this in your mind, then it never goes away. In a no, sense. It's really useful. Yeah. yeah. And um, we'll keep zooming out just to kind of put everything into perspective again. But um, yeah, as we get back towards the nor more normal method, I'll just mention that this does go the opposite direction. So we can also zoom out and start seeing bigger things. And this gives you the sense of scale in the opposite direction. Um, you know, going on to human objects, the largest things we've built, pyramids, Eiffel Towers, that kind of thing, Hoover Dam. And then it starts to show the scale of asteroids, countries, mountains, this kind of thing, small planets. And then we go out further, we get kind of bigger planets and moons perhaps. There's the earth for scale, smallest stars, biggest planets. And then we start to go into stars and we keep going out and we can eventually reach even huger objects like yeah, nebula, light years. Getting out of the realm of microbiology here, but it's still pretty cool. Um, and then we can go out all the way and see things like yeah, galaxies, star clusters, and eventually the observable universe, which I think is quite quite extreme to be contained within a, yeah, yeah. <laughs> within a single web page, but here we are. Um, and then we get to the supercluster, and then this is the observable universe. Yeah. And um, it's always really fun to just sort of zoom in all the way again and see how long it takes to get all the way down to the scale of atoms. But you can kind of just yeah briefly fit the whole universe into a single web page, which is what I like about this resource. <laughs> yeah, as you say, useful for lots of things as well as microbiology. Yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, keeps going. So that's the scale of the universe. It goes all the way down to quarks and so on. Um, and I hope that is useful to, to many people out there. My next resource um, has actually, yeah, it's much more focused on uh, microbes and it's uh, produced by two two people you might have heard of, or at least a couple people might have heard of them. Um, it's produced by, well, Dr. Ann Madden, who's a microbiologist and communicator and a multidisciplinary artist, Amanda Fingbody Pakia. And we can open up this webpage. And it's a, one of these beautiful designed interactive websites, um, which basically have wonderful art and images and allow us to explore interesting topics within microbes. So do you have a choice, Joe? Which one of these do you think is the uh, one you want to start with? Oh, uh, yeah, human mouth. Human mouth? Okay. So, yeah, we have, you know, this is a wonderful introduction to, to perhaps students or, or, or kids in a class. And, um, lots of poetic text explaining the kind of world that these bacteria and, and microbes find themselves in. So in the undulating valleys of our tongue and the deep sea crevices of our gums, the mouth is filled with unique habitats to support hundreds of species of microorganisms. With a constant influx of readily available food from everything we eat, the microbes have access to all sorts of food. Like an open plot of soil that quickly goes from an open field to a field with weeds to a forest of growing trees, teeth of pioneer microbes that land on them grow and offer a platform for hundreds of layers of microbial cells to grow on one another. But we have, yeah, plenty of different pieces of information and some highlighted species here that live inside your mouth. So, Valonia species. I actually haven't heard of these before. Bilinella. Bilinella, there we go. Learning something new every day. <laughs> I did my PhD on oral microbiology and I did research on it for quite a while after that. So mm. it was really nice to, to see this. What are they like in the lab? Are they tricky or any particular traits or quirks? My particular, my, I think it's further down. My, my particular special microorganism was Streptococcus mutans, which had just gone past. So this one, here yeah, we go. That's, yeah. the, that's the one I did my PhD on. That's the one that was associated with tooth decay. So they live on the teeth. Okay, so they're very much dental in there. In there. I, I really like uh, I really like the language of this and, and it's nice to see the art but particularly uh, within each section they provide uh, links to additional resources as well which you know which which are mm. in themselves very uh, informative too so 
you know, it's like a, the bobtail squid one. You can get links to Ed Yong talking about I am, um, you know, about my, microorganisms as well, the diversity of microorganisms. So, um, you know, there's really there's really good in future activities, citizen I mean, science projects and, and yeah. all sorts. So it's great. Yeah. Quite a rabbit hole. You can start getting involved in. Yeah, you could you could come here and then end up in many yeah, different things. So there's projects. more that you can do. So it's so it's you know it's giving you information, starting off you know something that's very artistic, and then it, it go in, and it's writing it in a communicable language, and then it's going into more scientific data. So it's being really good um, different kind of uh, levels of of information about. The communities of microorganisms, and, and I love that as well, because uh, most microorganisms do live in communities. They, you know, they don't live on their own on a petri dish. They live um, in different habitats with lots of other microorganisms. So it's a really nice, you know, uh, it's a really nice way of looking at it. And that she's also got sections like on in the home and in the shower. And yeah, let's have a look at the shower. Yeah. I don't really think about microbes in the shower, but maybe I will now. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's a moist environment, isn't it? So it is. It is. Plenty yeah, of. Have things. a look at your grout next time you have a shower and see what color that is. Well, I, it's black. Black mold, I can tell. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> so, does it indicate which is the black mold? Uh, might be. Okay, let's have a look at these ones. So we also so have a lot of slimy, uh, a lot of slimy ones too. Yeah. Oh, this is okay. So Methylobacter species produce that pink pigment. That is something I do notice. If you haven't given your sink a sufficient clean in a good amount of time, you do get this kind of pink film. You do. You that do. starts to develop. So mm -hmm. that's what. Ah, okay. And they produce carotenoids, which is a pigment that you find in many places in nature, mm. not just in carrots, but in bacteria. Like flamingos pink. Yeah. Okay, so this is really interesting in the sense that it shows us how microbes live in all our normal world. Yeah. And, yeah, and then you can get involved in more projects here. Amazing. Okay, the one I'm really interested in is plant roots because I live in a um, in a country that's plant obsessed. So in the Netherlands, it's very, very much a thing that you have to have your cool plants in your house, right, <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. So if I can understand how plant roots associate with microbes, this might give me an advantage in growing my plants perhaps. But one of the things I didn't think about until I started working at FEMS was the kind of microbiome of microbes that live amongst plant roots, symbiotically with plants and help them to grow and live. Okay, fun. So, I mean, there's endless amounts of stuff people can get lost in here. Yes. So we'll let them just, uh, yeah, explore to their own um, extent, but it's communityofmicrobes.com. And then, like I say, most all these resources are available on the uh, opportunities board of the FEMS website. So you can yeah. find them all there. Right, the next one is another kind of similar, well, not, not that similar, but it's a, another beautiful interactive website which you can explore. Um, it's called Bacterial World and it comes from the Oxford Natural History Museum. Um, and it's got two sections. We'll just show you the normal website to begin with. Um, but it's all based on an exhibition that was happening at the end of 2018, beginning of 2019. Um, and it too basically shows you the untold story of bacteria and just has some of the most beautiful images. I mean, this is a, this is a Petri dish with, with some kind of bacteria or mold perhaps growing on it. And it just, the colors there are amazing. And again, it's another place that you can perhaps set your class on or ask people to start some research from. And it just kind of outlines in a visually impressive way, so much information about the microbial world. So one of the things it likes to point out is that if you are, sort of counting species amongst all life forms, 78% of them are bacteria. And all the plants that we've ever known are 0.02%. All the animals, 7.3, fungi, 7.4. Protists, this kind of, I don't know, oddball grouping of microbes and, and animal-like things is um, 7.3. But yeah, 78% of these are bacteria. Now, I wonder if they have included archaea in bacteria, because I don't see archaea in this. Oh, it's this on that graph. little table on the on the graph there, isn't it? So. Yeah, OK. They, no, they, they yeah, are keeping so, it separate. Yeah. So, yeah, okay. bacteria really are very numerous. Yeah. And, and uh, one, yeah. Of, yeah, one of the oldest branches. So they branched off well before we split it off from archaea. Mm. I always find that quite bizarre. <laughs> yeah. 
It is, a, it is an absolutely gorgeous uh, website. And also you've got the, the links at the top so you can go straight into different topics from, yeah. uh, from the top rather than sort of racking down all the way, all the way through. And there is another scale, um, a scale zoom in there as well. So uh, there we go. there's a press start there. See what, yeah. Okay. yeah. Bacteria Explorer, dive into the bacterial world. So, well, we're going to learn about all the different forms because actually bacteria do have lots of different shapes. Yeah. Ah, so okay. So it's a similar a like thing. Yeah, cool. Okay. But it, it's it's obviously focusing more on the on the microorganisms and the scale of everything. So, I mean, this is all really great because you might not have a microscope in your house. It's not as common. No. So, uh, you know, getting to grips with scale and size is something that is. Hard to do without a microscope, but much easier now you have these kind of tools. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So let's have a look. When do bacteria start to pop up? Or are we reaching the end? Ah, so here we go. Select a bacterium. Right. Do you have a, a favourite one that we should start with, Joe? Oh, look at that that um, that one. Uh, sorry, the, the the spidery one. Just this uh, one. Yeah. This one in the middle. Okay. Yeah. Whichever. Really, they're all. Which is the spidery one? Do you mean this uh, one? The, the blue, yeah. Okay, yeah. Branched. Yeah, so they're looking, at the, they're looking at the different morphologies then, aren't they? So, uh, yeah. and helping you to sort of classify and find out, find out more about the different, the different types of microorganisms. So these ones are particularly common in the soil and they, they produce um, a lot of our anti antibiotics, streptomyces. So so you can find out, you know, so the, the other one gives you the overall scale and this perhaps gives you more about the diversity of the, of the microorganisms of bacteria, particularly. Yeah. So, yeah. But it is a bacterium. So, yeah. you know, it's not a fungus. It's not anything that not you a fungus would expect because to... it's a eukaryote. Yeah. 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 Another new thing I've learned yeah. today. I didn't really yeah. think about the possibility of branched bacteria. I always yeah, think they are pretty, pretty good, fungus. pretty versatile, really. Yeah. Yeah. I think you've got one of them on the 52 organisms as well, actually. So oh, maybe we do. I think so, yeah, yeah. Hard to remember them all. Um, <laughs> look at a spiral one, because that's always pretty fun. Spirochetes. So these are usually, you know, swimming and the spiral, much like a corkscrew, can help a ship move along. Hmm. The same shape works for bacteria. <laughs> right. Human immune system. Okay. So this is a tricky thing in spirochetes flagella, which normally are very obvious to our human immune system, are internalized, making them a bit harder to detect. Mm. Yeah, okay. I mean, there's just so many wonderful things on this website and we're just at one end of one. Let's have a look at one more quickly. How long have we got? Okay, we've got a few minutes more that we can play about here. But again, we encourage anyone to spend time on here or to share it with people who need to learn about microbes or want to learn about microbes. So I guess the yeah, the sphere coccus shape is a, a very classical bacteria shape. Mm. Tiny spheres drifting around. So yeah, they're not usually able to move. So they just kind of float they're around. They're not green and shiny either, I don't think. But... No, probably not. <laughs> I mean, maybe there are some cyanobacteria which perhaps are a bit yeah more. yeah and there's the bottom one prochlorococcus so those are probably oh there we go yeah okay so yeah, this one is, there we go. yeah so they might be very nice yeah okay yeah so actually this brings us on so this is a sort of another section of this website but i was originally i originally learned about this section um when i was you know back in the world when we could travel i was at the danish microbiology society um their national conference congress i should say and uh, one of the, the keynote speaker, whose name I'm really sorry I've forgotten, who has some amazing research, um, showed us this gut wars game. So this is a fantastic way to show people how bacteria and microbes in your gut are living and competing for the finite resources there. So in this case, we just take, yeah, well, we're going to have to go against Speedy, which is a fast, you know, its, it's strategy is to divide fast, to reproduce quickly, mm -hmm. to try and, yeah, just reproduce faster than its rivals. Yeah. To defeat Speedy, we have the choice of four different bacterial strategies. We can be slimy, we can be stabby, we can be toxic, or we can be vengeful. <laughs> do you have a particular... A yeah, particular... I, do, I do love a bit of slime myself. Slime. Okay, let's see if we can slime, slime down Speedy and take <laughs> over the gut microbes. So this is what happens all the time. If you eat 
a piece of food that contains microbes that you haven't had in your gut before, there's a chance that they could outcompete the native microbes. I mean, the ones in your gut might have a better start and a bit of a foothold, but it's entirely possible that the composition can change. So let's simulate the battle. So we're slimy as these yellow ones, speedy as these blue ones. This is what I, I love, the, the way that you've got this biofilm development. So it's a really nice mm. um, interactive and changeable image of a, of a biofilm, looking at the micro colonies and the, the gaps between as well and how different organisms grow. So that in itself is wonderful. Yeah, and it shows you that, you know, there might be kind of, you know, areas of more dead microbes as well and more live microbes yeah. as the biofilm grows. So here we go, yeah. the winner was yeah. slimy. Was oh, a there you go. And a bit of glue never never goes amiss, does it? Doesn't, does it? <laughs> let's, do, let's do one more pairing just to see if, if Slimy wins all the time. So, oh, we, we need to defeat Slimy now. So, okay. obviously not speedy. We know that's not going to be a good choice. Right. Stabby, toxic, vengeful. I'm going to pick toxic. Maybe okay. it can get through the slime and kill <laughs> off Slimy. So you can see the little bits of slime are these kind of gray blobs, but maybe it'll protect slimy from our toxicity. Oh no, the toxins have built up <laughs> and they've killed off all the slimy bacteria. Yeah. So in this case, toxic was a good strategy and it's pretty much taken over the gut. So this is, this can happen when you get ill or feel ill, a new bacteria can enter into your gut, kill off, helpful commensual bacteria or microbes. Yeah, you won then, there you go. <laughs> well done, toxic. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, games are a great, uh, a great sort of opportunity to get people interacting and thinking about science. So we, we've, um, we developed one called Simfection as well, which is looking at um, community communities and how vaccination can work if you change different parameters. But also I think there's a, there's, um, a website called Game Doctor, and they've produced a lot of different um, games as well with with microorganisms. So there is quite a there is quite a, a market, and there's also board games as well that people can use to play um, for microbiology, like um, Pandemic, and there's plenty of others as well. And Top Trumps games, which I think Fems have produced previously. Yeah, there are some a, a uh, set of cards, haven't you? Card. I've got a, in my flat. They're not in this room. That's a yeah. shame missed opportunity but um i do remember playing pandemic well i think there's an online version called pandemic 2 mm. um, several years ago and yeah the role is to try and seems a bit macabre now but the role is to try and infect the world with a new pandemic as fast as possible and as extensively yeah. as possible you can choose different microbes or different pathogens from parasites to viruses to bacteria i think you can also pick fungus but they all have you know different restraints on how fast they can spread how damaging they can be and how easy they are to treat so you have to kind of pick and choose between these different playoffs. But yeah, games are a great way. And so I encourage anyone out there who is a microbiologist who has the ability to code to produce as many fun games as they can. And I think uh, another thing that's important is if you are a microbiologist and you have tried different things, um, write it up as a paper as well. You know, we've got, we've got journals. So there's FEMS Microbial Letters, the um, professional development section of it that, that will publish different activities. And then you can show something that you've developed and how you've evaluated it mm. and then get that published. And then that will help other people and provide other people with ideas. I think there, there's an education webinar going on, isn't there, at, at 10 o'clock as well. Is that from... Uh, oh, it's yeah. 10 o'clock US time. I think it's yeah. four, three o'clock UK time and yeah. four um, uh, CET, Century. So, UK. you know, th there's more examples of using social media in education in that as, as well and Twitter uh, Twitter and, and others. So, yeah. you know, th there, is, there is, as I said right at the beginning, the ingenuity of, of microbiologists, because that's who we're, who we're focusing on today, is, is staggering, really. And we just really need to, as much as possible, tell other people what we do. Um, other microbiologists and educators. It's, um, it helps everybody, I think. In fact, there's a guest I've got later today, similar, I think it's the same time as the Twitter webinar. So if you yeah. want to learn about Twitter, go to the webinar. This is an Instagrammer. So if okay. you want to learn about Instagram, 
come to the microscope hour. Um, and yeah, so he's used, he's actually published in Famous Microbiology Letters, a paper about his Instagram experience. So it just gives you a bit of a brief introduction to what works and what kind of videos have been really popular. And by popular, we do mean big numbers. I, mean, I think he's nearly got 140,000 followers wow, yeah. just following him for videos of microbes. So there are amazing methods, whether it's games or social media or video, for getting huge numbers of people interested and excited by microorganisms. Because it's not something that, you know, unless you have very specialist access to expensive equipment, that is very easy for people to experience. I mean, we're quite lucky that we get, you know, we've had experiences with light microscopy and electron microscopy and fluorescent microscopy. And the idea of looking at these things close up and in detail just seems quite normal, but it's actually an incredibly rare experience. So there are ways to get that out to as many people as possible. And yeah, we encourage you to do it if you can. Absolutely. And, and another way is to use the word zombie. That usually helps if you if you kind of talk about zombies and use them as a model for infectious disease. That kind of brings me back to my literature book club and young adult novels. You can use the, the zombie as a model for infection and then you can criticise um, or comment on the, the effectivity and comp compare it with real microorganisms. So we've had quite a few, um, we wrote a paper about as, um, the, the modeling of a zombie apocalypse once and uh, that, that actually got quite a lot of uh, readings as well. So okay. that was well, a, well, a simulation called Sim Zombie. What were your conclusions? Should we be scared and fearful of zombies? <laughs> it depends how fast they are, I think. You know, oh, some, okay. uh, so, you know, if you look at the old literature, they were pretty slow, but um, they get quite fast. Once you've got 28 days later and beyond, they got a lot faster. But they're, mm. quite, they're quite boring in the end because they're so um, kind of vicious, really, I think. So yeah. uh, it's better to have something that, that you have a, a chance of surviving, obviously. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, there's one more resource I want to cover before we have uh, some other guests join us who are authors of books about microbes for kids. So very much on topic. But this is a project by the Croatian uh, Society of Microbiology, one of our member societies. Yeah. And it's Microsium, which is a virtual microbe museum. And they are actually giving us an hour presentation later today about the project, what they learned, how they did this, you know, perhaps some experience there for people who want to do something similar. Um, it's at noon till one UK time, and they have three different talks by people involved in the project. But one of, and this isn't the only output, one of the outputs of the project was this Microsium Museum, which tries to show people, yeah, how microbes in their own house and in their own home um, are incorporated into their lives. And it's available in Croatian and English. Obviously, this is the English version. Um, but let's have a look down in the living room. And what we can do is we can look over different sections and learn a bit more about what's going on here. So here we're learning about how, yeah, we are full of microbes. We are our own microbes. And um, yeah, it provides lots of interesting information and links to new sources and, you know, fantastic facts. If we could collect all the germs and the genes from our gut and put them on the scale, they would weigh about 1.5 to 2 pounds or a kilogram if you're in the metrics. Mm which is kind of astounding if you just think about, you know, macroscopic masses of tiny microscopic things. Yes, so it's a really lovely, it's a really lovely website. And, uh, you know, it's uh, attractive for younger, younger viewers as well, I think. Uh, and, and that's another um, interesting issue, you know, it's who, who your audience is and how you can modify different activities to the age or the experience of your audiences. And many of these websites are, I mean, adults are very interested in much of this as well as, um, mm. as, well as children and young adults. So the, the versatility of lots of these activities is um, significant as well. And it's also a great um, opportunity for artists and scientists to collaborate because you have to get people yes. who are creatively talented to produce beautiful illustrations. You have to get people who are, I guess, epistemologically or empirically talented to get the knowledge and combining them together produces something which is better than the sum of its parts. So absolutely to help hope you can, yeah. Yeah. Encourage more of this as possible. Um, and you've got your micro art competition, haven't you, as well? We for, do, uh, actually, let's just turn to that for a second before we have our next guest on the line, because I think some of the winners have been announced. All right. So in the past few hours, we have learned that the winner of the Agar Art Competition is Naomi Mathie with this fantastic oh, wow. yeah. movie and man, which is, you know, 
I think just blew everyone out of the water. Yeah. So congratulations to Naomi. And the best cartoon from Joanna Carvalho, who you can also find on Twitter, is this wonderful, wonderful illustration of different kinds of microbes living in bubbles. And we can already now understand a few more details about the shapes. We've got some spirillium, yeah. we've got some flagella, we've got uh, the spherical coccus shaped bacteria. And yeah, beautiful illustration here. Yes, lovely. And just announced ooh, nine minutes ago, <laughs> this wonderful piece by Sarah Adkins Jablonski, which is made from kind of superimposed images from agar art yeah, put into yeah. this beautiful, beautiful kind of um, illustration image here. Yeah. So well done. All of the uh, microbe art winners will be receiving prizes, um, microbe themed prizes. We'll announce those after the day is done and we can contact all of the prize winners and just make sure we have all their details. But they will all be receiving some prizes and details on that coming soon. So yeah. well done to everyone who entered and well done to the winners. There's more to come. I think they're every half hour between now and one o'clock. Yeah, great. Right, we have a couple of guests who I shall just bring into the call, who are some young authors of books. Let's just stop sharing um, about microbes. So let's just make sure we've got everybody here. So Sarah and Katie. Good morning. Morning. So you'll start muted. So if you can unmute your microphone, just to check everybody's here. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. So we've got um, Sarah Hull, who is the author of Sea Inside Germs, and uh, Katie uh, Danes, who is the author of a younger title, or for younger kids, I'm guessing, or is it just a younger title? No, for younger kids, definitely. Younger kids, yeah, called What Are Germs? Um, so I'm just going to hand over to you guys to give a brief introduction about each of these books, and then I have some questions for you, as always. But um, if you share your screen, you should be able to give us a little presentation and about these these beautiful books. Okay, great. I'll share my screen now. Um, just want to say it's it's such a treat to be invited along, and that Sarah and myself feel a bit of imposters here because we don't have a background in um, in science, let alone in um, microbes. But we do have expertise in children's books. Um, so we, we were just I, saying that how important it is that. Uh, people need to work together actually to to communicate so that's perfect wonderful yeah so we hope we can take a complex topic and with expert input we can then turn it into something that's accessible for children um so i hope you can see my screen um this is a summary of the books we've got um out already and in the pipeline so see inside germs sarah will be talking about um that's more kind of key stage two so age seven plus uh, what are germs? That's a that's a young three plus preschool book, and then what is a virus will be coming out next year. Um, so more reception key stage one. But we'd like to say with all our books that you're never too young or too old to to read and find out more from them. So I'll just pass over to Sarah, who just need to un unmute yourself, Sarah. Great. <laughs> so I'm talking about Sea Inside Germs, which came out this year. Um, but I actually started working on it more than two years ago, so long before anyone had heard of COVID-19. It's 16 pages with lots of flaps to lift, more than 100 in fact, and covers a lot of ground. Everything from what germs are and microbes to how germs spread, vaccines, antibodies, uh, antibiotics, and even antimicrobial resistance. Um, if we could have the next slide, we can have a bit of a look inside. Um, so... A big part of what we do to make these books is about combining information with illustration to make them really appealing and accessible to our audience. And um, this is especially important for a topic like germs where um, there's lots of tricky concepts that our readers won't have um, encountered before. And of course, an added complication is that um, a lot of the things you're talking about are far too small to see. So writers like us will work very closely with in-house designers to develop layouts for the spreads and it usually takes a few attempts um, and so I started this book um, once I'd done a bit of initial research by coming up with concepts for the page with the designers so we decided the virus page would be set in a factory and um, the spreading germs page um, we wanted to set in the real world to show how things how, how germs can really spread around. And here 
um, on the page you can see, we decided to talk about good and bad bacteria so that, um, so that I wasn't just giving an, a negative picture of germs, but also showing how bacteria and it could do useful things for us. Um, on this book, we worked with the illustrator, Peter Allen, who, um, as you can see, he's, he's added a lot of energy to the pages with his spiky drawings. And he was really brilliant at giving the microbes lots of character. And um, you can see we've got little bacteria wearing chef's hats and um, they're the ones involved in helping make food. And below them, there are um, bacteria cleaning up sewage and oil spills with lots of cleaning equipment. Um, and, and another thing I wanted to mention about this topic was that we needed to try and strike a balance between talking about scary diseases and making sure we weren't going to give our readers nightmares. Um, and sometimes this could involve a bit of to and fro. So for um, our illustrator illustrated a flap about plague and with lots of dead bodies on and um, we had to remind him about the audience and <laughs> get him to take them out. Um, and um, the flaps are obviously really important to how Sea Inside, work, uh, sea Inside Germs works for readers. They make the pages really dynamic and allow readers to explore the material as they, as they choose to. Um, flaps can reveal surprising facts or a punchline tells stories in a comic strip form. And um, they're also really useful for breaking down complex ideas and making them quite simple. So um, the example up on the presentation at the moment um, is um, about how bacteria turn into superbugs. And here we just used three flaps to explain how, how these mutations happen. And um, obviously Peter's funny illustrations which show the bacteria randomly gaining a shield and then developing into a big army of armored bacteria. Um, and um, so if we move on to the next spread, um, this, this is the spread that that um, little snippet comes from, which is the final spread of the book. And obviously super bugs are really quite scary and I didn't want to end on a scary note um, to come back to my point about not wanting to give our readers nightmares. So um, I decided to end off with um, a mention of microbe heroes, some of the microbes that might help us fight superbugs and also tackle other problems like plastic pollution. Um, so they're quite fun. And I also wanted to end with a call out to our readers, um, suggesting that they could become scientists and find new antibiotics to help us tackle these problems. Thank you very much. That's good. <laughs> More scientists, please. Yeah, I also I'm very, very happy to see you uh, showing the good side of microbes as well, because, yeah. you know, especially this year, there's a lot of bad press around microbes. <laughs> yes. yeah. um, but showing all the wonderful things they do is, you know, a fantastic thing. In fact, in the live stream that's already happened, we had talks about bacteria degrading plastics and uh, cleaning up oil spills. So it's really nice to see those in the book as well. Yeah. Um, does yeah there, is, is there a link to, uh, does, does Usborne provide resources that support these books as well, did I see? Um, there are, I think lots of our books are internet linked, so there'll be um, safe places on the internet where children can read a bit more about things that come up in the book. Great, it's great. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, I had a couple of questions. Um, so you mentioned that you, um, you know, you try and work with experts uh, to try and get these books as accurate as possible. Mm. So um, how do you find that experience then as a non-expert? What's the most challenging and the best thing about working with sort of scientists? Um, well, I, I think it's very reassuring to know that um, the things that I've decided are interesting um, will be read and approved by someone who knows their stuff. Um, and it can also be we, we like to get them involved quite early on as well so that they um, they sometimes mix things up early on. So my expert, um, who's a clinical medic, um, suggested that we might need to explain what a cell is right at the beginning of the book um, in order to 
tie everything together and that was really useful um i i yeah <laughs> cool um another thing is i mean so you also have lots of artists produce work for you so do you have to connect the artist and the scientist up at any point during the process or do you act as like a go-between we usually act as a go-between um but the expert will look at all the final artwork just to check that we haven't made um a bacteria the wrong shape or that our phagocytes have the right shape nucleus or <laughs> yeah. details like that they'll make sure that all of that's correct but then we feed that detail back to the illustrator we always use photo references where we can and if it's something yeah. really obscure that we struggle to find then we'll ask the expert can you get me um, a reference for this particular um microbe or situation um so it's it's quite an important relationship, that one with the expert, that we feel it's someone we can bounce ideas off. And also that they take us seriously, even though it's for a really young age, that we're really passionate about um, getting good science across. But sometimes we do have to give them smiley faces and, and make it approachable. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a balance there. I like the smiley faces on the bacteria. I know it's not strictly correct, but it is fun to, <laughs> <laughs> to personify these things in a way. <laughs> I'd like to see a few of the, the, the younger book, just whiz through. Yeah, let's have a look at it. Um, yeah, so just to give an example of um, taking a topic really, really young, um, and again, how important the illustrations and, are and the, and the text alongside and how brilliant flaps are, uh, allowing us to go inside things, zoom in on things, um, animate the scene. Um, we've got the, there are more, than, more germs than you think in the kitchen sink here, um, and then you open this massive flap and... The, the germs are multiplying and, and having a party in the sink. Um, and, and here we've got, um, how can you fight germs? So looking at natural defenses, getting the flaps to open so you've got inside the nostril and all those kind of yucky um, bits that the kids like, like um, the bottom right there, you, the, the, the germs being killed off by um, stomach acid, but done in a, a palatable, amusing, amusing way, hopefully. Um, and I, I didn't know whether to include this actually with, with such a, a professional audience here, um, but I just wanted to show how we tried to boil down even explaining how a vaccine works. So making the, um, the syringe uh, into the teacher who's teaching a class of white blood cells, um, how to make the right antibodies to, <laughs> to, kill, off, to kill off germs. So um, yeah, hopefully we managed to get enough of the proper facts and, and condense them down so that they're um, approachable um accessible um and then then this book is the one that's in the pipeline so coming out next year but that's been my lockdown really is trying mm. to get out a book on viruses which um a year ago we'd never dreamed of doing um at all probably let alone for this really young age group so it's a mark of how the the world has changed yeah um, really important it's great mm. how is how is what stage then is this book in the pipeline? So you've begun drafting the text. Are you working with the artist yet? Or I don't really know how finished. the pipeline it, works. It's finished. It's okay. Through, so. And it's gone. I haven't seen the um, the proofs yet, but um, it's been approved by the expert, by um, everyone in-house. And what's quite remarkable for this title, and again, a sign of the times, is um, that 15 other languages want to jump on our first print run. So normally they'll wait to see the book and whether they like it, whether their markets will want it. But this time they're, they're just going for it. Um, and that's been the case actually um, with, with all our um, micro books uh, in the last year, just different languages um, coming on board, wanting to print it because of the, the huge importance, especially the hand hygiene with, with younger children. Um, so th there's just an example here of how recently South Korea have printed the Seaside Germs book and everybody who buys it gets a free face mask strap because that's a, yeah. a big thing in, a, in, in South Korea, apparently, yeah, yeah. Um, accessory. Um, awesome. But yeah, that, that's it from, from our presentation. So I'll, I'll stop sharing. Awesome. Thank Thanks a lot for joining us. Um, yeah, yeah, can we just ask the, vi the virus but do you said it was coming out in 2021 is it going to be available for the christmas market or not then uh, no unfortunately well, for for this year no it will yeah. be um i think march is uh, the scheduled publishing date but if okay. we can whiz it through quicker it's, it's a long-winded process that the yes. printing side, but um certain 
printers can work faster. So I think they might try and get it out earlier if possible. Yes, thanks so. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Awesome. Right. Thanks for joining us. Um, we've got five minutes before our next session. So I was just going to run through the education resources section on the International Microorganism Day website, because we have done, and you don't have to stay for this, Katie and Sarah, but okay. <laughs> you can leave at the moment. But thank you so much for joining us. And, thank you um, for having us. Find yeah. this book, I guess, in all good, these books in all good bookshops, which is something I've always wanted to say. <laughs> but there's one final thing that we can show before we move on to our next speaker. And this has been, yeah, I guess a new thing for International Microorganism Day. In a very similar way, we've kind of combined artists and scientists and researchers, and we've produced two educational resources um, for IMD, and they're here and they're free, and you can you can download them whenever you want. Um, and they are just here in the education resources section. Hopefully, in time we can expand it. But at the moment, we have um, one on the Winogradsky column, and one I mentioned earlier with our uh, wonderful microbiologist Michael Sauer is how to make sourdough bread. So I'll dive into Winogradsky. Um, who was a Russian microbiologist um, who kind of paved the way for thinking about environmental and ecological microbiology. So one of his experiments was to build these kind of columns. So you can use lots of just general household materials you can see here. You have to basically mix together a kind of strange substrate here with eggs and uh, paper and mud. Um, and you build this kind of layered column within a plastic bottle. You expose it to things like warmth and a little bit of sunlight um, and yeah the idea is you take pictures of it every week for, for eight weeks and you set up your mixture with different combinations and basically what happens and it's a shame to give away the ending but you develop a layered structure of bacteria living in a community that all have vibrantly different colors so you get to see this wonderful sort of demonstration of how microbes organize themselves into different communities within uh, within an environment. And um, all of these resources have the main infographic, which is useful for teaching, but then they also contain separate teacher and student instructions. So if I just load this up, we can have a look. Um, so this is what you would give to your class. It seems to not be working right now. Oh, here we go. Are they, um, uh, is there a, an opportunity for people to uh, post their photographs on, on, uh, on a website anywhere? Um, so you can always tag us at hashtag International Microorganism Day and we will yeah. re we'll retweet you. Um, if you're on Twitter or if it's on Instagram, we can put you in our story or if it's Facebook, we can share you as well. Yeah. So if you want to do any of these experiments and, and have a bit of interaction with us, just simply use the International Microorganism Day hashtag and uh, we will retweet your pictures. But yeah, this is what you'd give to uh, the class, some nice instructions, and then there's a special teacher's pack with a few bits of material for the teacher and also some kind of health and safety stuff about how to make sure it's sterile and how you're not gonna kill anyone. Um, so yeah, hopefully people can make use of this. The other one I went through a little bit earlier was how to make sourdough, very similar kind of uh, design and infographic, making the culture, feeding it, keeping it going for a few weeks, and then using it to eventually make bread. And there's also a little bumper pack here for another kind of thing you can do to show how sugar leads to carbon dioxide production in yeast. Um, and again, there's a teacher and student pack at the end if you want to do this with a class. So yeah, both available here. Two books available in the shops. Hopefully there's lots of materials on the website that we've run through over this past hour um, to help you teach and explore microbes to a whole range of kids and students. And, and also a great opportunity to share if you're doing anything, yeah. uh, anything yourselves as well. And FEMS, FEMS are here to kind of help to disseminate and um, FEMS, FEMS member societies also produce lots of things too. So it's uh, uh, microbiologists are very, very dedicated when it comes to education and communication, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so important as well. It's one of these things that really does make a big difference in terms of public health and, you know, lifestyle science literacy generally as well i think yeah exactly yeah yes um so yeah check these out if you're a teacher or if you're just interested uh our next speaker has arrived in the waiting room so sarah and katie and joe i must say goodbye Bye to all of you. Lovely to thanks see you. for joining me okay. and um yeah enjoy international microorganism day thank you very much enjoy the rest of your day i will do enjoy yours Bye. right so, on the line, we should have 
Terry McGinty from the University of Essex in the UK. Hello, John. Hi, cool. I can hear you all loud and clear. Good, good. So you have another education themed talk to be giving us today titled Class Excursions to Ignite Children's Enthusiasm in Microbes. So I'm just going to hand over to you, basically, because you've got 20 minutes and I think you probably have enough to say. Um, and I'll see you at the end. So, yeah, just check your... Have you got slides to share? Yes, I have. Yeah, I'll, I'll share my screen now. And Can you okay? Yes. Oh, it's just loading. Um... I'll just check to make sure it works before I go. Yes, we see your presentation. Okay, great. I'll just get out of the way so I'm not distracting. And yeah, you've got 20 minutes. Let's learn about okay. Thank you. Well, first of all, uh, a big thank you to the organizers. It's great to be part of this uh, exciting day. Uh, I'm Terry McGannity from the University of Essex, and I'll be talking about class excursions to ignite children's enthusiasm for microbes. So first of all, the big uh, main message about why microbiology literacy in general, that we've just been hearing about, uh, and class excursions in particular, are important. First of all, microbes and their activities are vital to the functioning of human health and the planet. Uh, think that every second breath we take, half the oxygen is produced by marine microbes. Half the cells in our body are microbial. And these things affect everyday decisions. So everything from when you should wash your hands, uh, when you should take antibiotics, what are the consequences of disposing of them inappropriately. If I have a bit of bioplastic, for example, it's labeled bioplastic, can I put it in my compost? Will it degrade? Will the bacteria degrade it? These are all important questions and, and hundreds more besides. But the problem is microbes are essentially invisible. They have a major image problem as well. So who should we be um, aiming at really to, to, to encourage microbes and literacy? Well, essentially everyone, given that all the decisions that people make, a lot of the decisions that people make are microbiologically based but particularly children. They're incredibly receptive, they're the adults of the future, and they share information. How should we be doing this? Well, many of the ways explored in the previous session uh, at the International Microbiology Day, they should be enjoyable, of course, hands-on, and real exposure to examples of microbiology activities. And the result should be really tangible links between microbes and their activities with the result of making microbes visible. Okay, so I should just say that everything I'm going to talk about and all the images that I present uh, are published in this editorial um, on, this, on this topic. It was published this year. It's open access. You're very welcome, of course, to... To, to read it, and it's a big international group of co-authors, big international project. It was only going to be a few pages long, but uh, you can probably see here it turned into a labour of love, 43 pages. And this is part of a bigger programme led by Ken Timmis, the micro Microbiology Literacy Programme. So I'll just give you a bit of background that first. Uh, well, first of all, there's, a, there's a, a, another editorial that preceded uh, the excursions one on this, the urgent need for microbiology literacy in society. Again, a big international group. And this is what the project is about. There's really six main tasks. The first is to develop a curriculum with all sorts of topic frameworks. And these topic frameworks are essentially microbiological stories that teachers can take and adapt for all age groups. And these are all in progress. And I'll just give you a little flavor of what these look like. They're on all sorts of, of topics. So this one is on pet dogs. And each of these topic frameworks begins with a 
child-led question. So this one is, Daddy, Raphael has just been given a gorgeous little puppy for his birthday. Can we have one? I'm sure many parents are familiar with this question and there's no doubt that the, the puppy there is psychologically wonderful for and it also has many other benefits, but also some microbiological issues. So in each case, we'll look at, we look at uh, the underlying microbiological issues and importantly, the connections to sustainable development goals and other global challenges. So some examples in this case of, of what we talk about. So dogs mediate exposure to, to many different microbes and that's important for the development of a healthy immune system. So that's a positive feature of dog ownership. On the more negative side, dogs may catch a number of different infections and some of these rarely can be transmitted to humans. And then that raises issues also of vaccines and antibiotic use. So all these peripheral topics are discussed and brought together, all centered around this very particular question from a child. And then there's the issue of dog food, uh, which has a significant environmental impact and contributes to greenhouse gas emissions. Why? Because it comes from cattle and cattle that have a rumen packed full of methanogenic archaea that liberate methane through the burping of the cows. So that just gives you a flavor of these topic frameworks and what's involved. We also have within this uh, resources uh, uh, for, for teachers and ideas uh, for uh, class activities. And then there's a section or, or a, a component that's about class experiments. And then there's the class excursions uh, aspect that I'm going to talk about in detail. And then a whole bunch of other teacher aids, videos, games, cartoons, comics, books like you've just seen. And then there's going to be a trialing of the core frameworks in schools next year. And a big thing is to try and get the message across and pursue the ministries of education. We can all help with that. And everyone is welcome to get involved at any level this project. Okay, so I'm going to talk specifically about uh, excursions. Why excursions? What are the educational societal benefits of having an excursion? Well, no excursion will exclusively be about microbiology. Okay, let's use the example of uh, going to a, a cheese manufacturer, taking glass out to a cheese manufacturer. You'll learn, yes, about lactic acid bacteria, you'll learn about other microbes added to the cheese to enhance flavor, for example. But you'll also learn about global issues, the feedstocks, how they're transported, the carbon footprint of the process, how to deal with the waste. And then you can learn about local issues, the history, of cheese making in the region, the local pride associated with it, and importantly, potential job opportunities. And then excursions tend to be a multi-sensory experience. So I show you some, a picture here of some dead fish. You see dead fish. I take you out into the field, to you don't only see the vast number of dead fish, in this case, you smell them. And then you can look around, you can use your vision and you may see, for example, an algal bloom. And then you look further and you see that the lake's surrounded by agricultural fields. And then you start making connections. And this raises questions. What's causing these fish to die? Is it a runoff of nutrients from agriculture? And then who are the algae that are blooming? Are they producing toxins or are they affecting the fish in other ways? And why do the fish smell? And all of these have microbiological issues. The fish smell is due to uh, bacteria that break down and metabolites in the fish to produce trimethylamine. You've got issues uh, associated with uh, aerobic respiration. 
decreasing the oxygen, oxygen and uh, the nitrogen cycle in the field. So you get the whole picture if you go out and see things in reality. And there's very good evidence that being in natural surroundings improves learning. And in particular, it's beneficial for those who do not thrive in the traditional classroom. And then this type of, type of learning provides a bridge to and enriches so-called informal learning. So example, informal learning is, is, is where you learn from watching the TV or going to the shop. So for example, if you've been to a cheese manufacturer's and you go out for lunch with your family, you can start to tell them about how the brie in the sandwich are made and the microbiological uh, processes involved in sharing that with friends and family. Excursions are also good because you get exposed to new teachers, so it's enriching in that way. As I said before, it's an introduction to potential future careers and ultimately uh, educational fun activities for children and importantly for teachers, part of their development too. Okay, so I've extolled the virtues of going on an excursion, but come on, we're in a pandemic here, so we have to be uh, sensible and, and, and uh, live within the rules uh, that are driven by uh, a particular microbe called COVID-19. Um, but we can take advantage of this terrible situation because children's interest in microbes has been peaked. They have been affected incredibly by this pandemic. And we need to harness that and also uh, to bring a bit of balance uh, to talk about beneficial uh, microbes. And also, perhaps it's better to do some learning outside. And we don't need to go on a coach over to a cheese factory to go on an excursion. You can think local. You can go to the school pond, compost tea. We can look at fungi, algae, lichens, iron oxidizing bacteria, and so on in local buildings. We can build our own Winogradsky column. So these are two Winogradsky columns that my daughter made during lockdown. Very simple to make, just a cut off bottle, fill them with a bit of mud. This came from an estuary uh, and the associated water. And actually we did a sub experiment here. This one was incubated in the dark and this one on the right was incubated in the light. And you can see that they're very different. Here it's green, phototrophic uh, organisms and purple, again, so-called anoxygenic phototrophs. Whereas this one is just pure black, which is a consequence of sulfate reducing bacteria. They produce sulfide, it reacts with the iron minerals and turns black. But you've got two very different ecosystems depending on the presence of light. And these evolve over time, so you can look at them, how they, the communities, uh, the success of those communities. And don't just restrict yourself to looking at them, take a whiff. So we open this bottle on the right, and it's okay. Slide seaweed on the left here, where there was nothing to mop up the sulfide that's being produced. Stunk, it's like the, the bowels of hell had opened and then you get this horrible sulfide rotten egg stench that, that permeates your whole body for about a day. So it's important to use all your senses when looking at things like this. There's also some fantastic tools out there uh, for, for teachers. Uh, so this is something called a mud watt and this allows you to look at electricity production by microorganisms and it's not too pricey. And here we have something called a fold scope. And this costs about one euro. And it's a microscope that you can make and use out in the field. It's an absolutely fantastic tool. Okay, so we can also take excursions home, uh, replace a trip to the shops with a trip to the kitchen. Kimchi, the chocolates and the cheeses. So we're using our vision. Uh, we can obviously use our sense of smell and, and, and taste and, and all the time exploring the microbiology involved in manufacturing these different uh, fermented foods. And we can look at texture. For example, the Stilton cheese, it's a bit squishy in the middle and it's hard on the outside. 
And the only sense we can't immediately use is sound. However, you can in a special way if you have access to this device or at least to the internet to look at this device. This is amazing. This is called a fermentophone developed by Josh Rosenstock. It's a, an art installation, hands-on art installation. And each of these bottles is um, vegetables or, or fruit that uh, is being fermented. See the manometers there. And he has cleverly turned the activities of the microbes, i.e. the production of gas and the bubbles produced into sound using little microphones that are placed uh, in these devices, in these bottles. And really, I recommend that you just Google this and listen to a bit of wonderful microbial jazz. Okay, you can also bring excursions into the classroom. We have citizen science, and, and in the editorial that I pointed you towards, um, there's lots of examples of, of uh, where classes can get involved in citizen science microbiological projects. Just one I'd like to mention is from University College London, and they've got a scheme where you can do your own experiments at home, taking bioplastics, you know, those envelopes you get, or packaging that's labelled as bioplastic, put it in some compost or some soil, and test whether it really is biodegradable. Uh, this is a little experiment that I've done. So here we have on the right is petroleum-based plastic, polypropylene, and here we have a bacterially produced bioplastic called polyhydroxyalkanoate. Put it in compost for two weeks, and you can see that the polypropylene is undegraded at the top here, you can just about see it, whereas the bioplastic in this case has degraded significantly in that time. And then there's all sorts of, of ways you can bring scientists in. For example, Skype a scientist or other means of communication are available. And I just show you here some of the wonderful places that my PhD students go to. And um, I'll, I'll just highlight this one in particular. This is down the deepest mine in uh, the UK. It's a salt mine. And I took a bunch of postgraduate students down there. Uh, and while we were there, there were people who were doing microbiology, but they were testing out um, this rover device uh, with a view to how it could be used, for example, on Mars. And while we were down there, Charles Cockle uh, set up a, a Facebook Live event uh, where we transmitted from this deep mine to schools all over the world. Great events uh, along with that, and, and different ways of sharing science with uh, pupils in the classroom. So I encourage uh, teachers to to do that and to use us. Okay, so um, in better times, there's all sorts of places we can go uh, from agriculture, the garden centre, through to museums and zoos. I just want to finish by highlighting. Uh, one particular example, all of these are, are, are expanded on massively in, in the editorial. So I just want to talk about the environmental industry of biotechnology sector, and in particular, wastewater treatment facilities or sewage treatment. Uh, undergraduate students, but, but I know that the they're very welcoming to school trips as well, uh, in normal times, that is. And this is Colchester Wastewater Recycling Plant. It's run by Anglia Water. And the big advantage of going here is that most towns have uh, one of these, and they are often very accommodating to visits. You definitely get a multi-sensory experience, and you know when the sewage treatment has worked. And children love poo and that kind of thing. You also have an abundance of microbiological topics. So, for example, you can talk about biofilms on, on chicken filters. You can talk about flocks. So here we have flocks of organic matter and bacteria building up around them and dragging them down, thus allowing the separation of the water and the organic matter organic matter from the system so water can be released after some further treatment uh, into waterways. And in so doing, you're removing pathogens. And then 
This sludge, this activated sludge driven by microbes can be pumped into this building here. Okay, and this, you can then you can start to bring in the issue of the circular economy, i.e. getting energy from waste. And here, the sludge and other waste is broken down by microbes into smaller units, sugars and, and, and uh, uh, fatty acids and so on. And then it's pumped into another unit where methanogens produce methane, which this time, unlike in the cows, is harnessed for our benefit and converted into electricity. And there's a whole host of other things that can be explored in a wastewater recycling facility. Okay, so an ultimate slide. Uh, uh, we made quite a few recommendations, uh, schools, government, commercial organizations, uh, and it's great to see learned societies like FEMS doing such a brilliant job uh, today. One thing I just want to try and highlight and really, really push is for broadcasters. We know that microbes have a massive effect on the planet and on human health. And we really need to accelerate the inclusion of microbes into wildlife documentaries, commensurate with how important they are for the planet. And I'd just like to thank you for listening, to remind you that all of this and more is available in this editorial. I'm very happy to take any questions. And uh, we're starting to get this translated. It's translated already into Spanish and other translations are ongoing. And all of it is currently available on the SPAN website listed. Thank you. Great, thank you, Terry, very much. Um, I think that note about broadcasters is super important because um, you're right in the sense that, you know, that microorganisms are beautiful, very easy, well, possible to video and don't make it into micro, uh, into um, uh, wildlife documentaries in the way that probably they should. Um, on that note, later today at uh, three o'clock UK time, we're doing a microscope hour on the live stream and we will be filming and looking down the microscope, which I actually have over here, and trying to look at as many microbes as we can find in some samples of Delft pond water. So hopefully we can pave the way for broadcasters to do this more. But thank you very much. Brilliant. Um, thank you. This will be also available online eventually, so people can come back and have a look if they missed it today or want to brush up on some of the details. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for joining me. We're about to have a 20 minute break now. So we'll both say goodbye um, and see you on the other side for a microbiology and bioeconomy session chaired by Isabel Sarkaria, the president of the Portuguese Society, which started today. And um, yeah, I hope everyone's enjoying International Microorganism Day and we have plenty more to come. So thank you very much, Terry. Um, Thank you. Are you on Twitter? Can people find you on Twitter or online if they want questions? I am on Twitter. Sorry, I should have put the handle at the end here, but it's at the beginning. It's on the first slide. Okay, cool. Yes. Excellent. Yeah, very happy to receive questions. Great. Well, yeah, thanks very much. And I will just briefly move us on to a holding slide while we get ready for our next session. Cool. Right, so we'll be back at 10.40 UK time, 11.40 CET, 3.10 Indian time, 5.40 Chinese time, 6.40 Japan time, 5.40 a.m. in the East Coast of America and 6.40 a.m. in Brazil. So we'll see you all then.
Hello, hello. Hello. Hello, Hassim. Nice. Hey. Hey, yeah. How's it going? How are you? How are Good. you today? Yeah, not tired. Bad. Are you I wasn't, tired? Or I was this morning, but I've kind of perked <laughs> up a bit. I've just drunk lots of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so I guess we've got um, two more speakers on the way. <clears throat> Three more, hopefully. <clears throat> Hello. Hey. Uh. Hey, it's, hi, Isabel. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Very well. Okay, good. So, how are you doing? Sorry? Today, today how are you doing? Good? Hello? So I can hear you fine. Isabel, can you hear? Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. Maybe there's a small delay. It's a, a very small delay, yes. Yeah. Not, not so small. Okay. Yeah, we cannot compare with yesterday. So he, today we have a delay, yes. Can I uh, share the screen now? Oh, you should be able to, if I stop sharing. So let's have a look. So do you think that your other speakers might just turn up for their time slots? Or did you ask them all to be here now? If, if uh, are you waiting? Are you waiting? Sorry, are you are you waiting for the for the speakers or are they well, arriving or not? Well, I'm just uh, wondering if they'll turn up. You know, maybe in time for their time slot, or are they going to be here from the very beginning? You know, I'm listening you uh, with the. Can you hear me okay? You don't have, uh, yes, uh, I'm worried. So we are missing three. Let me send them an email and we can just check where they are. We, anyway, we can start with nothing. Yeah. And afterwards, well, we will see. So I was thinking that may maybe they're just going to join in time, just in time for their talks. But we'll send them an email and ask them to start as soon as possible or join as soon as possible. Are you, are you writing them uh, a message? Yeah. Good. But we'll start on the time and then the scene can start and we'll still have 20 minutes to find the others. Shall, uh, shall I start now? Uh, two minutes. Okay. And then I'll make sure that we're all visible. Okay. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I will make a presentation first, okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I will uh, I will uh, present and ask you to
Estou ali, até não entrou. Ando lá, ando lá, podia ser 5 minutos antes, bora. Olá, viva. Viva, professora, peço desculpa, foi mesmo em cima da hora. Olá, Luís. Ah... Olá, Luís, eu estava a falar com o outro. <risos> Esse pelo telemóvel. <risos> ok. So, only missing... Uh... We are missing shinking, shinking. But we, we can start and go ahead. And if she's not here, we will continue. Professor. Sim. Are you hearing me? Well? Uh, not not uh, not very well. Okay. It's... No, no. Professor? Sim, está melhor. Melhor? Sim, mas mais um bocadinho. Ok. Uh, mais um bocadinho. Can we start, Ben? And now, Professor? I Sim, tá bom, tá bom. The, tá bom. Tá bom. Tá bom. Tá bom. Ben, can we start? Isabel, do you want to begin? Yes. Can we start? Yeah, you can begin. Okay. So, welcome to this session on uh, microorganisms. Sorry? Welcome to this session on microorganisms and bioeconomy uh, on this 24 hours marathon on microbiology. Bioeconomy has gained increased prominence since it is considered a response to key environmental challenges that the world facing, is facing today towards a sustainable future. For this reason, it was not possible to ignore this topic when we are commemorating the positive role of microorganisms. In fact, in this economy, there is the production of the renewable biological resources and the conversion of these resources and waste streams into valuable products, mainly by the action of microorganisms. In a world of finite 
biological resources and ecosystems, an innovation effort is needed to feed people and provide them with clean water and energy. So I would like to introduce you uh, the first speaker, Dr. Na uh, Nassim Gaur. He, he is group leader uh, on a big group on biorefineries at the International Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology in India. And uh, thank you very much for accepting uh, our invitation, Nassim. And uh, please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you, uh, Professor Isabel. Thank you very much for uh, giving me an opportunity to speak on International Microorganisms Day. And I am happy uh, to share uh, our, some of our recent uh, findings that we have made in the uh, last couple of years. Uh, so, so, so before I start, uh, let me uh, tell a little bit about the organization I am uh, working in. This is uh, International Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology. Uh, ICGAB has uh, 80 plus uh, signatory states and 60 member states and three components. It is an organization under United Nations Systems with the uh, headquarter located in Trieste, Italy. It has three components, one in Trieste, Italy, one in New Delhi and one South Africa, Cape Town. So my laboratory is located here in uh, New Delhi component. So what ICGEP does actually, uh, other than doing research in some uh, cutting research areas, ICGEP uh, also support and provide some short-term fellowships for PhD students and postdoc fellows, and also uh, funds for meetings, courses, and workshops, and new competitive grants for early career uh, who returns to their home country after doing their uh, postdoctoral fellowships to open their new laboratories. And also involved in uh, technology transfer for, for the technologies that related to biofuel, bioenergy, biorefinery, therapeutics or the diagnostic has been uh, developed in recent years. So coming back to my uh, topic of the uh, Discussion today, which is yeast based biorefineries using agricultural and forest residue. I will, during my presentation, I will try to answer a few questions like what are the biorefineries? Why do we need biorefineries? And what are the challenges that we are facing to developing successful biorefineries? And on a microorganisms day, it is important to note that what are the characteristics or desired microbes which are required for developing these uh, bio-based biorefineries. And uh, in the end, I will uh, show a very simple overview of a potential biorefinery for uh, from lignocellulosic biomass that can be uh, developed. So refineries, as the def, uh, name itself suggests, that it involves refining from raw crude, crude material to some final products. For example, in oil refineries where we uh, refine the crude oil to make petroleum products like gasoline, diesel, jet fuels or for heating oils. On a similar aspect, biorefineries can also be developed where you will use lignocellulosic biomass, which is uh, most abundant biomass considered to be available on the earth. And can we transform this into the product or fuel product or other desirable product that is required so that we can replace oil refineries with the bio refineries in the near future? So, so the question is why do we look to replace these existing oil refineries with the new bio refineries? Because uh, we know that. Uh, most of the chemicals and oil or energy that we are using today, they are coming from the fossil fuels. And use of fossil fuels means releasing large amount of carbon dioxide into the environment, which is causing the global warming. In addition to this, they cause water pollution as well as air contamination. 
so bio refineries uh, might have certain advantages over these bio refineries or this oil based bio refineries in terms of like the fuels or chemicals can be produced locally like right now we depend on the few few countries middle east or russia or some other countries which are rich in fossil fuels but if you develop a bio refineries because biomass is available in almost every country you can make your own fuels and chemicals so it will make autonomous and energy secure supply of the energy to the every country and then in terms of environmental there is a net carbon zero addition to the environment if you use the bio refinery instead of the fossil fuel bio fossil fuel refineries and also use of bio refineries as a positive implication for local air quality and greenhouse gas emissions but there are few challenges that we that are that needed to be addressed to develop these successful bio refineries like available of the feed stock or what kind of feed stock we should use and then conversion of these feed stocks to to fermentable sugars and if you have these fermentable sugars you need microorganisms which can ferment these uh, sugars released from the biomass to the desired product which is fuel or chemicals in this case and most of on the top of this the process that should be developed is would be economically viable otherwise nobody will prefer to use product develop the bio refinery if it is not a cost effective so based on the feed stocks bio refineries can be divided into three different categories if you use vegetable oil animal fat and waste cooking oil you can transestify that and convert into the bio diesel which is called a triacyl diesel based bio refineries and if you use a starchy and sugar material which is most of them is an edible part coming from either from sugar cane or the corn or from the or from the cereals then it is called a sugar and starchy bio refineries but the bio refineries that we are focusing and will be discussing today they, they involve the cellulosic biomass and they convert the, the glycosylic biomass is most abundant biomass or source of the sugars at level and can it be converted into the desirable product using the microorganisms also there are some food versus fuel issues which is involved if you use the cooking oil or the edible edible part for conversion of these to the sugar molecules because you need these these chemicals in large amount and that will lead to the short supply of the food and required for the human consumption so the focus real focus is developing bio refineries where you can use lignocellulosic biomass so when you see the lignocellulosic biomass structure it mainly made up of three parts cellulose hemicellulose and lignin Lignin, cellulose, hemicellulose, lignin. Cellulose is make up of to forty to sixty percent, and hemicellulose twenty to forty percent of the lignocellulosic biomass, and rest remaining part is the lignin. So, so when you the challenge is like first challenge is this is a very recalcitrant structure, and it is very difficult to convert this to the lignin to the free fermentable sugars. You require the processing of the biomass by using high temperature pressure or acid alkali treatment along with the enzymatic saccharifications and then you have this bio, this mixture of sugars which contains both c5 and c6 sugars and during this process because uh, high temperature and pressure is required lot of inhibitor sugar derived inhibitors are generated in this process and if you see The, the this mixture it has a c5 sugars like glucose xylose arabinose and galactose and the inhibitors which comes from these which are levonic acid furfural hydroxymethyl furfural acetic acids so, so if you want to develop a successful bio refinery you need to use all the sugars which are released from this biomass whether they are c5 sugars and whether they are c6 sugars and also these inhibitors also present in the hydrolysate of the biomass they inhibit the cell growth and in the end result the desired yield and productivity is or by the microorganism is reduced because they inhibit the growth and fermentation performance of the strains 
why is both sugars and C5 and C6 are required for fermentation? In a simple calculation, if you have a biomass which has 32% glucose, 19% xylose, and 2 to 3% adipinose, it means that one ton of the biomass contains 320 kilogram of glucose, 190 kilogram of xylose, and 20 to 30 kilogram of the aerobinose. 320 kilogram of glucose leads to 1 kg or 200 liter of ethanol and 190 kg of xylose will make around 120 liter of ethanol. So it is very much essential to have a microorganisms which can consume both C5 and C5, C6 sugars simultaneously. Otherwise, uh, the process developed may not be economically viable. So yeast from years has been known as industrial workforce for production of a lot of chemicals, whether they are fuel chemicals, pharmaceutical compounds, fine chemicals and food ingredients. Some of them are high volume and low value products, but some are high value and low volume products. And glucose is can convert easily into these products. But when you talk about these high volume, low value products, you need uh, to use all these, this, these sugars that we use that I just described in my previous slide. So based on these, uh, there are desirable number of desirable characteristic features in a microorganism, which is which are required for uh, to be used in, in, in a biorefinery, which can be like a right kind of microbes. If it is a yeast, what kind of yeast, whether it is Saccharomyces, Pichia, or Pleomyces, or some other yeast. And the yeast that uh, this use you want to use should be a robust, it should have tolerance to pretreatment inhibitors like furfural, hydroxymethyl furfural acetic acid, and the, the strain should be thermotolerant also because during fermentation, the temperature of the vessel goes high and the, to maintain the temperature, it costs a lot of money and also high temperature reduce the yield and productivities. It should completely ferment both C5 and C6 sugars. It should take all the sugars, C5 and C6, in a very efficient manner, we should have high metabolic flux. And this most desirable is that it should make a single fermentation product. Otherwise, the, 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 the flux will be diverted to different, pro, different products and it will have a mixture of product and the final yield and product will be reduced. The best if you can have an organism which can produce enzyme as well as do the fermentation, but uh, and then you most recently people are focusing on yeast, which uh, which can accumulate high amount of lipids and which are known as the single cell oil production or microbial cell factories. So to uh, begin with, we started looking for uh, organisms from the natural sources, which probably have all of these characteristics. And we collected samples from different places in India. In India, sometimes in summer, the temperature reaches up to 40 degrees centigrade. So we thought that would, it will be a good time to collect a thermotolerant yeast from the environmental samples. So we collected samples from different uh, places and directly cultured at 40 degrees centigrade and liquid and uh, solid growth medium and purified the selected yeast for a single colony do ITS sequencing and to identify the species did the NCBI blast. In addition to collecting samples from different places, we have collection centers like MTCC and NCIM. We also procured mo most of the available yeast isolates from these collection centers in India and, is and is screened all of them for thermotolerance and identified, identification, identified them. As you can see, some selected isolates uh, characteristics in this slide. Uh, you can see the glucose as well as xylose uh, assimilation and fermentation by these uh, selected isolates at both 30 and 40 degrees centigrade. So we use different uh, species of yeast, Cerviciae, Cihate, Lucyclastiaceae, Stipites, Anamolis. We, we had all different tropicalis and P. Kurdivergiae. In our screening, we found all these isolates and when we, when we evaluated their performance, we found that except Saccharomyces cerevisiae, 
none of these isolates was able to produce ethanol at a level which can saccharomyces cerevisiae or can be produced by using glucose as a carbon source. But at the same time, saccharomyces cerevisiae isolates didn't consume C5 sugars. While these other species isolates, lactis, stipides, and tropicalis, they were able to utilize the C5 sugars, but the final ethanol concentration was very, very low. But, and also when we compare the tolerance, these were, these were less tolerance. So one of the isolates that we selected from our screening is the Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which we name is S. cerevisiae and NGY10 isolates. It has some unique uh, characteristic features as compared to other isolates that we found in the screen. For example, uh, at 30 and 40 degrees centigrade, the growth rate is almost equal or reduced less than 10% at 40 degrees centigrade as compared to 30 degrees centigrade. And these isolates in presence of glucose showed very good fermentation performance. In fact, compared to angel yeast or ethanol red, these isolates showed better performance at 40 degrees centigrade. So, so this was a good isolate. And then it also showed the furfural, hydroxymethyl furfural and ethanol tolerant phenotypes. So, so, so these isolates in addition to this also showed the flocculation phenotype. As you can see that within 60 seconds, the, the cells start getting settling in while the other industrial yeast which are currently being used by these uh, sugar mills for making ethanol from molasses, for example, angel yeast or ethanol red, or sand pack, you see uh, still the media is very turbid, but not in, in our isolates. So it has unique characteristic features of flocculation, thermotolerance, inhibitor tolerance, and high yield and productivities at 40 degrees centigrade. In our screen, we also found some uh, oleaginous yeast, oleaginous yeast which can accumulate lipid content more than 50% of their dry cell weight. And they were they can consume both C5 and C6 sugars, or, and also were able to tolerate furfural, hydroxymethyl furfural, and uh, less. But if they were less tolerant to acetic acid uh, as compared to saccharomyces cerevisiae, and their lipid profile leads to that they have C6, C18, and C18, 0, C18, 1 lipid species, which are very good for the biodiesel production. So what we see in these natural isolates that isolates with C5 fermentation potential shows reduced ethanol yield, productivities and stress tolerance and acylvisa which can have a good yield and fermentation performance but it was not able to utilize the C5 sugars. In case of oleaginous yeast, although they were able to utilize all the sugars available in the biomass but they were not very resistance to the inhibitors and also their uh, ac lipid accumulation content needs to be improved. The another important point is that biodiesel is a fatty acid methyl ester or for fatty acid methyl ester and these yeast or algae they accumulate triacylglycerols. So you need an in vitro step of transesterification where you can convert these uh, lipids to the fatty acid methyl ester derivatives. So you need an in vitro, so, so, so be in vitro, which is not good for the environment because it's for environmental pollution and increase the cost. So, so can we improve the existing yeast that we isolated in our screen? There can be two approaches. One is an targeted approach where you can use the adaptive laboratory evolution. The, and <laughs> random mutagenesis where you can use the EMS or UV mutagenesis and the other could be the targeted approach where, which, where you can select the genes with, that you want to change which can increase or decrease the expression and, and also incorporate the foreign genes into the into yeast like metabolic engineering and genome editing using crispr cas and increased oxygen. So what we decided, we, we decided that the strain that we isolated it is best strain but cannot ferment the C5 sugars. This is Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So we try, we genetically modified this yeast using XR XDH pathway from Pigia stipides as well as using the XI pathway from uh, 
this fungus pyromyces fungal species in addition to this we alter the flux of the uh, pentose phosphate pathway and also uh, incorporating the xylose transporters because saccharomyces cerevisiae doesn't have c5 specific transporters so with all these uh, changes in different stages we develop a yeast strain which can consume uh, xylose as well as glucose uh, this is a table i am showing when you have a mixture of uh, xylose and glucose in one is to one ratio and you can say that uh, specific productivity is uh, really improved after these uh, metabol after these engineering of these genes in saccharomyces cerevisiae although some more improvement is needed the our goal is like if we can bring here the ethanol eat and productivities and xylose consumption rate comparable to what we have with the glucose the another as i discussed that uh, yeast cannot directly produce fatty acid ethyl ester so can uh, because uh, for fatty acid ethyl ester production you need fatty acid coa and ethanol and yeast has both fatty acyl coa as well as ethanol but there is an enzyme which is no, which is known as wax ester synthase enzyme which can convert this fatty acyl coa and ethanol to fatty acid ethyl ester so an yeast codon optimized version of ws2 gene be integrated in this saccharomyces cerevisiae isolates and we, we we can see that it is start making fatty acid ethyl ester but the amount of fatty acid ethyl ester was very low so we further made genetic changes in this strain to increase the flux towards fatty acyl coa pool by using heterologous aclea enzyme from the aspergillus nigricans and also replaced some promoters of the ald6 gene and acs1 gene in the genome through some strong inducible as well as constitutive promoters we deleted some genes which use fatty acyl coa as a substrate for example dga1 lro1 which convert fatty acyl coa to triacylglycerol are1 are2 which can use uh, fatty acyl coa to make estrile as as well as cox1 cox2 and the final strain that we developed and made the, all these uh, modifications in one strain in a systematic staggered manner we can produce up to more than 1 gram per liter of uh, fatty acid ethyl ester in this strain so finally the bio refinery that we are thinking of that can be developed by using lignocellulosic biomass it involves different steps like pre treatment then enzymatic segregation and fermentation to make different products in a bio refinery you can use uh, lignocellulosic biomass to make different product for example you can use cellulose which is a homopolymer of the glucose is saccharomyces cerevisiae or any other is can use it directly and can convert to ethanol triacylglycerol lactic acid and other chemicals or fuel molecules which you require in high volume hemicellulose can be converted okay, it is a mixture of xylose aminos glucose and metanol please pay attention to the time please yeah this is the last slide yeah. so uh, xylitol resins biofuel molecule xylosaccharide and also you can make some bioacetyl and and uh, nanolipocellulose composites and with this i would like to thank you to all who have contributed to this work and the support that i'm getting to do this work from department of biotechnology and department of science and technology and icg be especially for providing space and all the facilities here in new delhi thank you thank you very much yeah i yeah Thank you. Thank you Dr. Gaur for this insightful uh, presentation, but uh, we are going to continue immediately with the next speaker because uh, um, we are short of time and I will ask the, all the speakers to keep the time please. 
So uh, the next speaker is Professor Xinqing Zhao from uh, China, from Chang'an Yatong University. Please, Xinqing. Yes, uh, can I share my screen now? Uh, can, can you see my screen? Can you hear me now? Yes, we are hearing you. Ah, uh, yes. Just, um, okay. Please, uh, Dr. Um, Gaur, can you turn uh, yeah, and share? share. Your yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, then I will share my screen now. Um, okay. Okay, then. Uh, so, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. You can see my screen, right? So, uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, it's my great pleasure to attend this very special event. Uh, actually, this is my first time uh, to celebrate the International Microorganisms Day. Uh, my name is Xinjing Zhao from China, uh, from Shanghai Jiao Tong University. So I would like to share uh, a little bit similar story, but uh, I will say more on filamentous fungi. So, uh, before I, I start my talk, I'd like to introduce briefly uh, the research. Uh, I think it's very similar to the to the talk of the first speaker, Professor uh, Gao. Uh, uh, sorry, I cannot pronounce, uh, pronounce your name very, very well. Um, so we are trying to use a microbial uh, cell factory uh, to produce uh, different products. Uh, we are focusing on biofuels, uh, ex uh, especially uh, fuel isonol. So um, when uh, Professor uh, Isabel Korea uh, asked me uh, about the talk, I'm very happy to uh, share uh, the stories that uh, we have uh, done using uh, different microorganisms, including yeast, uh, filamentous fungi, micro uh, microalgae, bacteria, and uh, uh, stratomyces. So uh, I would like to divide my talk into these uh, two parts. Uh, first, uh, the story on cellulase production. So why we are uh, producing biofuels, uh, like we have heard uh, just now, uh, in China is uh, now a very serious problem uh, on the amount of uh, crude oil import in, uh, in China. It accounts for more than 70% of the total consumption like we can see here in this table. So it's a very serious uh, problem um, uh, for, for bioenergy, bio uh, for, for the energy uh, consumption. So we are, uh, the, the government is, is encouraging the researchers to study how to produce alternative uh, fuels. Uh, and uh, in addition to the um, crude oil import, uh, we are also very uh, much concerned on the environmental uh, pollution and also the global warming. Uh, so um, we have very abundant uh, resources uh, of lignocellulosic biomass um, and uh, we can produce uh, a lot of variable products uh, using uh, this biomass. Uh, I will not uh, introduce uh, a lot because we have heard previously uh, from the first talk. So uh, if we can use uh, the lignocellulosic biomass uh, we can uh, greatly reduce the greenhouse gas um, uh, emission. So it's very uh, important also for the environmental protection. So the concept of biorefinery, uh, we have heard just now. So we are focusing on the sugar platform. Uh, first, we need to um, get uh, fermentable sugars uh, from the lignocellulosic biomass. Uh, and then uh, we use different microbes uh, to ferment the sugars to produce different uh, fuels and, and the chemicals. Uh, so first I would like to introduce uh, the cellulose uh, story. Um, uh, here uh, we can see uh, we are using two different strategies for cellulose production. First, uh, I would like to know whether in the nature we can find our special strain to produce cellulase. So we have spent a lot of energy uh, collecting samples. Uh, uh, here showed a small town in Tibet. Uh, we collect samples from soil, plant, uh, and uh, different uh, fermentable foods. And um, we are lucky enough to isolate some um, 
uh, filamentous fungi here, I showed uh, some of the strains, uh, and this strain is the best, the LZ117 strain. We can see here, these are the two control uh, strains. And uh, our strain is here. It produce, uh, produces cellulase very early and uh, uh, with very high level. So we are very happy with uh, these results. And um, we also compared uh, the activities of other uh, cellulosic uh, enzymes, for example, beta -glu uh, glucosidase and uh, endoglucanase and zelinase. So uh, this uh, strain, uh, we are very lucky to, to get the best uh, 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 feature uh, for the production. Very high level, not only the filter paper activity, but also the zelinase activity. So um, it's uh, amazing for us. Um, and uh, we have uh, performed the genomic sequencing of this uh, uh, special strain. Uh, and uh, we also compared because uh, this uh, strain was isolated uh, from Tibet. Uh, so we'd like to know whether it can produce uh, enzymes that can uh, degrade cellulose at, at very low temperature. Uh, we tried uh, on agar place, uh, we can see here uh, at a lower temperature, uh, the strain uh, LZ117 uh, can grow better than the control strain. It has larger uh, clear zone, uh, which means it can uh, degrade cellulose better. So uh, we can also isolate it, uh, other strains uh, in the future, for example, from different uh, 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 woods and also the uh, different plant materials uh, and soils. Uh, so uh, we are still um, performing this work uh, now but on the other hand, uh, although the uh, enzyme uh, pr production uh, capability is very uh, good uh, for the stream we isolated, uh, still it's not very um, satisfactory. So we used uh, genetic engineering to further improve uh, the cellulose activity. So here I showed a trichoderma risi stream uh, that can produce uh, cellulose at very high titer than other filamentous fungal strains. And here uh, is the plate photo for Trichoderma risi, and this is the um, uh, microscopic uh, photos photo for for this uh, special uh, species. Uh, and uh, we have published uh, a lot of papers uh, using the uh, genetic engineering to improve cellulose production uh, uh, in Trichoderma risi. Uh, and I will introduce uh, mainly two stories. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, development of the artificial transcription factor library. So uh, we obtained this library from a collaborator from uh, Seoul, uh, Seoul National University. Uh, they performed the studies using E. coli and yeast, uh, and we modified the library and transformed into filamentous fungi, the trichoderma risi strain. And then we get the mutants, uh, we screen the mutants, and then we get higher um, producer. Uh, so here I would uh, like to say a little bit more on this uh, um, special transcription factor, the zinc finger protein. Uh, so it's like this, it's like a finger, and it can recognize a specific uh, uh, DNA uh, size uh, in the genome. So uh, it then can regulate uh, gene expression at a uh, transcription level. Um, using the library, we, we obtained a lot of mutants and after screening, we indeed get about uh, 10 um, better strains uh, than the parent strains. Here I showed uh, one mutants. Here I showed this is U3, uh, the beta mutants. This is the parent strain. We can see higher enzyme activity by ex expressing the artificial zinc finger protein. And we can also see that a uh, very higher level of beta glucosidase activity in this mutant. Uh, so uh, we also further studied uh, this mutant and we identified the native regulator uh, using the mutant. And this VIB1 mutant uh, also produce higher enzyme activity than the parent strain. And in addition to uh, the uh, 
strain uh, engineering, we also tried uh, to optimize uh, fermentation technology uh, for cellulase production. So we produce, uh, we prepared our own um, inducer, and in the fermenter, we optimize uh, the fermentation technology, and we get very high level um, productivity. Uh, so the second story is on the east. Uh, we have heard uh, uh, a lot from the first speaker. Uh, so the, the yeast uh, are very amazing microorganisms and uh, uh, have been used in different uh, uh, applications, for example, in food, uh, feed, and also uh, biofuels production. So uh, here I showed uh, some um, uh, photos on the uh, utilization of yeast uh, in food. Uh, here is for beer production. So yeast can also produce uh, wine and also uh, liquors. And here is um, uh, Chinese food uh, and also Asian people uh, also eat this uh, steamed bread. Uh, we, in Chinese, we call it mantou. Mantou means uh, steamed bread. And my daughter really likes it uh, very much. Uh, so she studied uh, in Germany with me for one year and she uh, missed uh, by that time a lot the Chinese uh, mantle steam bread. Uh, uh, we can also use uh, yeast uh, to produce biofuels uh, using cornstarch and also uh, cellulosic biomass. So like uh, we have heard uh, in the first talk, uh, there are a lot of inhibitors released by the pretreatment of the biomass and also other stressful conditions. So what we have done is um, we first um, discovered that uh, the nutrient in the fermentation uh, media is very important, especially the zinc iron. We found uh, if we add enough uh, zinc iron, uh, yeast can grow better under stressful conditions. So we uh, performed multi-omic analysis and identified some possible uh, genes that are related to stress tolerance. And then we use these uh, genes uh, to uh, improve the uh, viability of the yeast. Here, I would like to introduce um, uh, these two researchers uh, in our group. Uh, I am uh, grateful uh, to them very much. This is my first PhD student who is now a full professor now uh, in China. So he discovered that supplementation of zinc improve uh, stress tolerance. And then um, my uh, student, uh, Dr. Zhang, uh, uh, continued the study and uh, we found a lot of genes uh, that are responsible uh, to zinc uh, and uh, can uh, uh, be engineered uh, to improve uh, viability. And uh, um, we also uh, studied a lot uh, is cell flocculation, like I have shown here. We can modify the flocculation uh, phenotype and then we can get a better uh, flocculating strain uh, for fermentation. So to uh, 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 finish uh, my talk. Uh, I have gone a little bit uh, very, very fast uh, for my talk. So first, uh, I'd like to uh, summarize uh, that um, uh, there are two uh, types of important uh, fungal fungal strains, uh, which include uh, filamentous uh, fungi that we can use to produce uh, cellulase for degradation of uh, lignocellulosic biomass. So we can use um, the sugars uh, for the bio, bio production, not only biofuels, but also many other compounds that are valuable. Mm. And second, uh, I'd like to say that robust is, uh, strains that are uh, tolerant to various uh, stress are very important uh, and uh, uh, such uh, robust uh, yeast strains can improve uh, the production economy. And third, uh, I didn't introduce a lot, but we are working on synthetic biology and uh, metabolic engineering uh, to the fungal strains. Uh, and um, uh, we are going to get better uh, production uh, performance using the strains. And for the future, uh, future prospects, uh, I think integration of robust uh, strains with uh, smart fermentation technology uh, is needed to improve the production economy of biorefinery. Because now the big, uh, biggest challenge for bioeconomy is the high cost. So we have to uh, get a better strain, robust uh, strain, and also we will combine with the advanced fermentation technology. Uh, with that, we can uh, achieve sustainable development. Uh, 
And I would like to thank all the students and the collaborators, um, uh, Professor Feng Wubai and uh, Dr. Chen Guangliu, and all the students uh, that have contributed uh, to this work. And I also uh, thank all of you for your attention. Thank you. So this is my, my talk. Thank you very much. So shall I stop uh, sharing my screen now? Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, yeah. Prof okay, Professor so Zhao. Thank you, Xinqing, for <laughs> such nice presentation. Yes. Um, I would like to leave the, all the questions uh, for the end of the session. Yes. Uh, and the next speaker is a PhD student, Luis Martins, is a short presentation on his um, PhD research work. He is from Instituto Superior Técnico, uh, Institute for Bioengineering and Biosciences in, in Portugal. Okay, can I start? Are you seeing my... Are yes, you... yes, yes, we are. Okay. Yes, please. Okay. Um, first, I would like to thank Professor to invite me to this um, um, program and the, the international and this event. Uh, I'm Luis, uh, and I will talk about uh, the valorization of pectin-rich residues by by yeast. Uh, I'm a PhD student, and I'm the supervision under the supervision of Professor Isabel Sacquaya. So, uh, the, as you may know, the, there, is, there is a huge amount of uh, uh, potential biomass and residues uh, available to be converted um, by the microorganisms. Uh, in particular, uh, the, the, we are currently use uh, low amounts of these, total, uh, of these total biomass and residues, and then we can you, you have to achieve a new point uh, where we can use uh, uh, a great amount of agricultural uh, uh, residues, where the pectin-rich residues uh, are are involved. So, how we can the, how we can transform and convert these uh, these residues and biomass by using our microorganisms, SACA. Uh, and by helping, uh, helping by uh, by uh, Baca and uh, uh, Gilus, and the, this process can uh, is uh, is performed in the by refineries that convert the biomass and residues, uh, which in our add value products. Uh, so uh, once we are focused in the pectin rich residues, as you can see. Uh, there, there are three different uh, uh, main pectin-rich residues, including sugar beet pulp, uh, oil pulp pomus, and uh, citrus peel. But uh, to convert them in, into our desired products or head value products, uh, we need uh, a couple of uh, uh, steps, including the pretreatment and hydrolysis, as focused uh, focus by the last speakers, uh, but we are uh, we are focusing the the advanced is by refineries where you can use uh, the his in mainly in the Saccharomyces or non-conventional is to produce a very uh, a wide range of uh, products. So the pectin-rich residues, uh, mainly the sugar beet pulp, uh, is composed by uh, backbone uh, is composed by a backbone of galactronic acid, but in the side chains, you can you, you can uh, detect the a huge amount of arabinose and other and other sugars. So, depending the complex the the the, the variety of the sugars in the side chains, we can uh, we can address the 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 complexity of the pectin structure. Since the more uh, more simple one, homogalacturan, uh, until uh, the hemnogalacturan, uh, which is the sugar beet pulp, is considered as more uh, more complex. So uh, 
uh, like uh, uh, mainly focus on the non-conventional lease uh, and uh, with um, the, uh, the our efforts and in the lab uh, are focusing the conversion of the pectin rich uh, pectin rich hydrolysates uh, using these non-conventional is uh, however uh, the main the the, the sugars that are present in the in in that hydrolysates uh, are are um, are mainly diarabinols and galactose, but the 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 huge amount is the galactronic acids. So the important is uh, is the efficiently to the catabolization of all monomers, including the the galactronic acid, into our L-value product. Uh, however, the wild type strains of Saccharomyces cerevisiae only use the exos, glucose, and galactose. So we are looking for the the, the import, imp, important traits of non non conventional leads and the filament suspension that that are described to be, to be uh, as a consumers of uh, a wide range of uh, uh, sugars, including the d electronic acid. So this is the reason of non-conventional lease is gaining moment uh, because they are uh, we can use them to to synthesize the head value products uh, uh, through the conversion of the of these all carbon sources. So uh, our contribution is focused on the uh, sugar beet pulp hydrolysates. Uh, the the we receive uh, our sugar beet pulp hydrolysate from Aeronet uh, project partner. Uh, and then here in the IST, we are using the Rhodotorla species that belongs, for, uh, that belongs to the IST collection. Uh, and uh, we are now producing the uh, different current noise, uh, and which are um, a, a good uh, head value product that could be used for as an antioxidant or a protective, uh, protective and preventing roles in the human uh, health. Uh, so uh, we are also in the engineering is robustness because uh, if we are using the SACA, uh, if, if uh, she feel uh, very stressed under the the ending the process uh, mainly in the fermentation because we we have the accumulation of acetic acid and also the presence uh, normal presence in, during the hydrolysis of sugar beet pulp but also the the, the process demands a, a, a high temperature uh, or an osmos, uh, a p, a low pH so this we are studying the factors that uh, have impact in this performance, uh, uh, searching for the, the, the for the determinants of multi-stress multi -stress resistance, and by using the CRISPR uh, technology, we can change our SACA uh, with the different uh, um, um, genetic traits or particular genetic traits from ba our BACA or GILUS. Uh, and improve the the improve the uh, the production and the, the costs involved in the the head value products. So, as a final message, uh, we have to decrease the dependency of the fossil uh, fossil fuel based products and move to a uh, uh, more to a green deal with when where we can use the renewable. Uh, resources to produce the bio-based products and uh, try to valorize the, the waste from, from different types of biomass uh, and residues, in particular the pectin-rich residues. Uh, thank you all and uh, I would like Professor for the invitation to be, uh, to be this event. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. It was uh, very nice. Thank you for keeping the time. And uh, well, our last speaker is Dr. Luis Costa. Um, he is Chief Operations Officer in a Portuguese uh, company. 
uh, it, the name is uh, very well it's uh, more or less clear considering the presentation because it is uh, alg algae alga for future and um, it's in uh, the company works in the field of biorefineries and uh, well it's uh, a different look to the to the bioeconomy uh, field thank you Thank you, Luis Costa, for accepting the invitation. Please, and please, you can do your presentation. Afterwards, we will do, make a, a common discussion uh, at the end. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Isabel, and uh, uh, thank you very much for, for the invitation. Uh, it's a, a pleasure to, to be here today uh, in such an interesting session. Uh, so, um, uh, as uh, uh, Professor Isabel mentioned, I'm the Chief Operations Officer of uh, a Portuguese company called A4F Algae for Future. Um, so, I will tell you a little bit more uh, about it uh, um, in the next few minutes. Um, so, um, uh, I, I was asked to, to talk a little bit about um, uh, microalgae uh, and the, the contribution to the bioeconomy in the, in the scope of, of biorefineries. So uh, I will uh, give a little bit of, of detail on that as well. Um, so, uh, uh, so basically um, yeah, today I, I will talk a little bit about what are microalgae. So I, we've heard a lot about uh, yeasts and filamentous fungi uh, and something about bacteria. So I will talk a little bit about these other kinds of microorganisms. Um, then I will um, present a little bit about the activities of, of our company. Um, and also about um, biorefineries um, uh, and, and especially the, the biorefineries in the scope of, uh, of algae biomass. Um, uh, then finally, I will present some of the projects that we have been developing in the last few years and also the partnerships to develop this uh, activity of, of biorefining uh, for algae biomass. So first of all, um, uh, what are microalgae? So uh, the, in very uh, simple terms, so these uh, are microorganisms that are uh, photosynthetic, generate oxygen that, that we breathe, uh, and have chlorophyll. So it seems very simple, and this is a very simplistic description uh, of what algae do. Uh, so they, they take CO2 and other nutrients, and using sunlight, they, they convert it into their own biomass and generate oxygen in, in the process. So uh, this designation microalgae is a, a, a little bit um, uh, of, of, of a confusion, let's say. Uh, so this, uh, in this blue square here, uh, you can see um, an, an attempt to, uh, to map where uh, in all the taxonomic groups uh, we can find what we usually refer to uh, commonly as microalgae. And so just to, uh, to try to... Uh, place you in the right place. So uh, here are animals. So we are here as uh, human beings. Uh, and over here are uh, land plants. Uh, and you can see that there is a huge diversity of, uh, of other organisms around. And uh, well, microalgae, they fall into all the categories that have these uh, colored rectangles here. So you can see that these kinds of organisms uh, with these characteristics, they are actually not very homogenous. So they are uh, spread out in, in many different uh, ecological niches and have uh, many different kinds of, uh, of characteristics. So they are a very heterogeneous group. Uh, nevertheless, they do have some common characteristics. Uh, and so that's, that's why we, we, we try to work with, with this group uh, using the same kind of, of strat strategies and tools to, to utilize them for our benefit. Um, so, um, moving a little bit ahead, so uh, I've mentioned uh, in brief what are microalgae are doing and how we can exploit that for us. So uh, it's something, it's, uh, algae is a source of, of biomass that is grown by photosynthesis. Uh, however, uh, we do not need arable land to, to grow algae. We can use the marginal lands um, uh, and uh, uh, lands where, where even there, there is no availability of fresh water. It's, it's possible to produce on very large scale, uh, even just using salt water, for example. So, so this makes it uh, an attractive tool 
to occupy more land surface in, on Earth, but land surface uh, which cannot be uh, used by, um, by agricultural crops. So basically we can increase the, the potential of biomass production um, uh, on, uh, on, on land by utilizing microalgae where agricultural crops cannot be uh, produced. Now, uh, algae, um, they need uh, a lot of CO2, so they, they, they consume a lot of, of CO2 to produce biomass, uh, and they are a, a culture that can be harvested uh, every day, so not, not like agriculture where you can harvest once a year or twice a year, uh, so algae is a culture that you can, you can harvest uh, every day. So it, it, uh, it's more easy to, um, uh, to think of this as a, an industry uh, and not as agriculture in this, uh, in this sense, although there are a lot of uh, overlaps here. Uh, well, uh, uh, contrary to, to agriculture, uh, it's, it's quite difficult to produce microalgae without, uh, um, uh, well, a, a complex technology, let's say. Uh, uh, it, it ranges from more simple technology to, to more complex. And I guess agriculture, modern agriculture is also like this, is technologically uh, advanced. Um, but um, uh, but this is, this is a, a requirement to have an industrial size microalgae production plant. Uh, technology is absolutely essential. Now, there are um, some differences between uh, algae production and agriculture, which are based on um, the productivity or basically how much biomass, how much dry weight biomass you can get uh, for each hectare of land uh, per, per year. And uh, for algae, because they are such uh, simple microorganisms, so they, they are uh, unicellular or, or, or filamentous, but microscopic, um, they can co concentrate all their metabolic resources into dividing their cell uh, and not uh, specialize into different kinds of, uh, uh, of organs like higher plants do. So uh, what this means is that in the end, uh, they are able to produce more uh, biomass per, per land than, than higher plants. It's actually uh, about one order of magnitude higher. So it's possible to get only based on, on sunlight, uh, pro productivities of around 40 tons of dry weight per hectare per year. Uh, and this, this is, uh, uh, is not possible using um, uh, agricultural crops. Uh, this becomes even more evident, for example, when you look at the yield uh, in protein, and here you have the comparison between uh, industrial scale uh, production of microalgae and soy. Uh, and in terms of protein, you can see here that we are uh, exactly uh, more than one order of magnitude higher in yield of protein uh, per, per square meter per day. So this is a, a, a big potential here. So I, I was uh, saying to you that uh, algae have a, a huge diversity uh, and that's why they are classified in, into uh, very distinct and distant uh, taxonomic uh, groups. Uh, and here you can see a little bit uh, of why this is happening. So these are all microalgae that you are seeing here. They are part of, uh, of our track record at A4F in terms of pilot scale and industrial scale production. And you can see that the, the shape, the color, uh, the, the morphology uh, is, is very different between one strain and, and the other. Uh, so they all have similar characteristics, but they are also very significantly different. And this is uh, uh, why uh, they, they can be taxonomically so uh, far away from, from each other. But um, in general, in terms of the composition of, of microalgae biomass, this is the same as any other uh, living organism. So you have protein, you have carbohydrates, you have lipids and other compounds. Um, but the, let's say the, the most interesting compounds that are more specific or uh, more, more special to algae biomass uh, are, uh, well, some, some, uh, um, some lipids like, like pigments. Uh, such as carotenoids, which are a, a big product coming from, from algae, and also the polyunsaturated fatty acids, the, the PUFAs, uh, which are um, biosynthesized by, by algae and are introduced in the, in the food chain uh, by, by, this, um, uh, by, by microalgae. So this is, these are uh, basically the, the, the two classes of, of the most important products that historically 
have come from microalgae. But there is another one that's, that's particularly uh, important, which is protein in general, or uh, in this case, with a profile uh, of essential amino acids that's quite similar to, to food. Uh, and this is also a big advantage of microalgae biomass is that the high content in protein and so its potential for the, the food and feed um, uh, industries. So on, on this, uh, this right side of the screen, um, uh, I have here uh, some of these products which are, um, uh, well, let's say uh, famous in, the, in this field of microalgae. So they are compounds that are uh, used in these, in these applications. So you have here basically food and feed and nutritional supplements, uh, also food colorants and, and functional sugars also for the food industry. So th this is uh, traditionally um, the, the, the market for, for microalgae is the, the food and feed markets and the, the specialties markets. So uh, low volume and high value uh, type of, uh, of compounds. And in terms of applications, um, so just, just to complete this, so food, feed, uh, nutraceuticals, pharmaceuticals and cosmetics have been the traditional markets for, for algae. But more recently, uh, also uh, other kinds of markets have been uh, emerging. Um, so fuels, of course, is, uh, is uh, uh, still a long way to, to come uh, in terms of, uh, of commercial uh, viability. But for example, the use as fertilizers is nowadays uh, already a viable business case, as many biofertilizers uh, have been and biostimulants uh, are produced by my algae or using algae as, as source. There are also uh, applications in wastewater that have been uh, emerging, in wastewater treatment and industrial effluent treatment, and as well as uh, using the, the biomass as, uh, um, as a, a raw material for platform chemicals such as bioplastics and biofibers. So there is a, a, a very big um, development stage right now uh, in, this, uh, in this area. Now, a little bit about A4F, just uh, briefly, and, uh, and what we do. Um, uh, so we are a company that uh, basically specialized in uh, designing, building, and operating uh, microalgae production facilities. So if someone wants to become a microalgae biomass producer, they can contact us and we will uh, basically build the microalgae production facility uh, for them and uh, even operate it for them uh, or teach them how to, how to do it uh, successfully. So this is our, our core business. Uh, and here in this slide is just a, a short summary of uh, all our activities. Uh, that, that are uh, revolving around this core business of installing industrial scale microalgae production units. So uh, up top here, uh, we have a, a, a strong focus on R&D. So we develop a, a lot of, uh, of our own technology uh, and we use that uh, in, in collaboration with partners uh, in, in several uh, R&D projects. And some of them, or, or, or these in particular, are financed by public funds. Uh, then uh, over here, I've sh shown you this uh, already. This is our expertise uh, on microalgae cultivation. So we are not uh, specialists in one particular strain of algae. We uh, try to, to have the expertise to produce all kinds of, of microalgae. Uh, so we are quite different sources, our innovation laboratory and our experimental unit in, in Lisbon. And over here you can see that we work with different technologies to produce algae. So here we have uh, uh, five different types of, uh, of reactors. So these are um, the closed photobioreactors of two different configurations that we use on, on large scale. We also work on fermentation as well uh, because algae can also uh, be fermented by using sugars, just like uh, yeast or, or bacteria. So not using sunlight in, in this case. And over here, we have open, syst open systems. Uh, these are industrial systems uh, that are used uh, in outdoor conditions and with complete exposure to, to the environment. And I, I will show you a little bit more about this. Uh, and uh, down here, um, well, I'll, I'll just go for the next slide because you have here the, the pictures a little bit bigger. So these are the large industrial projects that we have been developing since, uh, since already 2009. 
Um, so uh, up, up to now, we have been implementing or have implemented four different uh, uh, industrial scale projects. Um, so uh, this one for a, a customer, uh, a cement company in Portugal, the Alga Farm project. Um, then we, we did a, a demonstration project for uh, an open scale, uh, for, for an open kind of photobioreactor on industrial scale. It's called the Biofact project. Uh, and after this project, uh, we, um, we started the implementation of uh, uh, well, what, what will be the largest uh, uh, production unit of microalgae in Europe, uh, which is called Algatec Eco Business Park. It's uh, in Povoa de Santa Iria in Portugal, and it's 14 hectares uh, in, in total area. So, so this is, this is uh, uh, quite large, and I will go a little bit more about this um, uh, later on. More recently, uh, we have started our first uh, uh, industrial project on, on seaweeds, on macroalgae. So they're not microorganisms, but they are algae. Uh, and we, we have started this, uh, the implementation of this unit uh, in Aveiro in, in Portugal uh, quite recently. Okay, so now uh, turning on uh, a little bit to, to, to the biorefineries. Uh, um, so uh, uh, I've talked a little bit about microalgae. And now uh, for the biorefining part. So uh, my my um, uh, fellows uh, on the panel have uh, already discussed uh, extensively about the biorefineries and uh, uh, how they are working. So uh, that saves me some time uh, uh, on that part. Uh, so the this uh, slide uh, starting uh, with the biorefineries is just basically to give an idea of what a conventional refinery uh, looks like. So before biorefineries. Uh, we, we, we had the crude oil refinery. Uh, and, and this is basically something that starts with one raw material, which is crude oil, which are uh, huge molecules and very, very heavy. Uh, and the first step uh, in a conventional refinery is to crack these huge molecules into smaller ones. Uh, and then uh, in the next step, we fractionate this. So, so we separate uh, all the molecules that, um, uh, that, we, that we have cracked and separate them from the smaller ones uh, on the top here to the heavier ones uh, on the bottom here. And, and these are originating a series of compounds which are intermediates that then go to another, um, uh, another uh, step of refining uh, each one of them, originating in the end a huge amount of final products uh, from uh, propane to, uh, to gasoline, diesel, uh, asphalt, uh, et cetera. So all these kinds of products come from the, the one raw material. And in the end, we have uh, uh, a lot of final products. So this is the, the definition of, uh, of uh, a refinery. So uh, obviously, biorefineries uh, 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 follow this uh, same kind of, uh, of logic. Uh, so just very, very briefly, uh, one example for uh, oleogenous uh, uh, seeds like uh, soy or sunflower or palm. Um, they work exactly like this. So all the vegetable biomass is, uh, is harvested. So this is the raw material. Then there is uh, uh, the, the, the biorefinery, which is a, a series of uh, steps uh, that are um, implemented in, in industry, where the different, uh, um, different parts of the plant are separated and then transformed and purified uh, all the way until uh, several bioproducts can be obtained from them. So um, for oleogenous uh, biomass, of course, the main markets are uh, feed, food, uh, but sometimes also uh, high added value products can be obtained from it. And even the biofuels, the conventional biofuels are obtained um, uh, in this way or biodiesel is obtained uh, in this way. Uh, so this is just another example uh, that I will, I will uh, skip um, of, of, this is a, a biorefinery uh, of, um, of corn. Uh, and so this is basically just to demonstrate the same. So from one raw material, which is corn, we can go all the way until uh, several products like uh, the dry distillers grains that go for animal feed and also uh, ethanol, uh, which is used as, uh, as um, a biofuel. Now, uh, turning on to algae, uh, and so uh, just like uh, other kinds of, of vegetable biomass, uh, the um, uh, algae we biomass can... We have five minutes to go because there is another session afterwards. Okay. I, I, 
I will go very fast then. Thank you. Uh, we okay, have a so, question from the Twitter. Okay, so so uh, algae biomass uh, can also be used after it is produced in in a, in a photobioreactor. Can also be refined as any other vegetable biomass into several <clears throat> kinds of compounds like biofuels, for example, or added value products that are seen uh, over here. So um, this is the, the idea of the use of, of biomass here. Um, so I will skip this one and, and just explain why, why are we, A4F, involved in biorefineries? Uh, well, it's because this pyramid here represents uh, the, the markets for algae biomass. And so far, the current applications are the ones that are most valuable and that are for uh, for low volumes, but we want to achieve uh, a, a more lower value uh, commodities uh, with with high volumes of production. But for that, it is necessary to reduce the production costs. And uh, one of the ways to do that is to increase the production area of um, uh, of, of the microalgae production facilities. But another one is to increase the, the, the market price of the products. And by biorefining, we can obtain both high value compounds and also the remaining fractions that can be used for these kinds of, of less noble applications, let's say, uh, but making this, uh, uh, this uh, a global interesting business case to, to, to go on. Uh, and for that, uh, just to, to mention that we, we have had several uh, R&D projects on this area of biorefinery to develop some interesting products like uh, uh, omega-3 lipids and carotenoid extracts. And more recently, uh, we are uh, involved in pilot and demo scale uh, facilities for biorefinery of algae. Uh, and so we will have a, um, a complete uh, uh, unit uh, ready to, to produce uh, in demo scale and uh, develop more and more products uh, and more processes to industrialize uh, microalgae biorefineries, which is uh, currently our target. At the same time, we are uh, currently implementing uh, at, uh, at Algatech Eco Business Park uh, one uh, commercial scale microalgae biorefining plant within the scope of a project called biofat.pt. I invite you to, to look for in, more information uh, about this uh, online, uh, both in our website and also on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can see the development of this, uh, of this project. So uh, this, this will uh, already be a commercial scale microalgae biorefinery that will be producing uh, products for the food and for the feed, for the agriculture uh, feed industries. We are also um, uh, part of a, a large collaboration um, uh, laboratory, which is called BioRef in Portugal, that is uh, uh, involving both companies and also universities and R&D institutions. Uh, so uh, this is also a significant step in the development of these kinds of, uh, uh, of technologies in, in Portugal, uh, but also outside. And these are just the priorities of the, the collaborative laboratory. And uh, uh, just uh, to, to wrap up, uh, so oh, uh, I we, hope I... We have to close the session. Okay, so, so I, I will just, uh, just close it by, by mentioning that uh, microalgae biorefineries are now being industrialized to have, um, uh, to increase the impact of the microalgae production industry and also to originate new uh, business models which are interesting and to complement uh, from more sustainable biomass it, uh, towards having platform chemicals and uh, uh, large volumes of commodities that are coming from, from a renewable source, which is uh, the most important point. So thank you all for your attention. And uh, now we move to the panel. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Luis, for uh, your views on the topic. Uh, well, the discussion, the very important discussion, well, we, we will not be able to, to go on with the discussion because there is uh, a new session uh, coming, uh, organized by the Croatian uh, Society uh, of Microbiology. But uh, we have from the Twitter uh, a question, important one, to Dr. Nassim Gaur. Uh, and it was uh, that you mentioned that the advantage of East Viral refineries that use agricultural residues is that they can be 
implemented locally. Will that be possible in the near future and at a global scale? It's an important question. Uh, it would be very nice to, to listen your answer. Uh, but uh, I, I'm asking the FEMS office if it, it will be possible. Yeah. So shall I say something? Actually, we are hopeful that uh, locally, definitely, these biorefineries in coming future can be uh, developed on a small town level or village level instead of uh, having very much far apart from each other because the biomass you can collect from a radius of around 5 to 10 kilometer, 20 kilometer or around let's say 50 kilometer. In a radius you can collect a biomass and establish a biorefinery in that particular area. Did I uh, answer the question? Okay. Uh, I think we have to close, isn't it, Ben? Yes, yes, thank, thank you. I don't... Yes, I think we have to go to the next uh, session now. Um, because we have this session and another one uh, to go before the next break. Yes. So, and this session will be you. online soon. You can watch again or for the first time soon. Oh, exactly. Yes. Um, yeah, and it's very interesting to, to hear everything. So thank you all very, very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, thank you to the speakers. It was a great, a great session in a great event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Right. See you in the next session. Bye, everyone. We exit from this screen now. Okay. Right. So I have two new speakers in the waiting room, just about to come in and join us. Diana and Anna. Great. Can you hear us? We just have to ask you to unmute and then we can hear you. Okay. Can you hear no. me? Here it Perfect. is. Hi. Great. Yeah, so we are very excited to have you on International Microorganism Day. Uh, Anna Balin and Janusz Gorik join us representing the Croatian Microbiological Society. And um, they are both here to tell us about their Microbiology Society service learning project in the Society of Microbes. So enough from me. Let's get on with your talk. Um, we'll just make sure you can share the screen. Yeah, um, I'm sharing the screen. Okay, cool. Cool. Perfect. So yeah, we can see your screen and um, I'll let you begin. Okay. Um, so um, I just wanted to tell you a story, a short story from the perspective uh, of a project coordinator. Um, and um, um, I will tell you about how we got the idea, um, um, how we developed it and about the project itself. Uh, and Anna later on will tell you her perspective as a mentor and a participant of the project. So how did we embark uh, uh, on, on this adventurous journey? I believe that every society within FEMS uh, has um, public outreach and educational activities uh, in its uh, uh, mission and vision. And so does the Croatian Microbiological Society. However, these activities should be strengthened, uh, at least in our, in our case. 
Um, so what did we do? Um, many of us had visited Micropia, the first museum of microbes in Amsterdam um, before that. And uh, we were really inspired uh, on how they uh, show the versatility and the importance of microbes in, in our lives. Um, and um, well, we wanted actually to do a, a virtual museum uh, uh, of microbes because we knew we had no resources to, to have a real one like Micropia. But what really triggered um, the development of the idea was uh, when uh, Anna saw this call of, of the European Social Fund for project uh, supporting um, uh, NGOs and the Croatian Microbiological Society is an NGO actually, and uh, academic institution institutions uh, to uh, implement service learning um, into the curricula of the uh, their academic institutions. Uh, of course, nobody knew at that time what service learning was, and Dana will uh, explain you a, a little bit more about it uh, later on. And uh, um, we wanted uh, to do a microbiology public outreach and do this virtual museum of microbes, but actually the set of aims, the general and specific aims, was uh, uh, given by this call and uh, we had to um, uh, develop such a project to fulfill these goals. Uh, and uh, th the main thing was to implement service learning pro uh, programs into the academic curricula to strengthen the NGO capacities and to strengthen uh, the collaboration between academic institutions and uh, uh, NGOs. Uh, so um, it took us uh, three or four months to develop this project, uh, Anna and me uh, mostly, and uh, we submitted it in uh, 2017. Uh, uh, after about a year, it was uh, approved and uh, we started the activities in March 2018. And after 22 months, we finished this project uh, uh, this uh, January. Uh, and um, the budget for such a complex set of activities was not so great as, as you can see here. So uh, when I pitched the idea at the General Assembly of the Croatian Microbiological Society, everybody wanted to participate, but we had to uh, keep the consortium uh, uh, at some reasonable number of partners, but we still ended up with partners from two different towns, three different universities, five different faculties uh, or schools, uh, and plus uh, academic institutions, we had two additional uh, NGOs. Of course, the Croatian Microbiological Society was the lead partner, but uh, we were joined by Bioteca, uh, a, um, a non-government organization promoting biology and similar uh, sciences, and BIUS, which is uh, the Association of Biology Students. Uh, the idea was to have users that will directly benefit from the project, and these are pre-graduate students, university teachers acting as mentors in this project, and volunteers uh, of all three NGOs. Um, we can say that indirect users is everybody with some um, knowledge, basic knowledge of science and microbiology, like school children, probably from the age 12 onwards. Uh, but actually, uh, the outputs of the projects are public, so anybody can uh, benefit uh, from it. So how did we do it? We had to uh, come up with uh, different sets of activities uh, to fulfill the project goals. And uh, first group of activities uh, uh, actually related or uh, was uh, aimed at schooling mentors, schooling university teachers in service learning, in promoting science, because not all of us actually had previous education on that. Uh, the second set of activities included recru recruiting students from our uh, uh, courses. Uh, implementing learning uh, 
service learning in microbiology at our uh, university curricula uh, doing the syllabus. And uh, when um, uh, the students actually joined in, uh, the, the third set of activities included um, uh, preparing them to uh, do the material for the um, uh, Virtual Museum of Microbes, to do the public outreach through public lectures for citizens, uh, to do the outreach through workshops uh, with school children. Um, and uh, it also included a lot of uh, publicizing activities, logistics, uh, uh, and presentations at the scientific conferences too. So uh, you, you see how a um, complex set of activities we set out to, to do. Um, but the embodiment of the initial idea uh, that prompted the, the application of uh, this uh, project um, is the Virtual Museum of Microbes. Uh, we at the end called it Microseum, and you see the website here, you can visit it, it's free, it's available in Croatian and in English, and it's an interactive modular website, and because we had nine mentors uh, in this project, uh, for, for starters, we have nine different topics um, and um, uh, we imagined it as a, a house with nine different rooms or spaces um, and um, uh, in each space you can find this uh, different uh, topic. So you, you are free to uh, visit the website, uh, to visit our microseum um, and to, to explore each of the rooms, each of the microbiological topics. So um, uh, just to conclude, um, uh, we had uh, really many people involved uh, in, in this project from um, uh, three different universities, two different towns, uh, three different uh, non-government organizations. Uh, uh, we had uh, 38 students involved and initially we had planned 18, many students were interested. So uh, what have I learned um, as um, a teacher at the university, but also as a person and, uh, and a member of the Croatian Mi Microbiological Society? I have learned a, a little bit more of microbiology, but uh, uh, I have developed um, a whole different set of skills because I needed to coordinate uh, uh, 62 different people from different places. Um, I had to uh, coordinate uh, working with illustrators, with uh, web designers, with different uh, professions uh, uh, within this project. And uh, it was similar for the students. And um, you can read here a version of a student's concluding remarks. Um, um, and if I may comment on it, I would say that it was similar for students uh, as well. So um, um, just to conclude, um, we managed to do the promotion of microbiology, service learning, and develop uh, the capacities of the Croatian Microbiological Society in, in one project. And I'm very thankful that I had a chance uh, to participate in it. And now Anna can take over and tell her side of the story. She was the mentor uh, in this project. Mm -hmm. One moment, just to share my screen. So yes, I'm Anna and I will tell you a few, uh, a few words from a mentor's perspective. Uh, so to begin with, I just have to shortly um, introduce myself. Apart from being a member of Croatian Microbiological Society, I'm also a teacher working at the Faculty of Food Technology and Biotechnology as an assistant professor. Uh, I'm a microbiologist with a background in uh, biology and ecology. So what was my motivation to get involved in this project? Well, my main motivation was that uh, often during my day-to-day -day work, I see that students are unmotivated or not motivated enough. And of course, this makes my uh, job harder and I would like to work with the motivated group of students. Uh, not to bl blame the students, I think uh, often it is not really their fault, but uh, they just don't 
don't see sometimes the point. Um, what is the point of learning the things we are trying to learn them? And they don't see the connection with their later professional life. And this is connected with an academia, which uh, often uh, lives like a self-sufficient self maybe bubble, like uh, learning things, but there is no connection with the community, no transfer of knowledge from the professors uh, to the real problems in the, in the real life. Although on the paper, the mission of every university should include social engagement. And then of course, how can we expect the students to be motivated uh, to be engaged if, if the professors are often not engaged enough? So when the project uh, uh, was uh, discussed within the, our society, I was of course eager to get involved because I thought that service learning might be an answer to these issues. So I will first uh, briefly uh, introduce you to service learning. This is, uh, these are things that I didn't know before the beginning of the project. So I expect that a lot of people still don't know what is this. So this is an educational approach that combines community service with a learning process at the faculties. So it is not a simple volunteering, like if students would um, clean the beach doing something beneficial for the community, but not learning anything uh, new. It is also not practical work. So like doing some laboratory um, experiments, but without giving anything back to the community. But serving service learning is really like a combination of learning and the community service. Meaning for instance, that uh, students can take some samples of water, can analyze them in the laboratory, can think critically about the results they get, then they can think about the possible solutions to some um, community problem, and then they can get, go back to the community and provide uh, expert knowledge and, um, and maybe possible solutions to some problems. So society should benefit from the learning, but also uh, the, the society puts the learning in a different context, meaning, uh, it gives uh, a new meaning and uh, enriches the learning process. Of course, before even uh, becoming a mentor of a service learning project, me and my uh, eight other colleagues from Croatian universities had to learn what we have to do. So we, we enrolled uh, several um, workshops, learning about uh, service, service learning, what is it, uh, how to make a good service learning or mentoring program, and maybe most importantly, how to, how to think uh, outside of our academic boxes, meaning how to present uh, complex subjects uh, in uh, simple words, in few words, and maybe in, uh, in a graphical way for everybody to understand. And most of these things were quite new to us. Um, in the next stage, uh, we enrolled uh, the students. Uh, they were very eager to participate, indicating that students are really not so not motivated or unmotivated, but maybe they are not offered enough um, uh, to get their attention at the standard curriculum. Uh, my group was five beautiful girls that you can see here in the picture. Uh, Edina, uh, Ivana, Ivana you will hear in a couple of minutes, she will give her perspective of the project. Uh, Anica, Anna and Tomislava. And our task was to have a microbiological topic. Our topic was antimicrobial resistance and uh, to present it in three different ways. So to present it on an educational web page that Diana, Diana already mentioned as a lecture for general public and as a workshop for elementary school children. And the first task was the hardest, uh, uh, to present the topic uh, at Microsium. So uh, this took many months. Um, uh, it was hard work uh, with lots of rounds of corrections, of sharpening our, our ideas, of uh, discussing st with students and uh, uh, about our ideas. And we had several problems. Uh, 
so for instance how to present the complex subject that we know a lot of a lot about but with simple words and with the word limit or with graphical schemes uh, we had to take care that to be original and interesting uh, all the time because uh, we know that uh, attention span, span of an average web surfer is very short. And still having in mind that the presentation should be scientifically accurate. For instance, we had the problem already with the title. We were forbidden to use like complex and hard words, like resistance is a hard word. So we, so we had to go around, the, uh, around it and make a simple title. Also, we had issues with, within like a group style of working, like how to be critical, but still constructive. Students were often shy to maybe share their uh, opinions and I had to push them to tell them what they think and to, this is the best way to uh, evolve ideas. We had to communicate with the rest of the large project team that Diana uh, mentioned, like people from other fields of expertise, like web designers, like illustrators. Uh, as this was new to myself, new to the students at also. But through the process, we were evolving our idea. And I will just briefly uh, show you how we presented the topic in, in a very, very general way. So we, we uh, thought that uh, this will be presented like a boxing match, like a comic book presenting a boxing match between uh, antibiotic and uh, pathogenic bacteria. And so this boxing match uh, has three rounds, each round depicting one uh, uh, moment in time, like uh, golden era of antibiotic discovery when antibiotics were still very strong, then rise of the superbugs or antibiotic resistance where antibiotics were getting weaker and the students were eager to have also this last round where we tried to show how scientists are trying to the, the solve this problem and are working day to day in the laboratories to have new solutions for the antimicrobial resistance problem. I invite you of course to see this all in detail and not only this uh, topic but all other eight interesting topics that are presented at Microsium. While working on this, um, um, this part of the project, which, which was very hard, and I'm sure that other mentors would also uh, tell you that this was the hardest part, and students also, uh, we got to know each other very uh, good. Uh, and uh, at some point, uh, service learning started to really like pay off, meaning that uh, students uh, got into the subject and they became, be, were becoming more and more independent, like more and more active participants. And I was turning from like a critical mentor, uh, pushing them all the time to like a passive bystander, more or less passive bystander, like a proud, proud and passive bystander. Parent. <laughs> oh, what? Parent. <laughs> and becoming a parent, yes. <laughs> Yes, like a parental perspective. Just giving a few suggestions here and there, but girls really then from this point did most of everything alone. Uh, they had very successful uh, public um, lecture in a, in a library. They were very competent to answer the questions. And you can imagine how this is now very different from your standard classroom. Uh, I mean, giving a lecture and uh, being really an active participant in the learning process. And the last, um, hmm? sorry, I think, uh -huh, okay. The last part was to uh, create a workshop for children. Again, students work, uh, worked by themselves. I had a very uh, successful like uh, workshop for like young children, even younger than Diana mentioned, like nine or 10 years old. Uh, in the part of the workshop, they had like uh, designed uh, a board game on antimicrobial resistance with a very elaborate set of rules and children were very satisfied, satisfied. They gave very positive feedback. 
and uh, it was not so easy as you know if you if you had any workshops for children before it is easy to make a good plan but it is hard to stick with the with the plan because children are like having their own ideas uh, where the workshop <laughs> should go next <laughs> and now to conclude our experience we after we ended the project we are still with service learning because we really like the process and we are trying to implement it in our everyday teaching like we implement it in existing courses some of the mentors and some of the mentors are uh, already made new courses that are solely based on this teaching approach in microbiology and in biology in general and just to conclude as a mentor, uh, my motivation is high when a student motivation is high and when I see such a proud and happy faces of my students. And service learning really showed me that involvement is the best way of learning. And that's all from me. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you both. Um, we're going to get straight on now with our next speaker because... Yes. We're a little over time and we need to finish this session within the hour but seeing as it's all part of the same project i hope you can you can share uh, the time nicely we have ivana okay wonderful let's just make sure your microphone is on cool hello hi we can hear you fantastic so do you have a, a presentation to share yes yeah right. awesome well we'll just let you get on with it then and okay. um yeah try and stick to time and leave roughly 20 minutes for your next speaker, but we'll get okay. on with the talk now. Can you see my presentation? Is everything all right? All perfect. All perfect, great. So hello everyone, I'm Ivana. Currently I'm studying biotechnology at a faculty of food technology and biotechnology. It's a great honor to be with you today. And I would like to shortly tell you my personal impressions of a service learning project you've just heard about from my mentors. Uh, I had the honor to be part of this great project from its very beginning to its very end. And that's why I think I'm a right person to tell you something, how I uh, find it, or how, what I learned, what I think we did right, what I think we did wrong. Um, I'm not here to criticize Croatian educational system. Actually, I think it's pretty good. I like the thing I study. I think I acquire a pretty good amount of knowledge. Uh, we have some opportunities to, to work in laboratories. But actually, the big problem is appliance of that knowledge. So this project, the service learning project, was great for me because I had an opportunity to apply my knowledge and to educate even uh, younger children and the uh, great uh, masses, public, uh, public, general public. I really had an opportunity to do something with my knowledge, not only to learn something and to forget it after my exam. Uh, this, this kind of project, it's not really often in Croatia. This is something um, pretty rare, pretty new, and that's why it's extremely valuable for, valuable for me, and that's why I'm extremely happy I was a part of it. Um, this, the whole thing started for, for me, for, for our students, in February of last year. We had initial meeting where our mentors, our professors, uh, explained to us what service learning is, uh, what is the main idea behind it, what they wanted to do with us, and in that moment, I had many different perceptions, many different ideas, not only me, the rest of the students. And uh, during the whole process, we had to, to change some of our ideas. We had to, we did many mistakes, definitely. We fight a lot about it. Compromise wasn't always an easy thing to do. We invested a lot of time, a lot of hard work, and I think we actually did something. I think the success is here. Uh, we actually did a successful workshop for children. We did successful, presentation for general public, but I think our biggest, biggest success definitely is our formation of a microzeum. You heard about it. It's a virtual museum of microbes. Uh, this is something we never did before. Uh, the problem in, in Croatia is also the lack of materials on Croatian language about microbiology, about uh, microbes, and I think that's a great success that we did it. Um, we use many skills. We acquired some skills from the project. We had some of them before the project. Uh, I think the most important thing for myself was the teamwork. I'm actually not a great person in a teamwork, but here I had to make compromise with five different people, which five different, with five different mindsets, five different kind of ideas. 
Uh, compromise, as I said, wasn't always easy thing to do. Uh, even though the five other people which I worked in, in the team were actually great, great people, uh, sometimes it, it's complicated to, to uh, make up an idea which is acceptable for, for more of the parts of the team. Um, I also uh, acquired some uh, teaching skills. That is something I never did before. Uh, same as with other, other students in my team. Uh, we actually never got in contact with a group of children which are not our relatives or something. So teaching skills are definitely something new. Also working with children themselves. Uh, we, we were really, really looking forward to workshop with children. And uh, in, in, the, in the end, some of the children weren't really uh, easygoing. Some of them were really active. Some of them were stubborn. And definitely that kind of patience definitely was an important thing we acquired from the project. Uh, we also did some lab work. It wasn't the same kind of lab work we do in university usually. Uh, usually when you're in a university, you do an experiment and you know what you have to, uh, what will be your final results. In this project, for the first time, we did independent lab work. And I think that is really, really important because that will add up to my work experience. I'm pretty afraid that in a few years I will be out there looking for a job and I really do not have any experience in microbiology apart from university experience. And therefore, I believe this, this project is a great, great thing for, for my future career, for my CV. Um, also, important thing was connecting with colleagues in other professions. Uh, I'm from uh, Faculty of Food Technology and Biotechnology, but I met a bunch of great people from med school, from vet school, and we discussed topics about microbiology. Important thing is, for example, I, I perceive uh, microbes as a way of uh, receiving product with, which I could sell. I'm biotechnology, so I will produce alcohol one day. And, and people from med school, for example, their main perception of microbes is uh, pathogens which could cause disease. So that was really, really interesting thing to do. We really talked about it a lot. It was fun. It was really, really interesting. Um, I, I acquired many uh, important life lessons from this project, many things I would apply later in my career, in my life, and I would like to briefly explain a five of things I would uh, emphasize as the most important from this project. The first thing, and the most important, which really stayed in my head for a long time, is that sometimes in science, in microbiology, in life, experiments just fail. Um, we had a great idea. We wanted to make a photo of a zone of inhibition for uh, our virtual museum of microbes. We wanted to do a simple experiment, just apply uh, mold and bacteria on a petri dish. And after a time of incubation, we wanted to see a zone of inhibition uh, because molds, as we know, produce antibiotics to protect themselves from bacteria. But we did something wrong because our molds just outgrew the bacteria. Our petri dish looked terrible, definitely not representative for a microzeum. And actually, we didn't see no zone of inhibition. And our first reaction was a really big disappointment because we invested a whole day in that project. We spent a whole day in lab. Uh, this picture here you can see, uh, this is before the very experiment. We were pretty enthusiastic, pretty happy. And the final result was really, really bad. But uh, that's okay. That's just sometimes happened in science, in life. Experiments just don't work out. And the lucky thing is that a lot of those pictures with zones of inhibition could be found on Shutterstock, so we just compensate the lack of skill in, in labs. Uh, I believe this was also really, really a uh, teaching good moment because uh, we evaluate what we did, we try to discuss about things we did wrong, and I think we would apply that knowledge later in life and we won't do the same mistake again. Uh, second important lesson from this project was that a good love is the solution for everything. Uh, my mentor, Professor Bielen, said in the last presentation that in the very beginning of a project, we try to find a compromise, and therefore we, I would say, fight a lot. Um, we weren't just get along from the beginning. We had many different ideas. We tried to, to make a compromise. It wasn't always easy. And um, I think it was a month after the beginning of a project, we had one pretty, pretty great fight. And on the very same day, we tried to film an intro video for our topic for Microzeum. And as you can see on the photo, it was a pretty, pretty funny thing. We laughed a lot. Um, we still have some intern jokes about that moment. 
And I think that was a moment when everything just got right, when we understood each other. And that is definitely a good lesson that with a little bit of laugh, with a little bit of jokes, you can really do everything. And we did something with it. Um, the third lesson I learned is that the best way of learning is uh, to be like a child. The children are extremely curious. Uh, I was really fascinated how children who find microbes as something uh, abstract because they can't see them uh, are so, so interested about them. Um, in the beginning of our workshop, we draw um, a one bacteria cell on, on a whiteboard and we talked about parts of bacterial cells and children who never heard for it uh, really remember the phrases, they remember the expressions, they ask questions, they wanted to see everything, to touch everything. And that was extremely fascinating. I believe if uh, we would be more curious in life, we would definitely have much less problems with learning. Uh, some children definitely weren't that easygoing. As I said, in the beginning, they were a little bit stubborn, but it was also a good moment for us because we tried to be patient. We learned how to be patient with children. And that's also a thing we would definitely apply later in life. Uh, here in the, in the picture, you can also see um, one board game we created uh, in order to teach children a part of microbial cells. And um, that, that's also one proof how uh, learning through game, through playing is definitely the best way of learning. Uh, my next lesson is that courage is definitely necessary during education general public. I don't want you to understand this wrong. We were not afraid of publicly speaking. We were not afraid of people. We were afraid, we were afraid of great responsibility. Um, we talked about um, antibiotics and a big part of our presentation was uh, rules and advices how to properly take those kind of medicines. And that's definitely definitely a really dangerous field. We didn't want to say something which would make people take medicine on the wrong way. We didn't want to say something which was potentially dangerous for someone's health. And we definitely understood that kind of responsibility. And uh, definitely it isn't something we, we joked with. We really tried to be uh, as serious as possible and I believe we succeeded. Uh, this uh, girl in yellow shirt, you can see in upper a right picture. She came to us after the presentation. She told us she wanted to be a biotechnologist when she grew up. And that was a beautiful moment because I believe if we did something like that to only one little girl, then definitely whole project was a great success. We did something and I'm extremely happy with it. Um, my last, uh, last lesson I acquired from this project is uh, importance of a constructive evaluation. Uh, the project lasted a few months. It was pretty tiring. We invested a lot of time, a lot of effort, especially in the very end of a project. Um, in the same month, there was a workshop for children and presentation for general public. So it was really, really tiring. And after it, we believed we are done. Everything's okay. We were so proud. And then we received a bunch of papers uh, which should be filled in in order to evaluate the project. A bunch of paper with uh, questions about it. And honestly, I was pretty angry. I didn't want to do that. It was boring. Um, I was so tired of a project. But right now, a few months after, I can see that evaluation is probably the most important part because only if you acquire data from, from something, you can make conclusions and you can do a better thing next time. You can, you could, uh, you can, uh, could uh, improve yourself. And um, as a con conclusion from this project is that it was pretty good, I would also conclude for myself that if, if uh, there is another um, opportunity like this in the future, I would definitely do the same thing again. I would definitely want to do a project like this again because I think it's an amazing experience. It's really good for my career. It's a good for myself. And uh, I'm definitely so happy and so thrilled I was able to be part of this. Thank you. Amazing. What a wonderful project. Very inspiring. And you've managed to make us back two minutes ahead of time. Yeah. So briefly and succinctly delivered. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So we'll move on to our third talk, fourth speaker from the Croatian Microbiological Society, um, who is a slightly different angle, um, but has a talk for us on molds on food, benefit and danger. Let's just make sure we have the connection. Manuela, can you hear us? 
Let's unmute you. There we go. Hello. Cool. We can hear you. Perfect. Yeah, good. Great. Excellent. Are you in the lab or, or is this? Yes. Your... Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, and do you have uh, any slides to show? Uh, yes, cool. I have. I can hear you. Cool. Great. Yeah. If you have the stream up, are you able to um, turn off the sound if the stream is playing somewhere else at your end? Because I think we're getting some feedback. Oh, no, now it seems to be OK. Are you able to um, turn off the sound if the stream is playing somewhere else at your end? Because I think we're getting some feedback. Now it seems to be OK. Yeah, we can see your screen. All ready? Right, I'll get out of the way and let you begin. We can see your screen. All ready? Right, I'll get out of the way and let you begin. Uma Mola. Yes. Are you able to turn the stream off if you're if you're following us on another page? Uh, just a moment. I did. Okay, good. Yeah, no feedback. Right. Well, begin in your own time. You've got till uh, the hour till three o'clock. Okay. And uh, we'll send you a message if five minutes before the end. But yeah, commence with the talk. I have sharing, is it okay? Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Manuela. I'm working in Croatian Veterinary Institute and I'm a member of Croatian Microbiology Society, Macological uh, Section. So uh, I, I would like to say something, uh, let's say uh, from, um, Microzeum room from previous uh, lectures from mycological uh, view. Firstly, I would like to welcome you to my presentation. On the occasion of the International Microorganism Day, I'm going to present to you how molds on food can be beneficial, but unfortunately also dangerous. Let's begin with the harmful examples. How many times do we open the refrigerator jars on containers and find pictures like this? And we are greeted by furry tomatoes, moldy, moldy bread, discolored apples, or jam with the coating on fungi. Or do you ever wonder why animals do not like feet like this? Smelly corn on the cob, lumpy sprouts, and unappetizing silage. That is because molds on the surface of food and feet cause unfavorable appearance, unpleasant smell, and disgusting taste. Also, some mold species produce secondary metabolic names mycotoxins. Molds produce mycotoxins, 
when they are triggered by the environmental conditions. The most known my mycotoxins are aflatoxins, which can be found in grains, nuts, hay, and milk. Most of them cause liver cancer. Other ones are okra toxins, often discovered in grapes, wine, coffee, dried fruits, and dried meat products. They can also cause kidney and liver disease, also immunosuppression in humans and animals. A large group of mycotoxins consists of fusarium mycotoxins. They can be found mostly in grains and can be cause immunosuppressions, vomiting, and hormonal imbalance. The most common molds genus which grow over the surfaces of food and feed are Aspergillus, Fusarium, and Penicillium. Aspergillus species appear on the surfaces in yellow, green, and back, black colors, also can be found on nuts, vegetables, fruits, grains, and dried meat products. Under the microscope, the conidial head of Aspergillus species looks like the seed head of the dandelion. These species produce aflatoxins and ochratoxins. The most known species are Aspergillus flavus, Aspergillus niger, and Aspergillus ochratzeus. Another genus of food spoilage mold is penicillium. It can be recognized, but it's pale greeny gray color and it resembles to a paintbrush under the microscope. This genus can be found on fruits, bread, cheese, and dried meat. The species, the species from this genus are producers of okra toxins. The most common species are Penicillium expansum, Penicillium roqueforti, Penicillium citrinum, and Penicillium camemberi. Fusarium genus. This genus can be found on corn, rice, wheat, and other grains. Looking under the microscope, Fusarium genus appear like bananas or canoes. They are producers of fusarium mycotoxins. The most famous species are fusarium culmorum, fusarium graminearum, and fusarium verticillaides. This is the end of the negative side of molds, but it's, it's not all doom and gloom. Molds on the surfaces of food can also be desirable. Do you like the taste of slices of salami, wedge of English Stilton or French Gruyere, or some prosciutto? The characteristic taste of some dry meat products and cheeses come from molds. Molds from Penicillium species are usually used to obtain the characteristic flavor and texture of food. The species which are added to a product for a better flavor and texture are called starter cultures. In the ripening process of dry fermented meat, molds have some important ro roles. They develop a specific flavor and taste they reduce the penetration of oxygen and light, which results in stable color. They have a protective role against pathogenic or, or spoilage microorganisms. They prevent excessive surface drying, in that way limiting the hardness of the meat. 
In dried meat industry, the species Penicillium nalgoviensis is most used to obtain characteristic aroma. Penicillium species give cheeses their characteristic flavor and texture. For example, Penicillium camemberry makes an external crust and leaves the inside cheese soft and creamy. And Penicillium roqueforti grows and spreads inside the cheese and make this cheese crumbly with the recognizable characteristic flavor. Leaving you with a good taste left in your mouth, I would like to acknowledge that this presentation was found, funded by the Creation Science Foundation in the frame of the project. Mycotoxins in traditional creation meat products, molecular identification of mycotoxin producing molds and consumer exposure assessment. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you for your talk. Thank and you. Um, yeah, so this is the Creation Microbiology Society, and uh, we've enjoyed all of your talks from today and all of your projects. We have a few extra minutes before the next session. Okay. So while we prepare this for you, I'm just going to share a small holding slide. But yeah, thank you very much. And let's just move this off. And then I will share this. <laughs> right. Thanks a lot. And um, we will see you all back in nine minutes for the beginning of the next session. Cool, just while we wait for our speakers to assemble for our session on microbiology dissemination infrastructures, scientific societies and events, which begins in seven minutes, I just thought I would point you towards the website of the service learning project that we heard about from the Creation Society, which contains nice updates 
um, from all of their projects and outputs and including a link to Microsium, which is available in Croatian and English. But as we heard from the um, Croatian Microbiology Society, it was the local language versions which are sometimes the most useful because all of this content produced in English is, you know, widely accessible if you speak English, but there is no replacement for your own native mother tongue. So having it in the local language option is of great importance to them. So if you're willing and interested to make educational material for your own country, it might be worth thinking about making sure you have your local language version as well as an English version to get as many people able to read it as possible. Right, just because this next session is probably going to overrun, let's get it going a little bit early. And we have a few of our speakers joining the call. Great, so we have Nelson Lima and Natalia Pastanak, Pastanak, and we're just waiting for a couple more speakers. Let's just see if we can get the audio working. E, good morning. Hey, we can hear you, great. Hello. Hello, so we've got Natalia um, Pastanak, You've logged in from Brazil and you are the director of the Institute yes. Cristeiro de Ciencia. And who have we got? Nelson nice. Lima. Um, yes. Who uh, is going to. Yeah, from are, you, are, are you hearing me? I am. Can he? Okay. Okay, good. Just letting Isabel in, um, who will be your chair and moderator. And um, we just. Hello. hello, good morning, hello. Good, good afternoon, Isabel. Hola, hola, Nelson. Hola, Natalia. Yeah, the, the time zone is going to be messy. No. <laughs> going to be difficult for you now. I, I, I'm good. I, I, I'm at a very convenient time. It's 9 a.m. in Brazil. Okay, so, it's perfect okay. time in Brazil. <laughs> we are waiting for the president of the Paraguay Society of Microbiology. He confirmed. Yeah. Um, it was it was not giving news for uh, quite well several weeks, but uh, oh. he told me that he was uh, um, testing uh, for COVID for for the, the new coronavirus, so he, it was impossible for him to to enter in contact. I hope that he will join us today. Yeah, we are three minutes early. But we will continue. We will start with you, Natalia. We cool. will start with you, and um, uh, I will say a few words, and um, you, you can present uh, for twenty minutes. Uh, but I, I will ask the others just to to try to to keep the the time below twenty minutes uh, in order to be able to make a discussion because we will have a, a I know we will have a, a break. It's not problematic. This no, session is not problematic. But all the others were extremely problematic. Uh, I will spend 19 minutes with the video only. Okay, so you cannot talk, okay, Nelson? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> it, will, it will be a lady. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you will only say, well... Okay. I'm just going to get out of the way so I don't distract anyone and let you on with the session. And uh, we'll let... Um, Jose in when do he you think that uh, do you think that I can uh, I can start Ben yeah. because it well the other session was terrible I, I could not understand the word uh, with the echo even myself I I was always hearing me uh, two minutes or one minute afterwards so it was really impossible okay well now it seems okay we can... no now it's perfect yeah. I'm very happy yes it is I think it's when someone leaves the stream on, if they're watching it in their own yes. space. And they yes, it cannot be, it cannot be. Okay, when you, I think when you want to- We're well, gonna have we'll, plenty to talk about and- you'll Tell me want, when you want to start, because start. We, we will wait for the, uh, well, maybe he can he enter the session as the chink in, because she entered during the session. Mm -hmm. I think that she thought that it was five minutes before 
her presentation. So yeah, commence. So. Oh yeah, so just so you know, Ben will play the video, Nelson, that you have lined up at the okay. time of your talk. Good. Okay, thank you so much. And tell me when you want to, 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 to start, okay? I, I'd say begin now, I'm right on time, and then you should have time for discussion at the end. Do, do, you, want to, do you want me to start? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hello, welcome to this a uh, new session on microbiology. And uh, this session will be on dissemination, infrastructures, and scientific societies and events. So it's, uh, we, I have the pleasure to have with us uh, as first speaker, uh, Natalia Pasternak. Natalia is very well known, a uh, very well known science promoter uh, with a highly recognized dissemination, uh, we highly recognize dissemination activities. Um, she's a microbiologist by training, and uh, she is here representing the contribution from the Brazilian Society uh, of Microbiology. Thank you, Natalia. Uh, we, we are very happy to hear you on microorganisms in our lady lives. Thank you so much, Isabel, for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. And well, well, I will be talking to you today about our microbial world, which I'm sure it's no news to any of you. I know you're all experts here, but maybe I can give you some hints on how to convince others that microbes are important. Maybe I can give you some hints on how to convince your own family for instance, when they try to understand what the hell do you walk with after all. So let me share my screen here and let's see if, uh, oh, just tell me if you can see it. Yeah? Yes, yes. Oh, good. Perfect. So uh, as I'm sure it's no news to any of you, it's a microbial world out there, people, and inside too. And sometimes we just have this new idea to people when they think of microbes, anyone who's not very into microbiology, and you ask them about microbes, they will think about, whoa, I can't move my presentation. Okay. Yes, worked. So they think about this. Oh, ugly, bad microbes. This is what everyone usually thinks about when you talk about germs and bacteria. And they say, oh, that little things that make you sick, is it? And then we have to answer, no, not really. Most of them don't make you sick. Most of them are really important to you and to the environment and to the planet. And tell you the truth, you wouldn't be here without them. You wouldn't be alive without them. So these, the ugly, the bad, the ones that make you sick, they are just a minority. They are a very loud minority. They get the news. They get famous. So now it's up to us to make the other ones get famous because they deserve better. See, they are part of the biomass of the planet. Okay, plants outrage us. There's more plants than, than microbes in the planet. But have a look and see, uh, have a look about animals. If you, if you have a look here at the, uh, the right low corner, you see that humans, you don't even see humans, but look at all the microbes you can see and they the biomass of the planet, archaea, bacteria, protist, fungi, they, they, they are all here, they are all represented here, and they own the planet, people, they rule the world. So let's try to live with them and live peacefully. They will usually do, because they are everywhere, and I mean everywhere. Talk about any extreme environment on earth. They like it cold, they like it hot, they don't mind pressure. And no, we are not going to talk about Venus today, okay? Let's skip it down here on earth. They are present in industry, in drug development, in food, in biotechnology. We would have no biotechnology if it weren't for research in bacteria. You all know it. We, we would have no molecular biology at all. We would have no vaccine 
vaccines today, for instance, if, we, if it weren't for research in microorganisms and especially in bacteria. Of course, my field, because bacteria are much more important. And talk about agriculture. What, we, what would we do? without nitrogen fixing bacteria in agriculture, without genetically modified organisms. So uh, microbes are present everywhere and they are essential to our daily lives, daily lives. This is what's important. It's not just that they are essential to research or they, 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 are, or they, they are present in our bodies or that they uh, provide vitamins. They are essential in almost everything that we do. And of course, they are all around us and inside us. We couldn't live without bacteria. If you, uh, uh, if you got rid of all your bacteria at once, you would get rid of uh, more or less two and a half kilos from your body, but that's a good idea for losing weight because you would also get rid of a lot of bodily functions that are essential to you. The bacteria have been with us and all the microbes, of course. I usually talk about bacteria because of course, they are much more important, but they have been with us ever since we were born. Maybe before we were born, there are some studies that show bacteria present in placenta. But of course, from birth is when they really colonize us and we begin our journey together. They are also present in breast milk. And of course, there are plenty of sugars in breast milk that we can feed our bacteria. It's very important to feed them. They grow and they develop a lot of bodily functions for us. If you're feeling sad, perhaps you can blame your bacteria in your gut. We know, for instance, today that a lot of bacteria that live in our gut are responsible for mood and, can, uh, and they can secrete, for instance, a molecule that I'm sure you heard about, serotonin. It's a hormone that it, uh, and, uh, that, that's uh, related to mood and sometimes to a se severe illness like depression. It doesn't mean that bacteria can cure depression, but they are certainly involved in these mechanisms. Of course, they produce a lot of drugs that are important to us as well. So we have a genetically bacteria that produce insulin for diabetics, growth hormones, vaccines, antibiotics. We wouldn't have any of these products if it weren't for bacteria. And of course, if you're very worried about wrinkles in your face, don't forget about our friend Clostridium botulinum that produces Botox. And so that's very important for cosmetic industry as well. And you can even blame them if you're a little bit overweight. It's not your fault, people. Blame the bacteria in your gut. I'm sure you all remember the first, uh, the first microbiota transfer experimentations that we did. I think this one is one of the best. When they transfer gut microbiota from discordant twins that were discounted for obesity. Yes, I always thought that the, the, the hardest part of this job would be to find the twins, but apparently they did, four pair of twins, and they really transferred microbiota from this, get microbiota from these twins, to genetically mo uh, modified mice. And look at what happened. Poor little mouse that got the obese microbiota became obese, eating the same diet. So when that friend tells you, I don't eat at all, I'm so picky, I eat so little and still I gain weight, it's not their fault, people. It's their gut bacteria, believe them. And something really, really sad happened. You see, look at how fat the little mouse got. We, we couldn't let that, uh, we couldn't allow that to be. They have to be healthy. So researchers thought of a way, how can we make that mouse thin again? How can we slim it down? And they had a brilliant idea. Maybe we can transfer the microbiota from the slim mouse to the fat mouse. So they just caged them all together. And of course they have, a very, they have very strange eating habits. So they eat each other's poo and this transfers bacteria. And it worked. It slimmed the mouse down. So when they, uh, when researchers restored their slim bacteria, their slim microbiota, it was much easier for the for for these mice to lose weight. And 
it worked. But just don't get ideas. Of course, we can try to extrapolate this from humans. And what it would mean, really, if, is that if you have weight problems, maybe you should marry someone who's really slimmer than you. But uh, careful about your eating habits, OK? If we think about food, I wouldn't want to live in a world without microbes, because think about everything that we would be missing. I mean, and uh, uh, look at look at the cheese, and look at the holes in the cheese. Because I'm not just talking about yeast, yeast making cheese. I'm talking about bacteria that put holes in your cheese, because that makes Swiss cheese. It's not any cheese. It's much more fancy because, of course, bacteria are more important, and they make fancy, expensive cheese, not any cheese. Would you want to to live in a world without wine? without olives, without vinegar, that's important too. But most, most important of all, would you be able to live in a world without coffee and chocolate? You wouldn't have any of those if it weren't for bacteria. And of course, all the microbes, okay, it's a whole succession of microbes that's used, that is used to ferment coffee beans and, and coca beans. And we wouldn't have any kind of chocolate or coffee in the world if it weren't for microbe succession. It's a very complicated process and it's all natural. Uh, no one knows uh, to today, for instance, to make chocolate, what are the strains involved? There are several bacterial strains and yeast strains and, uh, and it involves a succession that, uh, that sometimes lasts up to, four, uh, to two weeks, 14 days all of that to ferment the beans so that we can grind them and make coke and make chocolate and make coffee so a world without microbes wouldn't be a good place to live and what the hell is this doing here? Yeah, this is what happens when you do some research to find out weird things that bacteria do, that, that bacteria do so that you can show people. And then all of a sudden, I came across this information. You wouldn't be able to make your bed every day if it weren't for bacteria. Yep, bacteria can make linen. Pectinase producing bacteria are important to make linen from flaxseed plants. They separate the linen fibers from the stem in the flax plant. That's amazing. I, 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 I've been a microbiologist for more time than I would uh, that, that I'd like to believe, really. And I never knew that every time I make my bed, if I have, of course, fancy linen sheets with I, I don't actually. I use cotton ones; they are cheaper. But if you if you go this one, see, it's quite expensive. But of course, it's bacteria made. It should be expensive. It's amazing. It's amazing all, all the things that microbes are involved. And as I said, in our daily lives, when we get out of linen bed beddings in the morning, and we get our coffee, and we get our hot chocolate, and we get bread and uh, and cheese, it's all bacteria made, it's all yeast made. And of course, they take care of the planet for us too. We know, you know, but most people don't know that bacteria can be genetically modified for bioremediation. And, and of course, natural occurring bacteria can help too, because they can digest hydrocarbons. So they can help clean oil spills. For instance, they can digest oil and just release CO2 and water back into nature. So they help clean the environment. And there are genetically engineered bacillus that can help heal concrete. Concrete people, they can help turn calcium lactate into calcium carbonate if you use specifically genetically modified bacillus to do that and you insert calcium lactate in your concrete well when it gets moist the spores from the bacillus they germinate and they release the bacteria and then they just uh, they, they can just turn calcium lactate into carbonate and they can heal concrete walls this is what bacteria can do for us and of course, if they only could talk, 
Well, they can, but they only talk in numbers. They are quite shy. So there's a phenomenon that, of course, you all know called Corn Sensing. And when bacteria get together, they party and they can activate genes, sometimes fluorescent genes like this, sometimes pathogenic genes. So it's a good strategy for us to study if we're trying to tackle, for instance, resi uh, antibiotic resistance bacteria, we could use corn sensing and try to disrupt those genes and maybe try to stop them from being pathogen pathogenic altogether. And I mean all together because they only do this when they are together so when you get a whole bunch of bacteria they, they they start to express some genes and they talk to each other so they say okay we got high numbers everyone turn on the genes and this is what you get and sometimes of course then you get the bad the nasty the ugly ones but we can learn from the good ones and we can tackle the bad and with my, uh, I'm really, really glad to break it to you because I am sure that you already know, microbes will save the world. They not only own the world, they will help us save the world. Think about what we did in Possible Burger with yeast hemoglobin producing uh, 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 yeast that produced hemoglobin, large hemoglobin, which is legume hemoglobin, so it comes from soy. But it would be really hard to extract that from soy and it would hurt the environment. So the brilliant solution from the Impossible Burger product uh, producers was to clone the, the large hemoglobin gene into yeast. And now we have this hemoglobin producing yeast genetically modified is that make your meat taste like meat, your plant meat tastes like meat. And how is this going to save the planet? Because it reduces animal breed. If we can get people to eat plant-based meat that really tastes like meat, it's because we don't have to change people's habits. It's very, it's much more difficult to change people's habits than to come up with brilliant biotechnology solutions that like this one. This kind of uh, solution that is based on microbiology and it's based on molecular biology and it's based on science. This is the kind of solution that can really tackle the world's biggest problems, for instance, like climate change. Because if we reduced animal breed just by eating plant-based burgers, maybe microbes can help us save the world. And of course, genome editing, where would we be? without bacteria CRISPR. And I know that every one of you is very familiar with, K, with Cas9, but let's talk about Cas13 and the way that it's been used now during the pandemic to develop diagnostic tests for COVID-19 because we can learn from bacteria and they can cut RNA and they can recognize RNA and we can use them to recognize virus RNA and activate fluorescent genes. This is what companies like Sherlock and Detector have been doing, and they have be, been developing rapid diagnostic tests based on CRISPR for COVID-19. And this, if it works, it, it will probably be adapted for many other viral diseases in the future. This is something to invest in. This is some, something that can save us from future epidemics and pandemics. And it's, uh, it, it all comes from research in microbes, research in bacteria. This is what we need to show to the world when we talk about microbiology, when we talk about the importance of our research, when we talk about the importance of investing in science. And, and if we want to help, if we want to support from the nation to, to get investment in science, this is very important in my country now, as I'm sure you know, uh, science budget in Brazil has been literally cut in half in the past few years. And Brazilian science is really, really suffering and becoming an, endang an endangered species, really. We, we are at a standstill and we, we don't know where we're heading if we have no investment, if we don't get our funding back. This is what we can do. 
we can develop diagnostic tests, we can develop vaccines, we can develop food, we can help in agriculture, we can bioremediate the world, we can save the world with microbes, with microbiology, and with research, with science. And this is what we need to convey to the world when we talk about germs. Germs are not the little things that make you sick. Germs are that wonderful little things that can help us planet and that you couldn't live without so it's a microbial world people let's show the world that microbes are important that microbes rule the world and that we must support microbes and we must fund microbiology research and we must show to everyone how important they are and how dear they are to us and please have some respect for bacteria they are, of course, the only culture that some people have. If you want to follow me, this is my social media. The Institute Question of Science here in Brazil was founded by, by me and three other colleagues a year and a half ago. And uh, its main mission is to promote scientific and rational thinking and to press the pub uh, to inform the public and to press and work together with the government for science-based public policies so this is our social media if you follow me on twitter you see that of course for our, uh, for portuguese speaking audience there are many articles in our magazine in portuguese some in english and i'm also a columnist for the skeptic magazine in the uk so you can you can read me in english there if you follow me on twitter you find everything and let's face it bacteria rule the world okay i'll say microbes because i know there are a lot of lots of people here who happen to work with viruses and yeast and some other kind of fungi and i always forget about you because well bacteria but thank you very much and i hope i can uh, i hope i might have helped you to tell your families how important microbes are in their daily lives thank you thank you natalia it was a pleasure to be able to listen to this, uh, this talk. Um, we are, uh, I'm going to leave the, all the questions for at the end, okay? Uh, I think we will have time. Uh, so the next speaker is uh, Nelson Lima. Uh, he's my colleague at the uh, Universidade do Minho, University of Minho uh, in Portugal. And um, he is also the director of uh, Micoteca of University of Minho, it's a uh, culture collection special, specialized in fungi. And he is, well, uh, the director, or I don't know exactly, he can explain, uh, of MIRI. MIRI is a very important uh, um, infrastructure for microbiology. Uh, for culture collections. So, uh, you have a video, as far as I know. Yes, thank you, Can Isabel. You share the video with us? Yes, uh, and uh, on behalf of MIRI, that is the Microbial Resource Research Infrastructure, that is a European research infrastructure, I wish welcome all of you, and I wish also thank you for the organizers to give the, the, to me read the, this opportunity to share what we are doing now, but also uh, how we see the superbugs and amazing microorganisms. So please let's see the, the video. Welcome to IS Miri 21's presentation on superbugs and amazing microbes. ICEMIRI21 is a European Union funded project under the Horizon 2020 program. ICEMIRI21 brings together 14 partners and eight third parties from Europe to collect, study, preserve, and distribute collections of microbes. These activities include the establishment of a virtual collaborative work environment, transnational access, and education and training programs, among others. ICMIRI 21 will see the implementation of MIRI as well as its sustainability through activities that engage various stakeholders. Thus, ICMIRI 21 presents superbugs and amazing microbes to engage citizens. According to the Convention of Biological Diversity, biological diversity means the variability 
among living organisms from all sources, including terrestrial, marine, and other aquatic ecosystems, and the ecological complexes of which they are a part. This includes diversity within species, between species, and ecosystems. Following this definition, biodiversity has different hierarchical levels that start from the narrowest one related with the genetic diversity within the same species or population, moving to a more complex diversity among species up to the differences among the planetary ecosystems. Nowadays, it is possible to represent all biological diversities in one single tree and understand the connection among the different biological groups and species. The total number of species known so far reaches 2.3 million, and microbes such as archaea, bacteria, and fungi are represented in this tree. Microalgae and protozoa are also present within the metazoa group. The total number of species known represent the tip of the iceberg when we estimate that around 5 to 30 million of species can live in our blue planet. The biological diversity needs to be studied. The microbial diversity largely contributes to this lack of knowledge that needs to be discovered. Microbes or microorganisms are living organisms that are in general unseen by the human naked eye. This means they are extremely tiny organisms and the use of light and electron microscopes help us to see them. It is the reason that we call them microscopic organisms, that they have very different shapes, varieties, and sizes. This group includes all unicellular microorganisms, such as archaea and bacteria, both formed by very primitive simple cells called prokaryotes, and others formed by more complex and evolved cells called eukaryotes. In the latter group, many unicellular protozoa and algae, as well as unicellular fungi called yeasts, are included. In the fungi group, filamentous multicellular microbes are called molds. Finally, a virus is a submicroscopic particle that replicates only inside a living cell. They can infect all types of life forms. Viruses that infect bacteria are called bacteriophages. Microbes are very diverse, with different roles in the ecosystem. They can be found everywhere, even in extreme environments such as deep oceans, hot springs, and even glaciers. Currently, it is estimated that Earth has much more bacteria than there are stars in the universe. And bacteria that colonize man are 10 times more than the cells that compose the human body. Man has co-evolved with microbes and this evidence is now confirmed since the human genome has around 37% of bacterial origin. This confirms that bacteria are older than man on the earth and human genome was able to incorporate these pieces of genetic information. Human relationship with microbes is intense and compulsory. And it is another example of how different microbes interact and colonize the human skin. Different groups of microbes are present in different locals of the body, helping the skin to function. When these commensal microbial populations are disturbed or imbalanced. They can originate health problems due to their absence or overgrowth. Similar situations can occur with the gut microbes inside our body. Although not all microbes are pathogenic and give rise to diseases, 
we tend to think that they are all bad for our health or the health of plants and animals. This is a mistaken thought. In fact, only a tiny number of microbes are real pathogens. A study reported that from 1,400 recognized pathogenic microbes, only 20%, approximately 350, were fungi. And within this number, only a little more than a dozen are primary pathogens. The thought that microbes are nasty for our health has given rise to the overuse of antibiotics. In order to ensure the food we eat is free of germs, we grow our livestock and food with antibiotics. If we have a cold, we want our doctor to prescribe antibiotics. This behavior is creating a public health problem that is growing silently. Microbes are found everywhere on our planet, as said before, in the glaciers and rivers, in the roots of trees and herbs, in the intestines of insects, cow, or even our own. Their ability to populate a wide variety of environments creates a connection between the environmental, the animal, and the human health. This is one health concept. The fact that many of the same microbes are present in animals and humans as they share the ecosystem they live in. The One Health approach recognizes that our health is closely connected to the health of animals and our shared environment. Antibiotics are currently overused to treat and prevent various infectious diseases in cattle and in men. Besides being indiscriminately added to fresh and processed food to ensure microbe-free products. This overuse of antibiotics has led to the appearance of superbugs, microbes that are resistant to antibiotics and cannot be killed with any known antibiotic molecule. Because we are all connected, superbugs arising in humans, animals, and the environment may spread from one to the other and from one country to another. Superbugs do not recognize geographic borders. If we continue with the excessive use of antibiotics, as we have done so far, superbugs will continue to spread. The growing spread of superbugs is becoming an alarming problem. Humanity has abused so much of the use of antibiotics that it has been predicted by 2050, superbugs will kill 10 million people more than cancer would. The only solution we have to this problem is to reduce the indiscriminate use of antibiotics. So what are the benefits of microbial resources? Microbial resources share the raw materials of many biotechnological applications. Microbes are essential in the production of food and beverages, fine chemicals, enzymes, biofuels, vaccines, drugs, and heterologous proteins. They can also be applied as biocontrol agents of plants and animal diseases, as indicators of environmental quality and in bioremediation processes. Additionally, Microbes and their enzymes play a vital role in transforming renewable raw materials such as biomass, residues, and carbon dioxide into a huge portfolio of products. Accordingly, microbial resources play a vital role in biotechnology innovation and their exploitation and valorization is pivotal to boost bioeconomy. Microbes are the pharmacy of humanity. Penicillin is probably the most known antibiotic. It was discovered by Fleming in, in 1928. and The development of large-scale production was designed during the Second World War. Currently, beta-lactam antibiotics such as penicillin and cephalosporins are the leading anti-infection agent worldwide. 
with an estimated world market of billions every year. Immunosuppressors such as cyclosporins and other molecules suppress the activity of the immune system and are given after an organ transplant to help prevent organ rejection. Without immunosuppressants, transplants would be impossible. Immunosuppressors are also often used to treat some autoimmune diseases. Statins are also among the most used medicines. They are used to lower LDL cholesterol with an estimated world market of billions every year. In addition, microbes are essential for our life because they are used to produce anti-cancer, antiviral, antifungal, painkillers, vaccines, insulin to treat diabetes, immunostimulators, and many other molecules. The use of microbial enzymes in various industries is increasing rapidly because of their stability, catalytic activity, and the ease of production and optimization in comparison to plant and animal enzymes. The guarantee reduced processing time, low energy inputs, cost effectiveness, non-toxic, and eco-friendly features. They are currently used for any type of industrial production such as the pharma sector, dairy and baking sector, for the production of beverages and animal feed, pulp and paper, leather, textile detergents, polymers, cosmetics, organic synthesis, and waste management. The annual turnover is of many billions every year. The enzymes produced by microbes have changed our lives and we use them every day without realizing it. As it is shown in the slide, microbes have a fundamental role in the food system. They are involved in activities that are essential in agriculture, such as fertility of soils and protection of animals from diseases, in food production, such as food fermentations, and in the conversion of food waste into new materials that can be used in different industrial sectors. Finally, they are very important in human health since they colonize our gastrointestinal tract and interact directly with our immune system. Do you know that fermented foods are manufactured by exploiting the metabolic activities of microbes? As a matter of fact, they are able to transform raw materials such as milk to final products such as cheese that are completely different, with different taste, smell, and consistency. Fermented foods are an excellent example of how man has learned to exploit microbes to prolong the shelf, li the shelf life of certain very perishable raw materials, such as fresh meat, through their fermentation. Fermentation is a very ancient process and its combination with certain technological procedures like drying and salting allows for the production of safer and more stable foods. How else do microbes support humankind? Through the environment. Microbes control the main biogeochemical cycle supporting the existence of all hyotrophic life forms. Hence, keeping in mind that marine biomes cover about 70% of Earth's surface, we have to remember that marine phytoplankton perform half of the global photosynthetic process despite amounting to only approximately 1% of global plant biomass. We monitor forest degradation carefully, but on the other hand, we have scanty information on the decrease of global oceanic phytoplankton density. A better knowledge on microbe activities is crucial in fighting anthropogenic climate change. We need to understand better how microbes affect climate change, for example, by producing and consuming carbon dioxide and methane, 
but we also need to understand how they influence the climate change and other human activities. We already stated how phytoplankton is crucial for carbon sequestration, but marine microbes through their activities also release carbon dioxide. Moreover, microbial biomass and other organic matter are converted into fossil fuel over millions of years. By contrast, burning of fossil fuels quickly releases imbalancing carbon and increases atmospheric carbon dioxide levels. Soil and water degradation is a serious problem all around the world. Pollution is one of the main causes of soil and water degradation and deeply impact on our daily lives. The contamination of air, water and soil represents a threat to the health and the environment that needs to be resolved efficiently. There is a growing interest in developing techniques to reduce levels of organopollutants from contaminated soils and waters by means of selected microbes. Bioremediation is an alternative approach that has recently received much attention due to its potential as a cost-effective solution and has been successfully applied in full scale for the treatment of contaminated sites. Bacteria and fungi are the main protagonists of bioremediation, being able to utilize carbon sources and transform most of the persistent organopollutants as various chemicals such as petroleum hydrocarbons, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, polychlorinated biphenyls, nitroaromatic compounds, industrial solvents, pesticides, plastic, and metals. In conclusion, microbes are amazing and diverse living groups of organisms. Microbes can be pathogenic and harmful to humans, animals, and plants. Microbes offer humankind several services, products, and solutions, many of them not yet discovered. Microbes sustain life on our planet. Or, as Louis Pasteur said, life would not long remain possible in the absence of microbes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this contribution. Well, again, uh, we are going to, to leave the discussion uh, at the end. Uh, and I would like to ask people that uh, who are watching us, following us at the moment, please leave your comments, your questions, um, because we will have them in the chat. You can uh, use the Twitter or Facebook or whatever uh, to ask questions to these um, speakers. And uh, the next speaker, it's, uh, I'm very happy to have um, with us uh, another a uh, colleague from uh, South America, so is uh, uh, José Pereira. He is the president of the, uh, the society, the Microbiology Society of Paraguay, and he is in charge of the organization of the next ALAM meeting. Well, ALAM uh, is uh, an association, a uh, Latin American association um, of microbiology and, uh, well, uh, in Europe, the Portuguese and the Spanish societies of microbiology are part of ALAM. So it's a pleasure to have you, José, uh, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much uh, for the organization team. Thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Isabel, for the, for the invitation. Um, congratulations to all for the inter international Microorganisms Day. Um, I will talk about uh, a little bit our, uh, about our our next alum. Uh, I will share my computer screen.
Okay. Thank you very much uh, again for the opportunity to talk, to talk and to share information about the, our next alum. Um, I will talk uh, about the, the alum, uh, the Latin American Association of Microbiology um, is made up of microbiology association and societies. Um, from Latin American countries and from European countries such as Portugal and, and Spain. Um, the main objective of ALAM is to hold Congress, uh, to perform Congress, to unit microbiology uh, on issues related to their discipline and scientific research. Um, not nowadays, uh, we know uh, that with the with the information, with the with the easy communication about about the the people, we can create um, research networks, and 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 it's it's very easy to 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 work in 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 that way. Um, the the land congress are are performed every every two years. And the last congress was held in in Chile, and it was a total success. Um, it, it 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 was more than maybe two two thousand people. It was very very huge, very very important, very very good speaker, and it was a, a total success. And this this year, it was Paraguayan turn, uh, but unfortunately, uh, due to the problem that every everybody knows, um, we decide to, to pass the, the the congress for the for the next year. Uh, here we have the the congress will be from August 26 to to 29. Okay, um, at the same time, uh, the National Congress of Microbiology and Clinical Biochemistry will also held in the, in, in, the, in the same time. Yes, I will talk about the, the topics I will read. Um, the, talk, the, the topic that, that, that we have in the, in the Congress will be ecology, epidemiology, and microbial evolution, um, environmental and um, microbiology and microbial interaction, industrial microbiology, biotechnology, and bioindustry, veterinary microbiology, microbiology in agriculture, microbiology in food, microbial cellular and molecular biology, pathogenic interaction. Uh, these topics are related to all types of microorganisms such as viruses, bacteria, fungi, and parasites. Um, antimicrobial agent, resistance, and development of new drugs, and microbiology and society, one health, uh, precision medicine, clinical microbiology, public health and innovation, animal, uh, human and animal health, neglected infection disease, Biosecurity and biocustody uh, quality control in, in microbiology. Um, so the Congress will have symposia organized by other society and association. Uh, so far, we have talked with the International Society of Human and Animal Mycology, the, the ISHAM, to perform a, a two day uh, ISHAM LATAM Medical Mycology Symposium. It will be coordinated by Dr. Juana Ortellado. Maybe you know Juana Ortellado. Uh, she was the, the, the past president for the uh, Society of Microbiology of Paraguay. Um, with Latin American Society of Tuberculosis and other microbacteriosis, SLAM TV to perform a SLAM TV symposium. Uh, and will be coordinated by Dr. Cynthia Diaz. Um, so the, the, the symposia are still in top. 
And we are open to hear uh, or recite a suggestion from other so societies or associations. Um, the Congress will be held in a hybrid format. Yes. It will be in person at the Conmebol Convention Center, a place that uh, has more than 2,000 800 people uh, that is located uh, in the city of Luque that is near from Asuncion. Uh, in the other hand, there will be on the, the online format uh, called for the Congress uh, that uh, will be a friendly and simple online platform uh, where assistant can register, uh, can enter to 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 the talk simultaneously, um, leave their comment and question, uh, read the program, say send the, their poster. Yes. Um, each assistant will be able to interact directly with the expert speaker. Is a is a very friendly program. It's a very friendly uh, platform that is easy to to use. So, why uh, it will be interesting to to come to a land in Paraguay? Um, maybe you you know the goalkeeper Chilaver. Um, in this match, we were very close to being in France in the semifinals. Or maybe you know, uh, uh, you know Roque Santa Cruz, he plays uh, in Spain, England, Germany, and he's playing in, in, the, in the best soccer team in Paraguay. So Paraguay is not only football, Paraguay have a um, a very nice landscape and a, a lot of night nature. Uh, Paraguay have unique places, places in the in the world. Um, in Paraguay, we do science. Uh, there are several research center with very good professional, and we will also have international expert speaker from different parts of the world. Um, uh, so in Paraguay, we also enjoy to dance TikTok music. So you are invited to be part of this. Uh, I'm sure it will be a success. And um, thank you for your attention and thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Jose Pereira, and good luck with the, this organization. Uh, it's not uh, easy at this time just to organize a big Congress uh, as this one, but well, we are with you. <laughs> Um, so we have 10 minutes for discussion. It's good. It's good. And uh, I do not have specific questions from the public, from the audience to you, but I have a lot of very supportive and kind comments uh, from a, a large number of followers. So uh, I, I'm very happy with this. And uh, well, this was a very nice session. Uh, before uh, uh, starting the discussion, I, I would like to invite you um, and, uh, well, you personally, of course, and uh, the societies, the microbiology societies or associations that you are uh, representing, just to take a look and to use uh, as far as possible uh, our blog in Portuguese of, uh, in the website of the International Microorganism Day. You know, we have a blog in Portuguese, but obviously it could be Portuguese and Spanish and uh, uh, all of us can understand at least written, <laughs> written, uh, written text. We are 
of course, able to, to understand this. So all the contents uh, that we are including in this website are uh, uh, our own content, so not uh, translations. So this is why it is important just to have new uh, and useful contents uh, for the website. OK, I don't know if you want to make a comment and say publicly yes. <laughs> it would be nice. You are a mute. You are mute. You have to, to open the, yes, the microphone. Uh, OK. Uh... Hi, Isabel. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, symposium or organization. Natalia, uh, you are mute. Uh, from my side, yes. Uh, from Muri's side, uh, that is a European uh, research uh, infrastructure, uh, is only to, to tell all the, the people that attended the, these sessions that we are uh, and we are welcome uh, to all to follow us also our social media and contact us uh, to support and offer our service. Uh, the main focus on the MURI is to serve, serve the science and microbiology uh, science in, in special uh, to provide uh, strengths with high quality for uh, the research and for service and for the industry and uh, other uh, applications. Uh, that means that we federate the most important public service culture collection around the Europe and we keep in contact also with other networks uh, outside of Europe, like the Brazilian network of uh, culture collections, the Chilean network of culture collections, the United States network and the Asian network. So we work all together in, uh, and this is important that the people understand the microbes that we preserve in the culture the culture collections are uh, free to, to be used according to the rules and the, the, the international legal frameworks, but in this sense, all, all people can uh, also ask, uh, advise or contact us uh, to provide service or uh, advise as they, they wish. So they are all welcome to contact us as MIRI uh, infrastructure. Uh, well, Natalia, uh, uh, I'm going to, to ask you a question uh, coming from YouTube. Uh, and of, of course, uh, uh, you can comment on what you want now. And the question is to Natalia, very nice talk. Uh, how important is the gut microbiome uh, in obesity as an obesity factor when compared with human genetic factors? Uh, how powerful? Uh, can microbiome transplants be in eradicating obesity? So from the YouTube. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, well, thank you for the session. It was wonderful. Thank you, Nelson and Jose. I loved hearing your talks at the TikTok dance. That, that, that was amazing in a P3 lab, but I, I couldn't do it. But uh, so uh, obesity is a multi-factor uh, disease. It's very difficult to pin it down to just one factor or one cure. So it involves genetics, it involves behavior, it involves the microbiome, but it's a multifactorial thing. So uh, we know that micro, the gut microbiome is important, that it contributes to obesity but it's not the only factor. And microbiome transplants for obesity purposes, really, they have not been really successful. They have been successful though for type two diabetes. And uh, so uh, it works in mice, but we know that not everything that works in mice works in people. And I think it's just one of those misconceptions that we have to deal with when we communicate science. There was, uh, there is a Twitter handle uh, still active that is called Just In Mice. And it's amazing because they tag every news outlet that, that, that produces that, that, that sensationalist headlines like uh, the cure of cancer has been discovered and then they just say just in mice because this happens all the time and I think it's it's up to us as scientists to really convey the, the correct information in the most 
transparent way we can uh, and and uh, mice experiments uh, they can be very misleading people read that those headlines and they say oh good so uh, it, it works in mice the microbiome so all i have to do is to purchase this or that bacteria and there are lots of bacterial products to to lose weight and we know for uh, we know for a fact that they don't work so um micro I think are a big part of our job today because there are people getting rich on, 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 on these misconceptions. Maybe Jose, something to something to consider for, for the Congress, maybe a session on microbial misconceptions and how it drives market. Uh, we, we could think about that, but perhaps the Brazilian Society for Microbiology can help. But I think uh, uh, our work has been misused to sell products to people. And this is something that we, we should fight for. Do you want to comment, Jose? Uh, you have your microphone mute. OK. Yes, yes. Um, uh, we, are, we are open from the uh, Microbiology Society to hear and receive su suggestion for the, for the Congress. Um, for us, it will be very important to to um, to hear about that 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 topics um, um, well, why not um, we are still in in time uh, we are performing today the the program you are all in, invited to, to to participate and for us it it will be very 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 important. And, and and that and I want to invite all all all, all of you. Um, it will be a, a very great congress. Um, maybe we you you can uh, came to, for to Paraguay and and enjoy the 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 congress. Enjoy the the country. I, we are very harmful people here. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm very sure uh, it will be a uh, 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 success. So you are all invited. Okay, so we are at 2 p.m. We have to, oh, well, 2 p.m. In, in Portugal. <laughs> so it's the, our reference. So we have to close the, the session. Uh, I'd like to thank all the speakers. Uh, all of you that have been watching and following, following us. And uh, well, you can uh, see again this session or see it for the first time because uh, it will be available soon. Thank you very much. And bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Isabel. It was a pleasure. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. So we are going to leave. Bye bye. I think I muted Joe. Uh, can you hear me, Joe? I think you're muted. Back on. I think you can hear me. Yeah, yeah we're just going to move to a small break so we can uh, restart the live streams because we're getting to the point beyond which you can live stream continuously. And we will reconvene at uh, 4 o'clock CET, 3 o'clock London time, Lisbon time. Um, for a microscope hour. If you are wanting to go and see the uh, parallel webinar on education wherever we are by Femmes Microbiology Letters. That's beginning at four. So keep an eye out um, for the emails in your inbox to join if you've registered. And uh, yeah, we'll see you again in uh, just under an hour.